You're listening to Daughter of Flood and Fury, Book One of the Tidecaller Chronicles by Levi Jacobs, read for you by the author. One. I crouch ankle deep in running water, blindfolded, reading the current. I hear the whole chamber through the water, the mutters of the watching students, the patient tick of my trainer's thoughts and the anger of Arjuna across the wide floor from me, his mind seeking to read mine. I refuse it. That's the first rule of water sight. Do not let your opponent in, only those you trust. I let no one in. Arjuna tries to keep me out, but he's slacked off in the last few months, like the rest of them, like the whole temple, become more interested in politics than studies, and so they've all gotten weak. I've fought half my class today and not taken a scratch. Arjuna is the last of them, many say the best of them, because they don't want to admit that I'm the best, that a girl could be the best. Sometimes I hate my dad for putting me here, for discovering I have water sight when I shouldn't, for using his position to get me in anyway, for making me the only female seer in a temple of men. I'm a walking heresy, a challenge to everything they believe. That's what finally got him deposed and murdered, no matter how much they claim it was suicide. I hate them for killing him, even though I resent him for putting me here. It's twisted, I know. Welcome to my world. Arjuna makes his charge. I know he's running from the way his thoughts stutter, feet splashing in and out of the water. His mind is a mess, thoughts slipping through his blind like a school of fish through fingers calculation on how to beat me, and worry he'll be humiliated, and stress about losing his place as the head of his house. I wait till the last second, confident in my water sight, though I'm blindfolded, and all I can hear are the shouts and cries of the watching students, echoing in the long stone training hall. I need to do more than win here. I need to win so decisively my enemies won't dare attack me. I need it more than I need my trainer's approval or a position in one of the houses, because this is about more than the training now. It's about staying alive. Arjuna strikes, chopping his staff down hard. He thinks it well before he does it, so I'm ready. I roll left at the last second, hearing his curse through the water as the wood cracks into stone. My staff slaps into his knee. He's good enough that he recovers with a strike at my chest, and for a few seconds we dance and dodge blows, staffs cracking and water flying, but it's a foregone conclusion. His concentration drops even more in action, and I read his thoughts like a peddler's banner, see the desperate strike at my head before he tries it. I duck, his blow cutting air above me, then drive the butt of my staff into his sternum hard. He doubles over, wheezing, and I deliver a series of blows to his ribs, then a crack on the head that drops him like a dead man. I should stop now. I've won. I know that. Everyone knows that. But winning isn't enough. I need fear from them, a show of strength so intense the other students won't dare come at me, and the theocrats won't dare disappear me, despite my heresy. So I press the staff into his windpipe, finding it even blindfolded. I can feel his throat flex through the wood. Yield, I say not in the water as I should, but in the air, so everyone can hear it. His thoughts are an angry jumble of defeat, humiliation, and strategizing how to save face, how to convince his friends he should still be head of their house. Apparently it includes not yielding right away. Too bad. I need everyone to see the second best fighter in our class is a distant, distant second. Yield, I say again, pressing harder. He starts choking. Yield, he finally croaks, throwing up his hands. I lift my staff. Witch, he spits, getting up from the water. Beating him is a mistake. Arjuna is the second best seer in our class, the most popular, and the best with words, something I suck at. He's an easy pick for class leader, which means his house will likely get elevated this year to full seership. If I had just bowed down to him, at least let him touch me, maybe he would have taken me taken my strength and skill over my heresy. Not anymore. It's a mistake, but all I have are mistakes now. 
a mistake not to make friends, but a bigger mistake to trust anyone as my father's usurpers disappear all my relatives. A mistake to defeat my whole class without taking a scratch, but a bigger mistake to show any weakness when they'd readily off me to improve their own chances. The best seer in generations, the town criers are saying. If only she wasn't the daughter of the former chosen. If only she wasn't a girl. So I have to be stronger than all that. Untouchable. The best they've ever seen. Or they'll disappear me. Kill me or marry me off to some minor merchant or send me to a distant river post to relay messages the rest of my life. I can't let that happen. Because if it does, I'll never find out what happened to my father. And I'll never be able to ruin the bastards that did it. Remarkable, a voice says, and it takes me a second to realize I didn't hear the speaker's thoughts through the water, not even a trace. Someone who blinds as well as me. A senior seer, then. I pull off my blindfold. Worse, it's the new chosen, Nerimes, the seer who led the charge against my dad's heresies, standing in the archway at the far end. The ocean breeze lifts his elaborate robes, and sunlight sparkling off the running water casts shadows in the pits of his eyes. This is the man who took advantage of my father's death to seize power, who stands for everything my father was trying to change. A traditionalist. I wouldn't be surprised if he killed my father, but I believe in Ujjay's justice too much to attack him without being sure. Everyone deserves justice, especially the guilty. Trainer Erte clears his throat. Alethea's doing quite well, your grace. Eighteen of her classmen defeated today, and the rest too scared to challenge her. Yes, I know. I've been reading the waters for some time now. He lifts a brow with the other students, now lined up along the far wall, at sixteen all taller and stockier than me. And none of you can take this girl? Can even touch her, despite her heresy? Despite Watersight being the gift of our sex, and totally foreign to hers? No one responds, but the water speaks volumes. That we can hear their thoughts at all speaks volumes, when they should be practicing, should be blinding their thoughts with breath and concentration. It's pathetic. I would be better yet if I had someone with real talent to fight against. Nurimes's eyes snap to me, sharp in deep sockets, as if he heard me. My fingers go cold on the staff. Did he hear me? Did my water blind fail? He, of all people, I do not want reading my thoughts. Perhaps a friendly spar, then? he asks, shrugging off the bulky robes of state. He did read me, somehow. And meanwhile his mind is silent as stone, not even a murmur through the water. I look to Erte, who appears uncertain. It's not customary for full seers to spar with students, especially not the senior theocrats. They hardly spar with each other, except those chosen as overseers for the city. But Erte nods, and I catch a hint of his thoughts, as I often do these days, that it might be good for the class to see me beaten. Might be good for me. I tighten my fist on the staff. Nurimes has to beat me first. Blinds or no, your grace? I ask, giving my robes a quick ring to free up movement. He smiles. No need for them. A real monk must use all his faculties. He's not a big man, or even a particularly muscular one, but there's an air about him, a sense of power coming from his lean frame. Good. It will feel glorious to mash his throat under my staff like I did Arjuna's. I let the thought slip past my blind. I don't care. My strength is not in words. It's in battle. Take the lower position, he says through the water, his words precise, formal. I nod to him and stride across the hall, downstream in the flat sheet that flows across the floor, that originates with the river Thel and runs through every room in the vast temple before dropping to the sea. The lower position is easier, as thoughts travel faster downstream with the current. It's a small advantage, but I'll take it. My pride is not so great as to think I can beat the Chosen of Ujjay as easily as I beat Arjuna, though I do intend to beat him. I crouch, fingers to the water, staff flat behind me, pushing my awareness out. And see myself with a shock. He isn't even bothering to hide his thoughts as he strides confidently across the floor toward me, catching a staff one of the students throws to him. I am a small figure in the sunlit room, 
black hair falling nearly to the water, body wiry under damp robes. I look small, vulnerable in the vast space. Maybe that's why he's letting me see. I stand, uneasy. No one has ever done this before. It violates the basic rule to let no one in. And yet, I can't read his thoughts, his intentions, the normal, unrelated things that run through everyone's minds. Only his sight. With a gasp, I realize he's partially opened his water blind, showing some things and hiding others. This is beyond me, far beyond me. I grip my staff tighter as he approaches. His thoughts remain completely closed, but the sight he offers gives me some small advantage at least. It vanishes, and in the dead silence that follows, he strikes. I manage to get my staff up, blocking left with a crack, but the force of the blow nearly knocks me from my feet. Floods, he's strong. I step right, spinning my staff to catch his ribs. He's fast, too. My staff whooshes through the air where he was, the chosen circling left. I lean back to avoid a counter-strike, and the dance is joined. We circle and parry and thrust and slash in grim silence, water splashing and glinting around us. He's no better fighter than I at base, but his speed and strength are unbelievable. I dodge back again, gradually giving ground, being driven back toward the flat stone walls of the chamber, our engagement already twice as long as any I've had today, and his water blind still as silent as the midnight ocean. I need to do something, find some edge, or I'm going to lose. So I form a thought, a simple suggestion in my head, a slip, a stumble, a moment of gracelessness or overreaction. And as I block a bone-shaking overhead blow, I push the thought into the water, push it at Narimes. He stops for a moment, eyes widening. I think maybe it's worked, this power of water sight I've discovered, of actually planting thoughts in another's head. Then his eyes narrow, and he comes at me again in a flurry of blows. Well done, his voice comes through the water, but I am beyond such tricks. I step back, running into the wall, and it's a quick series from there to the corner, to the floor, to his quarterstaff mashing my throat, to me admitting I yield. I almost don't, preferring death to dishonor, but pragmatism wins out. I'll have other chances at this man, when I'm a full seer and I can do better than defeat him in a spar, when I can depose him and prove that I am no heresy, that it's the temple, not me, that needs to change. His black eyes lock on mine. So your heresy runs deeper than your sex, his voice comes in the water, pitched for my mind alone. That is a shame. A chill runs through me despite the heat. I might have imagined it before, but there's no denying it now. He read me through my blind, which is impossible, and also means I've made an enemy here if I didn't already have one. Aloud, he says, impressive, tossing the staff back to its owner without looking. There are not many in the temple who could stand before you, Alethea of the Viola, water sight or no. He smiles, but I guess I am one of them. He nods to Erte. My apologies, trainer, for intruding on class. If you did more to enforce orthodoxy within our walls, perhaps I would not need to step in. Erte does not flinch under the criticism, and my heart swells. I will do as Uje commands, your grace. See that you do, Nurime snaps, and sweeps out with a last glance at me. Erte dismisses class. Deshaun gives me a look on the way out, wide face concerned, but he's clearly not going to say anything in front of everyone else. Good. The last thing I need right now is someone feeling sorry for me. I pace to the cubbies in the wall, trying to sort out what this means, why Narimes came, what it bodes for my position in the temple. If he's finally going to disappear me, now that he knows I'm more than my father's pawn, that I'm a heretic too. Too bad I'm also the best seer the temple has seen in generations. Try disappearing that. Well done today, Alethea, Erte says through the water, in a thought too soft for any but the closest to hear. He stands in a pool of sunlight, weathered chest bare, hands clasped behind his back. You think I'm foolish, I think back to him. I don't need to see through his water blind to know his mind, not after so many years. He inclines his head. 
You are strong. Even the Chosen says so. But strength means little without insight. You think I should have let Arjuna win, should have bowed down to get into his house. You need a house to be elevated, Alethea. It is part of the test. I kick at a leaf floating in the water. And what good will a house do me if everyone sees I'm not the best, that the heretic girl isn't even a skilled heretic? I'd be out of here faster than the spring flood, even if Nerimace doesn't ship me off. Erte sighs and turns to the windows, cool breeze carrying the smell of salt and the sounds of the city below. Child, how many forms of water are there? Three, I answer, letting a bit of impatience slip through my blind. This is first-year stuff. Liquid, ice, and steam. And which of these would you say is the strongest? Ice, I answer without hesitation. Though we rarely see it in Surrey, I learned my lessons well. Even before we started sparring, I had to be the best. Not only is it the strongest, when set in cracks it can split stone, as the philosophers believe even our sea cliffs were made. Erte cocks his head. And how does the ice get into the stone? Is it forced in there, solid and cold? I frown. I haven't seen it, but I assume it must flow in first, then freeze. I see his lesson a moment later. He says it anyway. Water's strength is in its adaptability, little bird, in its ability to flow into the tiniest of cracks and also to freeze and split apart mountains. But ice on its own? He shrugs. It is not nearly so strong as stone or steel. It will crack. It will shatter. It will break nothing apart if it cannot first flow. I gather my things and turn to him. You would have me be fluid, flow into the cracks of this temple, that I might break it apart? He gives me a pained smile. I would have you serve this temple, as your father did, not split it apart. But he did split it apart, I think bitterly, with his heresies, with me. I'm the reason the traditionalists seize power at all. No, Erte says, his voice hard for once. Sturgjohn was no heretic. You are not a heretic. It is the temple that failed to adapt, that stayed ice when it ought to have been water. You can change that, but not if you do not first learn to be liquid, too. I sigh, gazing out the giant square windows at the ocean and the white-roofed buildings of Surrey beyond, climbing the sides of the bay to the cliff tops. All I've ever been is ice. If I change now, he turns to me, you will still be the best of them, and the best version of yourself, too. I sigh. Thank you, Erte. I wish I could take his advice, but it's too dangerous. I am leaving the temple for a few days, Erte says. Some business in the peninsula. Be careful while I'm gone. Careful? I turn to him. Careful of what? The old man purses his lips. Likely of nothing, but do it all the same. I nod, sensing the dismissal, then remember something. Is there another form of water blind? He shakes his head. What do you mean? Nerimes let me into a part of his thoughts today, but not all of them, and I could swear he read thoughts through my blind. Is there more we haven't been taught? Little bird, there is no water seer in the world who can do such things, but pride can imagine reasons to hide the truths it does not wish to see. He drops his blind to me, and I see he's telling the truth as far as he knows. Still, I wasn't imagining it. I turned to leave rather than be rude to Erte. He was loyal to my father and is the closest thing I have to a friend among the seers. I know what I know, and not knowing how Narimes did it or why he came today, Two. I spend my meditation period chopping vegetables. We do chores for the same reason we spar, to prove we can hold concentration in the middle of action. The trainers come on you randomly, punishing you if you've dropped your blind, but they rarely bother me. I've been holding mine day and night for years now because my very thoughts are heresy, because I think I, a woman, have a place here, and that my father didn't deserve to die for it. Heresy! but so long as they never hear my thoughts, they can't punish me. At least, they couldn't while my father was alive. I chose kitchen work for my meditation because this was something Dad and I did together, before Mom died of the swooning plague and I was just a child here, not an acolyte. I remember him showing me the different fruits and vegetables, 
the way the onion had its own natural divisions, the ways I could use that to make different shapes, this one better for curries, this one for sautés. When I stand here in the quiet basement kitchens, I can almost imagine he's standing next to me, smiling at the quick work I make of the eggplants, yams, and ginger. After he put me in training, things were different. Parents aren't allowed much contact with acolyte children, and on top of the heresy of putting a girl into the male order of Ujayism, I guess he didn't want to push it by talking to me too often either. That was when I started to resent him, even as I wanted to make him proud. That he would put me here and then ignore me, ignore the fact that Mom died. Then, just as popular opinion was starting to shift against him, he was found floating in the tide pools. I still remember the way his thick beard was matted to his face with salt water when they laid him on a table down here. A suicide, everyone said. Atonement for his sins, according to the traditionalists. Yeah, right. My father was nothing but driven, and anything but sorry for the way he was trying to change our faith, and the timing was too convenient. But until I become a full seer, until I can show them I'm too perfectly Ujjayan to be a heresy, I have to stay strong. That's what Urte doesn't understand. I'll get into a house. I just have to force my way in. Think they're small enough yet? I spin, raising the knife. Deshaun, you can't sneak up on me like that. He sidesteps, grinning and holds up a hand in our old greeting. I can, actually, down here with no water. It's the only time. A man's got to take what advantages he can get. I punch it, like I did the day in third year we fought each other bloody, then decided to be friends. Seriously, though, he says, handsome with wide cheekbones and pale skin that speak to Bomani heritage. Think those mushrooms are good? I look down. I've bashed the mushrooms to tiny pieces. I blush, despite myself. I hate that Deshaun can do this to me. Yeah, uh, guess I got distracted. His face gets serious. Nerimes? I sigh. Nerimes, Erjuna, the houses, take your pick. You were amazing today. I didn't think any of us could fight like that. You'll make a great overseer. The feeling comes off him again. I don't know why, but sometimes I swear I can feel what Deshaun's feeling. And right now, he's feeling that warm, glowy, lovey thing that always makes me uncomfortable. I appreciate that he wants it. Relationships with girls are frowned on in the temple. But I don't have time for emotions like that. It was stupid. There's no way I'm getting into a house now. He works his jaw. That's why I'm here, actually. I talked to Erjuna. He said maybe we could still take you. The words take a second to register. Still take me? Hope soars in my belly like a seagull riding drafts. Getting into a house would get me so much closer to full seer. Then I think for a second, and the seagull plummets. Let me guess. I just have to let him beat me? Deshaun winces. All of us, actually. All of them? And he thinks I'm going to want to do this? I see red for a second, then concentrate on making the emotion a block of ice and set it aside for later. I let out a long breath. I can't do that, Deshaun. You know that. He huffs air out his nose, a sign he's frustrated. Why not? Alethea, it's just this one time. You'd be safe in our house. I'd be there and... And you'd what? Protect me? My knuckles turn white on the hilt of the knife. Did I look like I needed protection today? I'm not talking about fighting, Thea. Yes, obviously, you're good at that. He purses his lips and looks back to me. I can feel his concern. Look... I didn't want to tell you this, but have you heard about the violet eyes in the city? What about them? Eyes like mine are rare in Saray, descendants of a group of North Shore refugees that came two generations ago. My grandfather married one, and during his and my father's rule, the eyes were a mark of prestige in the city. Probably not anymore. They're disappearing, Thea. No one knows why, but suddenly you don't see them on the street or in the markets. People are saying they're being shipped off or killed. My hands go cold. You think it's the traditionalists? Like they've been doing to the violet eyes here? I had sixteen cousins in the temple, children of my dad's brothers. I'm the only one left now, the rest kicked out of training or shipped off to work as messengers on remote river stations the rest of their lives. Deshaun glances around. There's no one in the room and the floors are dry, but it's still dangerous talk. Look, I respect that you want to do it on your own but nobody gets raised to full seer alone. 
and having a house to support you might be a good thing right now. Or, throwing a bunch of fights might just show that I don't belong here at all. I can't do it, Deshaun. I sigh, trying to feel grateful. I know he's just trying to help. Thank you, though. He takes my hand, his grip firm and warm. The lovey feeling floods back. Thea, please, I'm worried about you. I struggle for a second. It's tempting to say yes, to just give in to it, to trust Deshaun. I'm tired of doing this alone. Dead tired if I let myself admit it. Having allies sounds amazing. But compromise once, and you never stop compromising. I pull my hand away. I can't. But we'd be together. You and me. I miss the warmth of his hand already, the solidity of his grip. I ice the emotion, stacking it next to the other one to be dealt with later. I don't need another kind of weakness. Not right now. I'll think about it, okay? Do that, he says, eyes falling. I frown. Aren't you supposed to be scrubbing waterways? I, yeah, I should go. I'll see you tomorrow, yeah? I nod. Bye, Deshaun. I hold up a hand and he punches it, and I bash some more mushrooms. It's not a bad offer. It's probably a good one, actually. Maybe I'm just being arrogant or proud to not want to take a fall for everyone in his house. Being ice instead of water, Erte would say. And maybe I would do it if I was another guy. But I'm not, and the only reason I've made it this far is because I've always been better, always been stronger, too good to possibly kick out. Without that, I'm nothing. A shout from the next room interrupts my thoughts. I stick my foot in the wastewater channel that runs across the floor instinctively. Not much comes through it, but that's no surprise. Only the upper-level floors stay covered in water, so the trainers can monitor the students, and since Narimes came into power, they don't even do that much. Down here, with no trainers and dry floors, it's open season. A dish shatters, and there's another shout. I recognize the voice, Meldon, one of the lower-ranked students in our class, shouting like he does when he gets angry. Come down to the caves to blow off a little steam when he should be meditating on a laborer who'll lose their job if they fight back. I put down my knife and start walking. There's another reason I meditate down in the kitchens, to keep slop holes like Meldon in check. Flooding lack water, he's yelling. If you can't even clean a plate, what are you doing here? Do you even speak, Ujay? The boy is on the floor, arms covering his head, doing exactly what he has to, not resist the student. I hate it, but we get a privileged spot in the temple. We're below the full seers and trainers, of course, but they still turn a blind eye to what we do to the maintenance staff. The others do, anyway. It's always infuriated me. I kick a mop bucket over, water gushing onto the floor. Floods do you think you're doing, Meldon? I ask through it, bringing him up cold. His eyes meet mine, hate and fear mixing there. He doesn't answer, but his sloppy excuse for a blind lets enough through. He's having fun where he can intimidating the kitchen staff because he can't intimidate anyone in our class, because he's a low pick in a low house and can't do anything about it. I flash all that back to him so he knows I've read it. And this is how you make yourself feel better? Picking on people who lose their job if they fight back? Flood you, witch, he spits back. Chosen's got his eye on you anyway. Do your worst. I hate the spike of fear he puts in me. And when I hate something, I fight back. I swing a fist at him, maybe not the wisest move in the crowded kitchen or against a member of the only house likely to take me in, but I've got bigger problems than getting into a flooding house. He knocks it away, sending a pan flying. Without staffs, his bigger size and strength matter more here, but not enough. I dodge the punch he telegraphs through the water and deliver a hard series of fists to his kidney and liver with ice hands. He doubles over, gasping maybe about to puke. I kick him the rest of the way down and put a foot on his chest. This is what happens when you mess with little people, Meldon. I meet his eyes, lock onto them. They mess back. Got it? Flood you, he spits, not bothering to speak in the water. You'll be gone in a week anyway. I know it's just talk, just him trying to hit me any way he can, but it stays with me as I help the kid up, finish my meditations, and go to my room. I don't bother reporting him. That much commotion in the waters, one of the trainers heard. Meldon'll get his, though likely not very much because it was only a kitchen worker. 
if I ever get to the top, when I get to the top, that's all going to change. 3. My room is my refuge. It's hardly bigger than my bunk, just one in a long row of stone cells, but it's all mine. A water trough babbles along one side, a shelf on the other holds my books and robes, and sandwiched between is my bed and about enough space to turn around in. It's glorious. I stretch out after washing, letting the cool night air blow in through my round window, fingers dangling in the trough. The temple makes its usual evening sounds in the water, comforting even if most of the people here despise me. It's the sound of home. Seers hold counseling sessions with supplicants from the city, overseers discuss news and legal cases, and senior monks drone sunset chants from the altars on the cliff. Tonight, much of it revolves around the upcoming wedding. Narimes is marrying a Salem Dale woman, forging an alliance between Saray and the technocrats from the mountains to the north. As usual, discussions are weighted with innuendo and hidden agendas. That's usual since they killed my dad, anyway. The temple didn't used to be this political. It used to be about maintaining justice and guiding citizens and defending the city. Now it's all about who's in power and who wants to get there. I hate it, but I have to keep my ears open in case any of it spells danger for me. I haven't forgotten Erte's warning, either, to be careful while he's gone. I hear nothing unusual. One by one the voices drift into sleep, thoughts blurring like a painting under waves. My mind doesn't want to stop working over the events of the day, but eventually I start to drift too. Something starts me up a while later. I can't tell how long, but the stars have moved in the sky. My fingers are still in the water. I've learned to monitor the temple even while I sleep. There, it comes again. A bird chirp, but in the water. I frown. That's a very strange thought, especially at this time of night. Most of the mines in the water are asleep, thoughts fuzzed, though there's some activity near the deepling pool downstream. Then I hear a voice, clear and steady. There are three forms of water, ice, liquid, and steam. Our power lies in knowing when to freeze, when to flow, and when to fly. It's distant, coming from far upstream, but I recognize the voice. It's Erte, reciting one of the basic proverbs of Ujjayism. The chirps come again, like a little bird, his nickname for me. I sit up, and the words repeat. There are three forms of water, ice, liquid, and steam. Our power lies in knowing when to freeze, when to flow, and when to fly. To fly. I start up, pulling on my robe, grabbing my staff. There's some kind of trouble, whatever he was warning me to watch for. Maybe Meldon or Arjuna or a whole pack of them come to take revenge. It doesn't matter. My gut says run. The window is too small to fit through, but I can slip out the front. My water blind is perfect, even now. There'll be no way to hear me. I'll climb on the temple roof and wait till morning. The door slams open, sandwiching me against the wall. I shove back, but whoever's on the other side is too strong. Fear strikes hard and I take a deep breath, icing it with concentration. Time for that later. I slip from behind the door onto the bed, dropping into sleeting rain stance. It's like I thought. Erjuna's in front, four or five students behind him, mostly from his house. Meldon's there too, the prick. Erjuna attacks and I faint left, jabbing my staff forward into his throat. Without water connecting us, I can't read his thoughts ahead of time, but I hardly need to. Erjuna stumbles back choking and a bigger one pushes in. They're wearing boots. Oiled leather boots, impervious to water sight. And banned in the temple. Where did they get them? Fear twists in my gut. This is something more than a beating. Are they going to kill me? I ice the emotion again in steady breathing, setting this block of emotion next to the other, building a wall as we were trained to do. The big one lunges in, dropping his staff for fists. I jab my staff slow for his chest. He catches it, but that's what I wanted. I swing around on the staff, scissor kicking both legs into his forehead. His head snaps back, but he doesn't stop, arms reaching for me. I jump back, feeling for the first time they may be too many for me. I've fought for it once, 
but that was with space, with the safety of Erte's gaze on us. Now there's nothing but... The water, of course! I kick a foot from my trough just as Ergina shouts something. If I can get my thoughts in the water, drop my blind and let the temple know what's happening. A staff jabs in, knocking my ankle away. Then Big One has me by the leg, grinning, throwing me back onto the bed, away from the water. Floods. I fight, but the unhurt ones pile in, and panic starts to rise as their fists win out over my skill, their strength over my precision. I kick groins and clap ears and break Erjuna's nose, but eventually they have me pinned. Erjuna leans in, his voice nasal through the blood. Should have taken a fall, sister. He presses three fingers to my skull, diver's bind. Too late now. Four. I wake to water on my legs, and a probing sensation, like a finger's touch in my mind, where I never let anyone in. I snap my blind up, concentration focusing in an instant, but the touch is still there. Ah, you're awake. I open my eyes to find Nerimes, deep-set sockets gazing at me across a narrow pool, bare legs dangling in the water. The council is arrayed to either side of him, elders from the temple's branches of seers and theocrats and overseers, traditionalists all, the men who used my father's death to gain power. Behind them, a marble balcony opens on to night sky, the temple's waters spilling off the edge. With a jerk, I realize where we are, the deepling pool, the holiest room in the temple, the place they performed my father's last rites. My gorge rises, even more so when I see Erjuna and the others are not here. We're alone, which can only mean one thing. They're finally getting rid of me. I lurch from the pool, body screaming in a dozen places from where the boys beat me, and iron hands clamp onto my shoulders. Two overseers stand behind me, the strongest and fastest of the monks, usually assigned to policing and defending the city. Easy, Narime says aloud. You're among friends here, Alethea, and I still need you in the pool. He nods and they push me back down. Into the pool of their thoughts. I shudder. This is where the council holds its meetings, water blinds dropped and minds melded in the water for perfect transparency. But tonight, the pool has been dammed off so the temple can't hear the proceedings, a thing they do at only the most serious times. Like after my father's death. What is this? I spit trying again to force the probing fingers out of my mind. I can't. An investigation, Alethea. Into what? I've done nothing wrong. Into your heresies, child, Narime says. Mist swirls behind him, blown up from the river that tumbles off the balcony edge to the sea hundreds of feet below. The council has worried for some time that your father's heresies extended to you, but it took my visit today to confirm it. Anger rises in me, and I don't bother icing it. Anger is better than fear. To confirm what? That I'm a girl, a heresy, and still the best acolyte in the temple? That I'm still heir to the man you had to kill to take the dais? There are hisses around me as the monks suck in breath. Such words are not said lightly in the temple. But I don't mean them lightly. And if I'm going to die here, I will speak my mind. I did not kill your father, Narime says evenly. Look, though I warn you it may be disturbing. He drops his blind. An image comes of my father, but not as I saw him laid out on the stone tables of the kitchens. I know him only by his robes, and the wailing monks and citizens around him, as he floats face down in one of the city's fountains. I suck in a breath. This was no suicide. This was murder. Just like I'd thought. Grief and longing open like a raw wound inside, overwhelming my anger and the satisfaction of being right. I breathe deep, seeking focus, needing to focus. This is no time to show weakness. I manage to ice my feelings and return to my calm as the memory plays out, mind racing. So you admit it wasn't a suicide, I say, voice steady. Eyebrows raise around the pool at my internal control. It was no suicide, child, one of the theocrats says. You deserve to know that, at least. So you covered it up? I ask, eyes narrowing. Isn't that like admitting guilt? 
It is admitting the city's needs come before our ideals at times, Narime says, closing his mind off again. Your father had already made a mess of things, neglecting trade and aggravating tensions with the Therakents. News of a murder would have thrown things further into chaos when what we needed was order. Order, I scoff. Lies, you mean, to create an order that would benefit you. And this from the man sworn to uphold the truth of Ujay. Did you at least find the murderer? I still think it was them, but I'm curious to hear what they'll say, if they'll just admit it. There are some truths too dangerous to speak, even now, a theocrat of the Order of Seers intones. So they won't admit guilt. Frustrating, but it kindles a spark of hope inside. Maybe they aren't planning to kill me. Otherwise, why hold back? Then another suspicion hits me. Do you, honored theocrats, even know the answer? Or has he hidden it from you too? There are no secrets in the deepling pool, child, Narime says. I ignore him, speaking to the other men gathered, wise and devout men all, even if they are traditionalists. And are you aware that Narimes can reveal some parts of his mind while still hiding others? That what you think is full transparency may in fact be deception? Do not foul these waters with lies, an ancient man from the overseer branch barks. A partial blind is impossible. You see, Narime says, spreading his hands, it is as I suspected. The girl has become a heretic like her father. Even now she spouts impossibilities. My father was no heretic, I spit. I should stay calm, but I can't stand the sight of this man sitting where my father belongs and insulting his memory. Or do you think he gave me water sight and not Ujay? No, child, Narime says with infuriating patience. We accepted your strange blessing years ago. Your father's heresy was obsession with the immersions, with his doomsday fears about the deluge. Even that we could tolerate. Every scholar is allowed his interpretations. But when he began neglecting the city, we could not let it continue. Neglecting it? Saray flourished under my father. His decision to open our doors and offer arbitration and guidance is what made us great, earned us the name the City of Justice and Enlightenment. Even you can't deny that. Narimes' smile is pained. It is true, your father did an admirable job in his early years. But acolytes miss much, focused as you are on your studies and training. Trade fell apart at the end of your father's reign. The faithful were growing uneasy of his heretical interests, and the Witches' Guild sought to exploit our weakness to finally seize control of the city. It is no wonder the people supported a return to traditionalism once he was gone. It was also flooding convenient you were ready to take advantage of that just as he was murdered. My voice breaks a little at the last word. Despite all this, despite my suspicions, it still hurts to know he was killed. But I can't think about that now. I bury it in my anger. Narime smiles. What one calls convenience another may see as providence, child. Ujay works in mysterious ways. It takes everything I have not to leap across the water and throttle him, much as I know the overseers would stop me. What you call providence, I call corruption, starting with covering up my father's murder. And that is why we have brought you here tonight, Narime says calmly, not for your past or parentage or even your impossible water sight. It is for the heresies you have chosen. What are you talking about, I spit, even as fear makes me slam my blind up stronger than ever. Still, I feel his perception there, following my thoughts as I think of my disagreements with the temple, then repeating them in the water, my dislike for the politics, my suspicions about my father, and my belief that water site testing and training should be open to all people, not just men. Your imagination is again too small, little one, he says in the water. Policies can shift so long as we keep to the spirit of Ujay, but politics must be honored for the temple to survive. And in politics, dissent is the ultimate heresy. The counselors all nod sagely, as if this was wisdom. I don't bother to ice the anger that boils up. Are you all corrupt then? You would sacrifice the purity of our beliefs for politics? For power? Desperate times, the counselor intones. Even half a year later, the city is still unstable. We cannot risk division spreading to the faithful. I can't argue with this. I haven't been to the city in years, but I know it's all lies. Feel it deep in my gut. 
you're not killing me because I'm a threat to the city or orthodoxy or whatever. You're killing me because I'm a threat to your power. Our power is orthodoxy, Narime says in the waters. A shame you had to get in the way. We could have used you. Aloud, he says. Counselors, have we heard enough? Are you convinced of the girl's heresy? They all nod sagely, and disillusionment steals the fire from my veins. The best seers of the temples, either too zealous or too duped by Narimes to realize this has been no kind of fair trial. If this is the best the Temple of Ujjay has to offer, then brand me a heretic. So what, I say, you drown me now, like you did my father? Now you have a choice, Narime says, unperturbed. Sex aside, you are an asset to the temple and still young enough to change. You do not have to continue your father's heresy, Alethea. Recant here and now, and we will consider your transgression absolved, so long as you defend our orthodoxy going forward. Give up seeking the truth about my father and submit to their bald power grab, in other words. And if I don't? Then let the father judge you as he has all heretics of the past. Narimes gestures behind him, to where the river flows off the cliff's edge. Immersion, coupled with an impossibly high fall. The histories tell of few who survived the father's judgment, and all of them were full seers who had already been immersed. For an acolyte like me, still unprepared, immersion almost always results in madness or death. That's no judgment, I spit. It's a death sentence. One you do not need to accept, Alethea. Recant your heresy and join us. Never. The word is out of my mouth before I've had time to think about it, but I know it's right as it leaves. I would rather die than sacrifice who I am to this man. And maybe there's another way. Maybe I'll survive the immersion. Narime sighs. Then let Uj's will be done. Overseers? The men seize me and fear threatens my resolve. Fear and disappointment that they will get away with this, that no one will learn the truth and they will corrupt the temple worse than they already have, that justice will not be served by the very religion that claims to uphold it. I almost change my mind, almost just say the words, simple words, swearing I was wrong, that my father was wrong, that I'll be a good girl. But I can see the life that would lead to the constant fear that if I ever let my thoughts be known, ever try to do anything about their corruption, I'll end up right back here. Better to get it over with. I am no heretic, I cry as the overseers lift me like a doll. Counselors, look at what you're doing, what you're letting him do. Search your hearts. Is this justice? They stay quiet, a few having the decency to avoid my eyes. Cowards. The overseers carry me to the edge of the balcony, where another overseer waits with a set of ankle weights. Fear pounds like a blacksmith's hammer in my skull, pushing at my concentration. I push back. I can't rely on Ujjay for another miracle here. Besides, Ujjay works through human hands. So I do what I know. I summon the breathing, summon the ice, summon the willpower they've taught me over the last eight years. I take my anger and fears and freeze them, then build a wall ten feet thick and a hundred miles wide, behind which there's nothing but silence and peace. A place I can think. They're pulling my robes up, unlocking the clamps. I can't fight them, even without the weights, without the bruises and the overwhelming amount of opponents in the room, I can't take an overseer, not by myself. I can't leap off early, even if I survive the fall, going mad will do no one any good. And I can't persuade the overseers. They are famously dutiful, and Narimes was careful to say everything incriminating in the water. An overseer drags an iron weight to my ankle and loops the chain around it. If they only knew the truth, if they would only believe me, it comes to me then. I can make them know it. I drop my blind, summon my memories of what Narimes said in the pool, about killing me for getting in the way, about the real heresy being dissent. Both overseers are touching my skin, so the water will carry my thoughts. No reaction. The taller overseer takes the lock, reaching for my ankle. This has to work. I try harder, pushing past their blinds, pushing the memories into them, willing them to see. The big one gasps. The shorter one drops his key. And in the brief moment they are distracted, the brief pause the truth buys me, I run. 
I sprint past the pool and pound my way up the water-covered stairs, grateful for a childhood spent chasing birds and running from bullies. The counselors are shouting behind me, some of them beginning to give chase. I sense them all in the water. The overseers are not among them, likely still shocked by what I showed them. I bare my teeth in a grin. I'm just getting started. I blast through the auditorium doors and into one of the long temple hallways, marble walls lit with oil lamps. Water runs here, too, a finger or two along the floors, and I push my awareness into it, as I did with the overseers. Help! I cry, too rushed to think of something elegant. They're trying to kill me! Nerimes is trying to kill me! And after it I send the memories, the proof he revealed to me in the waters. There's no reaction, or little. Most of the temple is likely asleep. I keep doing it as I veer into the student's quadrant, the place I know best, the area with the tightest corridors and strangest turns. Narime shouts after me in the water, Lies! The girl has been found a heretic, a traitor! Even now she uses ungodly powers to sway you! Faithful of the temple, rise up and catch her! This elicits more of a response. I push my own memories in again, into the minds of all in the temple, proving Narimes' guilt. A boy stumbles from his room, a fifth year, and I slip past his sleepy grab. Another comes, a stocky teen in my class, grim-faced behind his staff. It's like sparring all over again, his thoughts easily read through his blind, but I don't have time for theatrics. He swings, I snatch the pole, kick him in the throat, and keep running as he collapses behind me. More come, stumbling from their rooms, filling the common areas, trying to stop me, a few looking sympathetic. I dash past them all, pursuers racing behind me, only fighting those I must. There are overseers chasing me now, too, men still loyal to Nerimes, apparently unmoved by my pleas. They're gaining. Fast as I am, it's no replacement for their strength and size, or for the brutal training that overseers follow, to keep the upper hand in the streets. I burst into the training hall to find it filling with students, more than I can take, more than I can get around. They run for me and I cut left, taking a narrow stair into the kitchens. I sprint through them in near darkness, relying on my memories of the place. The dry silence is eerie after all the shouting in the water, but I know it can't last. The kitchens don't extend all the way to the gates, but they do open onto the city, I realize. The delivery doors, built into the hillside on the edge of Old Saray. I turn that way, running blind, neither water sight nor light in the empty kitchens to guide me. I dash out into the laundry chambers, water dripping here. It's abandoned, though I hear shouts behind me. For the first time, I think maybe I'll make it. Splashing through the waste troughs, I am briefly reconnected in water sight. To Narimes. You cannot run from me, he is saying. Where can you go? The city? The city is ours. The overseer is sure to find you. Turn yourself in now and save yourself the pain. I reach the doors, shove them open, cool night air rushing in. I'd rather die, usurper, I push back into the water, along with the damning memories of him, just once more. If there were any good men here, this temple would rise up and pull you down. Then with pursuers hard on my heels, and the only life I've ever known vanishing behind me, I run out into the night streets. Five. A baby wails somewhere in the buildings above me. I crouch behind a broke-wheeled pushcart in an alley near the docks, trying to make a plan. It's dawn in Saray and the city is still cool, shadows long, the smell of ocean and hearth fires in my nose. The baby's cry sounds strange. There are no babies in the temple. I haven't heard one since I came out here on my tenth name day, seven years ago. Acolytes aren't allowed into the city. It breaks our concentration, they say. Or it keeps us from escaping. Running was easy in the night. The streets were empty, and the few people out didn't seem to notice my robes. Now, with the sun up, I feel like a crab in a cattle market. Or a girl in a temple. I should be used to it, but the rules are different here. Worse, I don't know what they are. Just that I don't look right, I don't talk like the dock workers passing on the street, 
and I don't have a job or a home or money to buy breakfast. And if I make a wrong move out here, the overseers will find me. I've seen two pairs of them already, shaven heads high, walking with hands out to brush merchants and town people, using water sight to read thoughts through their skin. It looks normal. This is how Ujaism has kept Saray so safe, how we got our reputation for peace and justice. The overseers patrol the streets, reading minds, punishing anyone who's committed a crime and warning those who are thinking about it. If there are any emergencies, you stick a foot in the water trough and think panicked thoughts, and they come and punish whoever's guilty. Only today, my guess is they're looking for more than guilty thoughts. They're looking for sightings of a violet-eyed girl in monk's robes. And the first whiff they get of me will start a chase I can't win. Not against an overseer's size and strength, and their knowledge of a city that feels foreign to me, though I've lived on the cliffs above it my whole life. I'm out of my robes, at least. I felt bad, but I pulled a shirt and trousers from a clothesline on my way here. They don't fit right, and I'm realizing not many women wear trousers, but they won't give me away at first glance. At the end of the alley, women pass in flowing, open-bottom blouses, colorful wraps covering their legs. The men here are mostly laborers, with dark tans and muscled shoulders sticking from short vests. I'm in the black water, a slum near the docks, so I might be able to get on board one of the ships crossing the strait to Bomani. Or I could wait until night, climb the streets to the dry quarter, and haggle for a place on a Dura caravan leaving the city. I don't have any money, but with my training I could probably work as a guard. I adjust my crouch behind the pushcart, muscles cramping. What I know is that I can't stay here. I'm parched and hungry, and sooner or later someone will notice I've been hiding here for hours and get curious. So I take a deep breath, turn my fear and anxiety to ice, and step out into the street. I half expect to see a pair of overseers waiting for me around the corner. I don't. Instead, I see Saray, not the sprawling city of white marble curled around an azure bay you can see from the temple but a cobbled lane crowded with vendors and workers and people of every dress and skin tone. Three-story wood shanties lean overhead with red awnings tied between them, snapping in the ocean breeze. Dogs and chickens and camels jostle people for space in a street that winds stepwise down the steep slope toward the bay. This is my city, or the city I want to serve at least. I've trained my whole life to be a seer, to spend my days meeting with these people, using water sight and thoughtful questions to counsel them through their problems. Being a woman always complicated that, but I'd get through it. Even father's murder didn't change that. It just meant I had to be that much better. But now? There's no place for me in the temple. Not the way it is now. I turn a corner, scanning the street for overseers. They murdered my father. Narimes wouldn't admit to it, even if he owned up to covering it up. But it's too convenient that his party was ready to seize power just as father died, and they were obviously ready to kill me for being in the way. For dissenting. What did Nurime say? Dissent is the ultimate heresy. Not dissent with our principles or practices. Dissent with his power. And that's heresy if I've ever heard it. Ujaism has always been about the search for truth, which means welcoming all kinds of opinions along the way. So forget running. I will be a true Jayan, maybe the only one left now, with their corruption spreading through the temple. I'll find the truth about my father's death and use it to expose the truth about Narimes and take my temple back, because I have no doubt they were behind it. I just have to prove it now. I pass a pair of girls fanning coals under a stack of bamboo dumpling trays, and the savory steam that rises from them makes my parched mouth water. The question is how to prove it. Whatever I learn, I can show to the temple in water sight, and memories are incontrovertible evidence. But there's no way I can talk to the theocrats or members of Nerimes' cabal without getting caught. Going back to the temple would only get me killed. I turn a corner onto a broad street lined with fruit vendors, which means I have to do it out here. If my hunch is right that Nerimes set up the conditions to seize power before he had my father killed, then people in the city will have been involved in every part of that. He talked about my father giving the witches too much power, hurting the city's trade, and being a heretic. If it was a setup, someone in the Merchants Guild will know, 
and the town criers and the witches themselves. I have no experience gathering clues like this, and I'm not good with words at baseline, but I do have an edge here. No one knows how to block water sight. I can read their thoughts and collect memories of them admitting the traditionalists bribed them or scared them or whatever they did, then expose those memories to the temple in water sight. No one will be able to deny me then. I duck behind a display of Bamani rugs at the sight of shaven heads down the street. There's just one hitch. I have to stay alive long enough to do it. I could go to the Witches Guild. The Therakins Guild is their actual name. The female side of Ujaism, women who read blood instead of water, skilled at healing but also able to use their magic to control patients' bodies. They are ancient enemies of the temple, and they'd probably be happy to help if they knew I was working against Narimes. I have to be careful, though. If any seer thought I was in league with the Therakins, my lifetime of service to the temple would mean nothing. I get called a witch as it is, just because I'm a woman. Or I could go to one of the other guilds, try to convince them of the justice of my cause. But none of them have water sight, so it'd be my word, daughter of the ousted chosen, against Narimes, who controls the overseer police and the temple tax guilds have to pay. So no, I'm going to have to do this alone. Which first of all means finding something to eat. And since I don't have any money, I guess I'm going to have to steal it. Sorry, UJ. Sorry, Dad. We have a principle against stealing, but I guess I'm a heretic now. I hate the idea, but I hate the thought of Narimes controlling the temple and city worse. There's a market ahead, with rows of stands and carts circled around one of the city's wide fountains. I make for it, weaving through tables piled with colorful fabrics and leatherworks, trying to be unobtrusive. I've never stolen anything besides the clothes I'm wearing. Actually, I've never bought anything either. The temple has always provided. So not only do I have no experience stealing things, I don't even really know how people buy them. Thankfully, the market is a solid press of bodies. If things go wrong, I doubt anyone could chase me for very long in this. If it wasn't for the overseers, they'd probably have a huge problem with crime. But thieves lose their hands, and anyone who suspects something can just stick their foot in the water channels and call for an overseer. So I have to be smooth or fast, hopefully both. A fruit peddler notices me looking at his colorful stacks. Mangoes, limes, bananas still green from the Bomani jungles? Uh, I say stupidly, stomach growling. I don't. He frowns and I move on. I need to be smoother, faster. There's a samosa cart ahead, fried triangles of dough smelling like nectar from Ujay. I reach for one, trying to look innocent, and a hand grabs my wrist before I've barely touched it. Thief, the old woman snaps. I've got a thief. So much for smooth. Fast, I do better. I dart left, weaving between people, clutching the samosa in one hand. It isn't as easy as I thought. The crowd is thick, and everyone heard the woman shout. Some of them start trying to block my way. I use elbows and knees, apologizing and actually feeling sorry, but needing to get out quick. I break through the carts to the fountain in the center of the plaza. A woman in long skirts glances up. Her eyes narrow. You, she says. Come with me. Surprise stops me dead. A witch. And she knows who I am? I run the other way. Behind me she barks something, and an ordinary man leading two dogs on a single leash turns, eyes going wide. He grabs for me. My stomach lurches. Blood magic. The witch is controlling him. What does she want? I dodge, his grab is slow and clumsy, and push into the other side of carts, icing another wave of panic that rises up in me. Someone's called the overseers by now. The man bellows behind me, and I glance back to see him forcibly shoving through the crowd, eyes still wide with the witch's control, dogs forgotten behind him. So now the temple and the witches are after me. Great. I get out of the market and sprint down the street. The wide-eyed man follows, but he's not very fast. Apparently blood witchery doesn't help with that. So I pelt around a long team of camels plodding uphill and look for a place to lose him. I catch sight of a bald-headed man charging up a side street, robes flowing behind him, eyes deadly. An overseer, likely called by someone in the market. He'll know what I look like because of their thoughts in the water. Floods. 
I switched directions, cutting into a narrow side street between alleys, leaping barrels and trash heaps and a pair of slat-eyed cats. The overseer has seen me, though, and crashes into the alley. I come out in a busy street and try staying low, slipping through the crowd so as not to make a scene. It doesn't work. He's fifteen paces behind me and gaining, eyes peaceful in the steel grip of concentration. Two can play at that. I ice everything inside, make my mind a waterfall in winter, give myself fully to the chase. And for a second, it works. I run faster, weave smoother, dodge better than before, totally free from fear. But when I turn to check on him, my foot catches a peddler's broom. I slam into the cobblestones, breath clapping out of me. He's on me an instant later, eyes still calm, hands clamping on my arms. I don't fight. There's no point fighting an overseer, especially without my staff. I'd just lose with more bruises. I try reading him when our skins touch, but his blind is a stone wall. Alethea Viola, he says, lifting me from the center of a rapidly clearing circle. We've been looking for you. They're lying, I gasp, desperate. I push my memories into him, the scene from last night. The council's trying to kill me. You can't take me back to them. The overseer pauses for a moment, considering, then shakes his head. Those are matters for the theocrats. I obey the law, and the law says you are to be brought back to the temple for sentencing. Floods. But the law is wrong. It's based on lies. His eyes stay calm as lakes. That is a matter for the council. Floods. So much for my sleuthing and revolution. Narimes will laugh me all the way to my death. I open my mouth for one more try, and the overseer's head snaps forward. He drops me, crumpling to the street. The wide-eyed man stands behind him, fist deformed where the force of the blow broke bones, chest heaving. I told you to come with me, he says in a haughty voice. A woman's voice. The witch. I run. I'm not about to trade Narimes for whatever the witch's guild has in store for me. Plus, I know I can outrun this guy. Only, as I sprint away, another man goes wide-eyed down the street and turns for me. I dodge him, and he runs after me. A woman and her teenage son ahead suddenly look at me, eyes going wide. The shopkeeper across from them reaches for a heavy club with bulging eyes. Floods. I duck into a maze of alleys. They charge after, a motley pack of wide-eyed people yelling something in unison. I don't waste my time listening. Until I hit a dead end. The narrow alley ends in a brick wall going up twenty paces on all sides. I spin to find the witch-controlled people closing in, shouting in unison, Told you to come with me, girl! Hey! I start climbing, heart pounding, but the brick offers no good grips. Come, they chant. I hear the hey again, more insistent, coming from above, as in not from the possessed people. I look up. A black rope dangles from the edge of the roof like the helping hand of a jay. I grab it and pull myself up. One of the possessed seizes my leg. I kick him off, but not before I read an awful blankness through his skin, as if his mind has been painted over. Another one lunges for me and I scramble up. I don't know who threw this down, but they can't possibly be worse. Six. I haul myself onto the flat roof to find a stocky girl with one eye holding the rope. Thank you, I pant. She glances over the edge. Don't thank me yet. How's your balance? My what? Fine. Grunts sound from the crowd below. They must be climbing. Then follow me. She takes off across the roof at a run. What choice do I have? I run after. And jump after. She leaps the gap between this roof and the next, and only stops when we are three or four roofs away, one of them so old I was sure I'd fall through. Not bad, she says, eyeing me up and down from the steep pitch of a tile roof. The witches have you training for the guard? The witches? Yeah, she says, raising an eyebrow. You know, the ones you ran away from? That sent that mob of bloodborne after you? Oh, they didn't, I mean... I take a breath. I hate words. I'm not running from the witches. The girl frowns, scars over her missing eye crinkling. Then why were they after you? I have no idea. And even if I did, I'm not going to go blabbing it to the first person I meet. Not when there's so much I don't know. So you're not a Theracant runaway? No, just a regular runaway, I guess. I shift. It's strange to define myself like that. 
especially on the peak of a thatch roof to a one-eyed stranger. She chews her lip, emotions playing across her face. Okay, well, good luck. She turns and leaps to a lower roof, graceful as a gazelle. Wait, I leap after. I haven't had a chance to thank you. And something tells me this girl knows how to take care of herself in the city. Something I desperately need to learn. You're welcome. Now stop following me. Wait. I catch her arm and she stiffens. Why did you help me? I don't like witches. Thought you might be a runaway. She shrugs. Call it my good deed for the day. She's not dressed like most women in Saray, though I think she's a woman. The flowing pants and pocket-studded leather vest hide most of her figure. She ties the rope and trots away. But I don't even know your name, I call. It's dumb, but it's the best thing I can think of. I need to keep her talking, to convince her to keep helping me. Better if you don't, she says, without looking back. Well, I'm Ewanala, I say, running after her. It was my mother's name. How did you find me? She leaps an impossible gap and turns. You mean a girl running through the streets with a mob of bloodborne after her? Wasn't hard. I leap after and almost don't make it. Were you looking for me? A darkness enters her eye. I'm always looking for Therakent runaways. But look, I have to go. Stick to the rooftops for a while and the bloodborne should go away. No witch can hold that many for long. I take a deep breath. Saying this is not easy for me. I could use your help. I already helped you. I know, and thank you, but I need some place to go. This stops her for a second. She looks at me again, more carefully, glancing at my violet eyes, the scars on my hands. Are you from the temple? Yes, and they're looking for me. She dusts off her vest. Your dad, you mean? The Chosen? My father's dead, I say, unable to keep the emotion from my voice. The knowledge he was murdered is still too raw. But yes, he was the Chosen. And you decided to run away for the day? Cute. She starts walking. I ran because they were going to kill me. She slows. Sounds bad, but I got enough on my plate. Please. I'm hungry. She scrambles up to the peak of a sloped roof. Buy some food. I follow, grateful for my training and balance. I don't have any money. Then steal it. I grimace, trotting after her. That's what I tried to do. That's why those possessed people, the Bloodborne, were following me. I think. I leave out that the witch seemed to know who I was. She turns, rubbing at her missing eye. You couldn't even steal some food? It's frustrating how amused she looks. No, I couldn't. I've never stolen anything before, okay? You really are from the temple, aren't you? I said I was, and I need your help. Please? Ooh, Jay, but I hate asking for help. It's almost as bad as letting someone beat me. But I know if I don't do it, I will get beaten. So I swallow my pride and stand there, fists clutching the edge of my shirt. She chews on it for a moment, then gives me a measuring gaze. Fine, I'll get you some food. If you can keep up. Okay. It can't be harder than Urte's training. I revise that thought about 30 seconds in. The girl leaps from roof to roof, climbs up aqueducts, and balances across laundry lines at breakneck speeds. It's everything I can do to keep up without breaking limbs, but she just flows naturally from one challenge to the next, something like a master seer at his forms. This must just be how she moves, like she's constantly hiding from something. I pay attention. We finally stop on a gently sloping rooftop, two towers rising from its far end. They're bell towers, I think, part of a Dara religious cult my father shut down years ago. The girl eyes me, panting with my hands on my knees, then pulls a hand from her sleeve. She shakes a spiny bracelet at me. See this? she asks. This is poison. Every one of the spines on here is poison. So if you try any water reading stuff on me, she slashes the bracelet. Got it? Right, I say. No water reading on this end. Though by this time, I've gotten over myself enough to wonder who she is and why she travels by rooftop. She eyes me and seems satisfied. Good. Wait here. She uncoils the black rope from her waist in a smooth motion, whips it up at the arch windows of a tower, and pulls herself up. I catch my breath and take a minute to calm myself, icing fear and confusion. I need a clear head if I'm going to earn this girl's trust. She obviously doesn't give it easily. Kind of like me. She slides down the rope, 
sack in hand, then shoves it at me. Here! I open it to find a ripe pear, two smoked sausages, and a crusty loaf of olive bread. I devour them. Thank you. That was delicious. Her eyebrows climb. Things pretty rough since your dad died then? If you call a whole temple wanting you dead, then yeah. She frowns, squatting on her heels. And the witches want you dead too? I hesitate. The first principle of Watersight is not to let anyone in, only the people you trust, but... I think of Deshaun and of Erte. Maybe I wouldn't be here if I'd let them in. And maybe the only way to earn trust is to give it first. I don't know, I say honestly. There was a witch at the market where I tried to steal something, then an overseer came. She made her bloodborne knock the overseer out, but when I ran, they all started chasing me. She whistles. So why was the temple chasing you? Because I know too much. Because they set my father up somehow, and they don't want it getting out. Her face darkens. Sounds typical. They tried to kill me last night, after I refused to publicly deny what I know. I escaped and came here to figure out what they did and expose them. Good. You should. That type of slop happens every day in the Witches' Guild, and no one does a damn thing. Everyone knows they only treat people to get their blood, so that the whole city's under their thumb and they can control you whenever they feel like it. She sounds truly angry. So they really can control people that way? You saw it yourself. All those people chasing you with their eyes wide open? That was the witches. Worst part is it doesn't affect your mind. You're just trapped inside there while they do whatever they want with the rest of you. She shivers. I frown. Did they do that to you? She looks up suddenly, eye going hard. No, they didn't do slop. Look, you should go, okay? I got you some food so you're good now, and I don't need to get involved in your drama. I start back, feeling the connection we had slip away. Something happened to this girl. Something bad. I ice my panic and search for something to say. What I can do to get her help. The runaways, I blurt. Therakint girls. You're rescuing them? I can help with that. They're not the right words. They're too blunt. But she slows in the act of getting up. What could you do to help? I'm a fighter, I say, searching my mind. The best in my class. And they don't know me. I could go places you can't. She narrows her eye, staring at me. And you kept up with me just now. Yes, I can keep up. It seems like a stupid detail, but I'll take anything I can right now. The girl sits back down. I do need help, but not with the runaways. With money. I hold back a groan. I don't have any. No, I don't want your money. I want you to help me get it. I frown. How? Thieving, she says, like it's the most obvious thing in the world. Jobs I can't do alone. Maybe some fighting. You'd probably be good at it with all that monk stuff. Help me with some jobs, and I'll teach you how to live out of sight. My stomach sinks. It had to be thieving. One of Ujaism's core moral principles. I already feel bad just having stolen a shirt and a piece of food. Is that what you do up here? You're a thief? It's how I eat and help with the runaways, yeah? You got a problem with that? I take a deep breath. Water. I need to be water. I'm already in too deep to swim back, and leaving Narimes to corrupt the temple is a lot worse than a couple of vendors losing their wares. No, I say, squaring my shoulders. It's fine. I'm Alethea, by the way, not Iwanala. Gaxna, she says. Now come on, let's teach you to steal. Seven. Half an hour later, we are crouched on a rooftop, watching a market similar to the one from this morning, though we're in a richer district of the city. First rule of thievery, Gaxna says, holding up a finger. You don't steal, you don't eat. I watch the marketplace, three rows of vendors' carts around an aqueduct-fed fountain, this one low and wide with a few kids playing in it. What does that mean? It means you owe me for lunch. I look at her, a cord of fear striking at the memory of getting caught earlier today. I was lucky to get away. She smiles. But maybe not today. Today, let's focus on dinner. I'm thinking sea bass, a little lemon, garlic, some curry paste. My stomach rumbles at the thought of it. Lunch was good, but I'm still hungry. That sounds amazing. Great. So there are three things to think about when you go into a daylight theft like this. 
The first one is pockets. What are you going to do with your fish once you've grabbed it? Doesn't matter how sly you grab it, if you don't have some place to put it, you'll get caught in a hurry. Okay. The trousers I'm wearing have decent pockets. Gaxnas are huge. Next one is people. You want to pick the right crowd for the job you're doing, which means you have to think about time of day, class of people, and then gauge the shopkeeper. Basically, you want them all to either be so rich they don't care, or so bored they don't notice. Markets like you were at in the Blackwater are good, because there aren't many overseers around, but shopkeepers like that? They watch you like a hawk. And nobody down there likes a thief. Up here? She shrugs. The vendors are making too much to care, but if someone does notice, an overseer is going to come quick. At least, they would have before. Now it depends on who's bribing the temple. Bribing the temple? She nods, still watching the market. Policing's been up for grabs the last few months. If you aren't giving the temple something extra, they might ignore your market or your guild house. But if you are, like the salt merchants? She shakes her head. Good luck getting in there with less than an army. I grit my teeth. My father would have never allowed this. And the third thing? She smiles. Good. The third thing is escape routes. Think about which way people are moving, which streets you can lose them in, where you can climb to the rooftops. Not a bad idea to leave a rope hanging so you can get up somewhere where they won't be able to follow. I'll leave one here, but you never forget your rope, got it? A rope is a thief's best friend. I nod. For being so close-mouthed before, Gaxon is sure chatty about thieving. I get the feeling she doesn't have many people to talk to. Still, it's all helpful, and something about it is so different, so wrong from the temple's perspective, that I can't help grinning. If Deshaun could see me now. Alethea the true heretic, learning to steal from the faithful. Or maybe that makes me a true believer nowadays. We drop down to the street, leaving Gaxna's black rope hanging in a shady alley, and walk towards the market. Just watch this first time, she whispers, and then we're in the crowd. Gaxna does a good job of browsing, fingering a bulb of onion here, squeezing an eggplant there. I hardly notice it the first time a head of garlic sticks in her hand, then disappears into her pants pocket. I don't notice it when she palms two barley rolls, only see the bulges along her leg. And then she stops in front of the fishmonger, the only one in this market, arguing with him about fish varieties while the flies buzz and my hands get sweaty, just waiting for him to figure it out, for the moment we have to fight our way out of here. It doesn't happen. Instead, he turns his eye for a second, and Gaxna drops an entire striped bass down her culottes, then buys a small knot of mussels from him and walks off. You bought something? I ask once we're out. Isn't the whole point not to? She shrugs. Helps take the edge off. I thought he might have seen me, but nobody suspects a paying customer of stealing things. When in doubt, throw him a little money. We head back the way we came, and Gaxna steals food like the market's her personal kitchen, nabbing carrots and onions and lamb fat and curry leaves as we pass. Ooh, Jay's eyes, I breathe when we get back to the alley. You got enough to feed an army. Yeah, she grins. Too bad none of it's for you. The first rule of thieving. Right. I take a deep breath, carefully turning my anxiety to ice. It doesn't matter that overseers are close, that there's a witch at the fountain in the center of this square. I can do this. I have to. Okay. I take a different entrance into the market, wandering through the cobbler's section, palms sweaty but keeping my mind cool, water blind up though there's no one to read it. We get to the first of the produce stands and I steal a pear. Just like that. I just grab it while we're walking, hardly looking at the stand, and drop it into my pocket. I keep going, waiting for a cry, waiting for a hand on my shoulder. It doesn't come. And when I realize it's not going to, a giant grin splits my face. I just stole something, and I got away with it. I mutter an apology to a Jay, but honestly, it feels good. Like landing a punch on a trainer. Like breaking the basic laws of the universe. And like I'm one step closer to my goals. It's just a damn pair, after all. The temple taxes the guilds who tax individual peddlers like this, and that's how I've eaten my whole life. So in the end, it balances out, right? Probably not, but here I am. So I nab a carrot, too, and a twist of salt. The salt vendor looks at me funny, but I make a point of walking slow and carefree, of stopping at the very next stand to discuss the fig harvest, to show that I've done nothing wrong. 
I'd buy a fig from the woman if I could, but I still don't have any money. And then it's time for the fish stand. Gaxna hangs back on this one, but I choke a little on my grab-and-walk routine, stopping long enough that the vendor looks at me. I smile and sort of drift over to the next stand, a salt-cure jerky stand, then reach back and snag a tile fish. A hand closes on my wrist before it's even off the table. I knew it, the merchant snarls. I knew there was something wrong about you. I water-read him through our skin and see that his next move is to drag me to the fountain and call an overseer. No, I cry without thinking, and use a reverse currents kiss, rolling him onto the table and spilling fish everywhere. The vendor cries out in pain. I've forgotten how people who aren't trained in fighting would react to a bind like this. And suddenly everyone around me is shouting. I release the vendor's arm, blocking a club that swings at me painfully, and drop into sleeting rain stance. This at least I know. I might not be able to steal a fish, but I can fight my way out of this market, dry ground or not. Thea, Gaxna hisses from behind me, but I'm blocking a wild punch, cracking a skull, slipping sideways between carts to put a heavy woman between me and a young man with a pair of knives. An old man whacks me with his cane. It's hard to stay aware of everyone without water sight, and I spin and weave, trying not to hurt anyone as I work closer to the street. Thea, Gaxna calls again, but I don't know where she is. I can't stop to think about it. The crowd is thickening around me. None of them are good fighters, but their sheer numbers are a problem. I can't read them, can't predict their moves, and without that the men's strength starts to make a difference. I don't want to hurt anyone permanently, but an overseer could be here any second. Thea, Gaxna barks, and I see a black rope drop right in front of me. I counter a grab, surf breaking someone over my shoulder, and decide the rope's probably the best option. I clamber up, awkwardly scraping across some awnings and kicking off a guy who tries to follow me, to the rooftop, and roll up panting. Come on, Gaxna snarls, and I run after her, sprinting from gabled eave to garden wall to a glazed tile peak so slippery I almost think she wants me to fall. She stops when we're four or five streets away, in the shadow of a stone and ivory guild hall. What the floods was that? She snaps. I know, I say, still catching my breath. I shouldn't have tried for the fish. It was too obvious. Not the fish, stupid. The fighting. I look up. He grabbed my arm. What was I supposed to do? You were supposed to run. First rule of thievery, remember? Know your exits. I'm pretty sure that wasn't the first rule, but I let it go. There were no exits. I was surrounded. You made yourself surrounded. You know what? Maybe this was a bad idea. Maybe I can't use you. She stands and I shoot up. Gaxna, wait. No, I'm sorry. I just... In the temple, you never run. That's how they trained us. It's going to take me some time to learn. You're not in the temple anymore, Alethea. You don't have time. Her face is red, and I realize she's actually mad. There's a witch down there, and when an overseer comes, they're going to read everyone's memories and know you were here. No, I was with you. None of which would have happened if you just run when you were supposed to. Floods. I hadn't thought of any of that. I just... When someone grabs you, you fight. That's been my whole life. If you don't fight, you'll be beaten. Water, I can hear Ute saying. You have to be water. Right. I should have run. I'll run next time. Her eye narrows. You swear it? I swear it. She glares a minute longer, then nods. And now you probably want some of my bass, too. I've got some carrots to trade? Eight. We make dinner in the upper room of the bell tower, Gaxna lighting coals in a little ceramic stove while I clean and gut the fish. My chore time skills come in handy here, and I summon the deep breathing I've always done alongside, appreciating the red-gold light coming through the hideout's arched windows as I methodically peel and chop and slice. The ocean breeze is cool after the day's heat and I have a mixed feeling of hunger and tiredness and safety that makes me not want to be anywhere but right here. The fish is fresh, and I can still read the barest twitches of life in its flesh as I gut it. The need for water, the confusion of air, the sense of being out of place. I can relate. As peaceful as this all is, it still feels wrong somehow. Like I should be in the temple, should be fighting the traditionalists, should be doing more than wandering the city's rooftops and learning to steal. 
I'm Jay's eyes, Gaxna says behind me, and I start. I'm still not used to not hearing people through the water. You got all that done already? The fish, garlic, carrots, eggplant, onions, curry leaves, and lamb fat are all prepped in front of me, barley rolls neatly cut in half. Uh, yeah. I hardly noticed doing it. Well, coals will still take a while. She settles on an upturned crate, pulling out a twist of clove leaf. Want a smoke? Uh, she smirks. Never smoked before? Cloves are about as strong as a glass of tea. You drink tea, right? I feel like a prude, but I don't want to look like one. I need to be water, right? Sure. She leans down and lights it on the coals, then hands it to me. I try a pull. It's sweet and dark and intense. I cough, and she laughs. Takes a minute to get used to. I grit my teeth and drink from the water gourd. It's nice the second time, though I immediately notice the drowsy effect it's supposed to have, my whole body kind of melting back into the wall. Wow, it's nice, though. I buy the best Saray has, she smirks. Bet you don't get these at the temple. Not the students, anyway. I try another pull. Some of the full seers smoke them. I see them in the gardens at night. Gaxna nods and blows a cloud of fragrant smoke that catches the evening light. So why don't you just kill them? The new Chosen, I mean, or whoever killed your dad. I saw what you did today. You probably could have taken down half that market. She's calm, but I see her watching me carefully fingering her spiked bracelet. Gaxon is someone who's had to watch out for herself her whole life. Like me. I can't. I mean, yes, I'm trained to fight, and if I got lucky, I might take down Narimes or some of his party. But I'm not even sure it was them. What do you mean? I thought you said they set your dad up. I sigh. That's mostly my gut right now. I know they covered up his death, and they were going to kill me because I'm a threat to their power, but I don't actually know that they killed him, or had him killed. That's what I'm hoping to prove out here. She pulls at her clove leaf. And when you prove it, that's when you kill him? I take a pull myself, looking out at the city climbing the bay. We study history as part of our training, and it's full of people who kill each other for vengeance or justice or whatever. And whenever it's political, it usually ends up failing, or starting a cycle where they get killed a few years later and on and on. Gaxna pulls at her clove leaf. That's why you have to kill all of them. I mean, they're evil, right? They killed your dad. I laugh, but there's no humor in it. They're definitely evil. I hate what they've done to the temple. But if I killed that many people, they'd think I'm evil too. And that's not even the main thing. The main thing is that if I don't prove to everyone that they were part of my dad's death, then people won't see the justice in it. I don't even want Narimes to die. Harder for a man like that to live, seeing his own ruin. A drink from a ceramic water pot she set out. Though how I'm going to pull that off, I don't know. Gaxna leans down to fan the coals, then puts a pan on top. You said the witches were part of it? Yeah, Nerimes, the new chosen, said my dad was losing control, that the Therakins were going to make a play to take over the city, and he wasn't doing anything about it. It was one of the reasons the traditionalists used to oust my dad. Hmm, that's exactly what they told the witches last year. I lean forward. What? Yeah, the witches kept getting messages that the temple was going to try to shut them down, kill them all, or drive them up the peninsula or something. That's why the guild started posting witches at every fountain and doing other stuff. They thought you were going to make a play, or your dad, I guess. My gut says it's wrong, that my father wouldn't have done that. But this is the story Narimes told too, and part of training is recognizing when strong emotion is clouding our judgment. What if it's true? Still, I'm not going to accept it without asking more questions. I just have to be careful, because Gaxna's history with the Therakins is obviously sensitive territory. I bite my lip. How are they getting these messages? She shrugs, stirring the fat where it's starting to sizzle and put off oil. Witches have eyes and ears everywhere, maybe in the temple itself. I wouldn't be surprised if they got the blood of some monk in there and they're forcing him to give them information. A traditionalist, I say, seeking connections. It could have been one of Narimes' men feeding them false information. I need to talk to the witches, find out what they know. No, she barks, eye locking on mine. Don't talk to them. Don't get anywhere near them. They'll find a way to take your blood. I hold my hands up. Okay, I won't. Though, I'm going to have to find out somehow. Gaxna leans back, rubbing at her missing eye. 
Sorry, I really don't like the witches, I noticed. I wait for her to say more, but after a minute she just leans in and stirs the fat cubes, which are crackling good, covering the iron pot in oil. I think we can put the onions in. I do. So have you saved many runaways? Not enough, she says, stirring the sizzling onions. Forty or fifty now. That seems like a lot. What do you do with them? She sprinkles on a pinch of salt. There's a place, a peninsula, a seamstress. Takes anybody on if you can pay their upkeep for the first year. I can't help goggling. And you've paid all that? She shrugs, still stirring the onions. My targets are usually a little bigger than food stalls. Hand me those carrots. We eat by candlelight, the sun well down by the time the fish is done and everything stewed in curry. It's delicious, saltier and spicier than what we get in the temple. Exhaustion hits me like a wave when we're done. I haven't slept in, what, two days? We crawl down the ladder to a lower room, Gaxna holding the candle, and I realize there's only one bed. She starts pulling off clothes and I blush furiously, turning the other way. Oh, hey, the thief says, probably noticing how stiff my back gets. We never get naked in the temple, and that goes double for me as the only girl. Slops, you don't have to sleep in my bed. Uh, I turn, and she's blushing just as furiously, pushing crates and boxes out of the way. She pulls a few blankets from somewhere, and soon I've got my own pallet, squeezed between piles of dusty bins. Thank you, I say, hating myself for getting embarrassed, cheeks still burning. This is probably totally normal in the city. For everything, today. Gaxna nods, tongue-tied for once. You're welcome. You, well, good night. And she gets into bed so fast you'd think I bit her, blowing out the light. I pull off my clothes, grateful for the darkness. The pallet's not as comfortable as my bed in the temple, but I'm not sure I even finish the thought before I'm out cold. Nine. Lower, Gaxna whispers, walking slightly behind me in the road. I'm dressed in a dirty blouse and a frayed wrap, greasy black wig on my head marking me as one of the poorest in the city. But apparently, my posture isn't up to it. I try again to drop my shoulders. First rule of thievery, she hisses. Don't stick your nose in the sky. I know that wasn't the first rule, but I do it anyway. Posture isn't something they taught us in the temple exactly, but the training just brings it out in you. Strength, confidence, nobility. All the things a Blackwater girl shouldn't have. Gaxna sighs behind me, so apparently I'm still not doing it well enough. I managed to steal my lunch today, and we're headed to a fountain to practice wearing disguises in public. Gaxna's a master at this, and we have an escape route planned, but still I'm nervous. We're not far from where I hold up that first morning, in a row of smithies, and Saray churns around us. Hammers ring, cellars haggle, mongrels bark and forges roar with a heat that sticks the wig to my head with sweat. The place stinks of coal smoke and sewer slop, the waterways dark with the city's waste. There, maybe, Gaxna slurs, and I see the fountain she points to. Its waters are clear, if tepid, aqueducts feeding it from the river above. If I stuck my hand in, I could hear the thoughts of the city, the overseers chatting to each other and the cries of those needing help, maybe some hints of the temple itself. But something holds me back, some fear that even with my blind it would alert them to where I am. Besides, it's not something a Blackwater girl would do, and I need to learn disguises if I'm ever going to survive out here. We sit and unwrap what we got from the market. Mine looks a little sad next to Gaxna's, and she adds some of hers to my wrap without saying anything. She's got the low-town posture down perfect. Slouched, eyes quick but not totally open, one leg bouncing like she never learned to sit. I try to imitate it as best I can. What do we do now, then, I ask. Do? Her voice has changed, too, gruffer, and with a slurriness to it. Don't do nothing. Just eat your food, huh? Feel the breeze. I eat, but I can't help scanning the crowds. I feel exposed. Overseers aren't as common down here, and I'm guessing witches aren't either, but still. My mind can't help cataloging what I could use if I needed to fight. The long handle of a broom across the square, some iron rods a blacksmith is cooling, the loose ends of a stick-built lean-to slumped against a fastener's shop. 
A crier is working the far side of the fountain, calling out news and rumors to get a crowd together, then taking coins to share the details. Man eaten by giant squid, he calls. Salt makers guild to hire Theokins. Chosen engaged to foreign woman. Philosophers predicting drought. No one pays him much mind. Giant squid, he tries again, then with a sour expression walks to the fountain for a drink. I straighten up. I'm supposed to be learning disguises, but I knew there might be criers down here, and I'm burning to find out more about my father's death. Tough day, crier? Piss, flood, and poor ass days what it is, miss, he says in a distinctly less educated voice than the one he was using to cry. Sorry to hear it. Gaxna shoots me a look, but I ignore her. Times is hard all around these days. Aye, he slurps from his hand, dips back for more. Same as ever. I dip my hand in the water, but his is out before I can water read more than vague impressions. I'll have to talk it out of him then. Take a clove leaf to ease the time. The cigarillos are part of my disguise, Gaxna insisting no low-towner would be caught dead without them. She also said no crier would talk without at least some kind of bribe. He narrows his eyes, though. What's in it for you? Piss on that one, eh? Gaxna cuts in. Flood and clothes ain't cheap. Bit of fresh conversation would do me good, I say, ignoring both of them and trying to sound less monastic. The crier grunts and sits. I pull a clove leaf for him, and Gaxna surprises me by striking a match. He draws deep and sighs smoke appreciatively out his nose. Now there's a smoke. What'd you want to know, then? I suppress a smile. A little bribery works wonders, apparently. Nothing major. Just a story a ways back. Something about the other chosen. The, the older one. I pause as though I'm looking for words. As though I don't know my own father's name. Sturg John, the crier says. Yeah? I shrug. Had thoughts of being a crier myself. Heard there was good money in crying before he passed. Oh, aye, the crier says, taking another pull. Bloody fortune, that one. Not like this new chump. No one's spending to bend his news. Bend the news. I ice the excitement that bubbles up in my chest, the possibility that Narimes paid criers to bend news about my dad. What were they bending, then? The bit about the Therakins Guild? Ah, no, that was all right as rain. Witches were rising up, sure as not. Hoping this new one finally takes care of them. I nod, trying to conceal my disappointment, trying to ignore Gaxna's urgent hints that I should stop drawing attention to myself, especially from a crier. The heresies, then? Aye, all that bit. Flooding hard to cry it was, having to make up the details all the while. Never did find out what it was all about. He pulls on the clove leaf and blows out. All the same, though, right? Sturg, John, or Narimes, or whoever the next pit stain is, they'll keep us down and we do what we can to stick it out. The heresies weren't real. They paid the criers to fake the stories of the heresies, then probably used that to convince the temple. It's proof the traditionalists set my dad up. Or someone did. I try to ice the excitement inside, but some still comes out. Who paid you to do it, then? The crier takes a long pull and eyes the clove leaf. That's real information you're asking for there. Take more than a stick of clove to relax me that much, if you catch my meaning. More money. Floods. I still don't have any. I glance at Gaxna. She scowls back. You have to forgive the lass, Gaxna says to him. Gets ideas in her head some days. Slop in dumb ones. I can't let this slip away, but there's no way I'm getting his hand back in the fountain. So I slap the back of his neck hard. Piss was that for, he yelps, his own hand flying to where I hit him. It's just an instant of contact, but I'm an old hand at water sight. I follow his thoughts from my question back to a vague figure of a man with a hood over his head. A monk? But in the strange picture-thought reality that is mind sight, I know in the same moment this was a merchant, not a monk. What would a merchant care about playing up heresies? I realize the crier is still staring at me, angry. Stingfly, I say, shrugging. Nasty little buggers. The crier walks off, shooting me a nasty look, but the waters run too fast in my mind to care. Merchants, why would they pay to set up my dad? Unless they had a stake in Narimes coming to power somehow. What did Gaxna say? That oversight was spotty in the last few months? Something about the salt merchants having an army of overseers watching their guild house, and others nothing at all. So maybe the salt merchants did it, in exchange for business opportunities once Narimes was in power? Are the traditionalists actually just puppets to business interests? Did a merchant kill my father? Gaxna stirs beside me. 
Should we go, then? She's eaten most of her lunch, and even in character I can see she's glancing around too much. She's worried I'm attracting attention. Aye, I say. Useful information or not, I feel exposed down here, too. Like my hands in the water with no blind up, thoughts bare for everyone to read. I start to stand, and she slaps her hand down on my leg. Easy, she says, and it's Gaxon's voice, her real voice, not the black market porter boy she's playing today. I glance the direction she's looking and freeze. Not one, not two, but six overseers come striding into the square. People shrink back from them, but not enough to avoid their outstretched hands as they touch wrists, arms, any skin they can use to read thoughts. To find me. That has to be what they're after. Overseers work alone, never in more than pairs, and then only to discuss something. Why would six of them be together now, unless it was because of me? And here I sit, out in the open, not even a staff at my side, nothing between me and them but a dirty shirt and a ratty wig. Keep your head down, Gaxna says, and I realize she could give me away too. As long as they don't see my eyes, my water blind will keep them from reading my thoughts. But Gaxna knows all about me. All they have to do is touch her. Sweat beads on my scalp as they enter the fountain square, moving without talking, water reading each other's thoughts, heading straight for us. I keep my head down, my feet still, but it's everything I can do not to run for the iron rods in front of the blacksmith shop, to not go down at least defending myself, keeping the monks off. But the only chance I have is escaping notice. I know this. They chase anyone who runs, and I can't outrun them, probably not even on the rooftops. They come closer, spreading through the market. The crier could give me away too, having seen my violet eyes, having talked to me about my dad. Flooding damn hells! But the only thing I can do is sit here and hold my disguise. I ice everything inside, pick at my last rice wrap like I don't want it, and wait for the iron hand to clamp down on my shoulder. An overseer passes in front. Two. A soft hand brushes my wrist ever so lightly, robes close enough to rub against my leg. I hold my breath. If even a thread of my thoughts got through the blind, if they happen to read Gaxna, it's over, and the proof I just found won't be enough to convince the temple. The moment stretches like tar under a boot heel. The overseer moves on. I exhale, but we're not out of the shallows yet. They could still come back, so I keep my head down, keep fiddling with my wrap. Gaxna wears the same bored, blackwater expression, but her shoulders are tense. Behind her, another pair of monks come, passing on the far side of the fountain, and then they're gone, striding into the next street with hands outstretched. The whole square seems to breathe a sigh of relief, but no one so loud as me. Come on, I elbow Gaxna, wrapping up my food. Let's get out of here. We run the rooftops up and east, angling toward her tower, but Gaxna stops me on the shaded balcony of a Nujay convocation hall. That, what you did back there, that was magic? I wipe sweat from my brow. I'm keeping up better with the thief all the time, but she sets a mean pace. Not magic, concentration. You get all your thoughts behind a blind, so they can't read any of your true mind. Kind of like hiding behind a curtain, only if your concentration's strong enough, the curtain is a mile wide and ten feet thick. That's why we follow our breathing, to build concentration. Gaxna bites her lip. If one of the overseers had touched me, we'd both be locked up. I could teach you, you know. Anyone can learn the breathing. Might be useful in your line of work. She shifts on the balcony, breeze catching her blonde wig. Maybe that'd be good. Just don't do it on me, okay? I won't. But if you're up for it, we should start now. On the rest of the trip back, picture your breath like waves in the ocean, constantly coming in and going out. Gaxna looks doubtful. That's going to keep the overseers out of my head? Waves? The concentration is. It's like a muscle, only you can exercise it constantly. Just let there be one little part of your mind that's always watching the waves, no matter what else is going on. That's the same part that's going to keep them out when you need it and ice emotions when you don't have time to deal with them. Gaxna is slower after that, walking rooftops and balancing across eaves, and I can see that she's concentrating. I test it when we get back, in or out. 
Huh? Your breath. Is it coming in or going out? Oh, uh, you should know without thinking. What distracted that part of your mind? Try again. We spend the next hour or so like that, Gaxna focusing on her breath and me testing her, while the heat of the day burns off and I de-ice everything I froze from when the overseers came. The traditionalists must think I'm a real threat to be sending overseers after me in packs. And I am a threat with this new information. My father's heresies were played up and the city's merchants were behind it. Now I need to find out which merchants, and if they were the ones responsible for my father's murder, or Narimes used them as part of his master plan. Either way, the evidence will be damning. My opinions or my sex can be seen as a heresy, but selling out the temple's holiest position to the highest bidder? That's outright treason. Breath? I ask, only half paying attention. Out, Gaxna says, eyes closed, wig off to catch the breeze. Slow. Good. Again. It still seems a little crazy, what I'm trying to do. Turn the whole temple against its ruler? And me not even a seer, or a man for that matter? Still, I have to try. My dad is worth that. The temple is worth it. At least, the temple as it could be. And much as I'm learning to survive out here, the temple will always be home. I want it back. Now. In. Lies. I was watching your breath. Slops, Gaxna curses, opening her eyes. I got distracted. I just... It's hard. I remember my first days in the temple, the endless hours kneeling in the water while Erte or one of the other trainers read our thoughts, urged us towards concentration. I was good at it even then, but their training made me the best. It takes time, I say. You'll get it. Flooding right I will. To keep the overseers out of my head, I'd do a lot worse than this. Speaking of which, I thought of something you could do to keep the overseers from finding you. What? My blind already protected me when they literally touched my skin today. There's a woman in the heights. Used to be a therakint. She stains eyes now. She stains them? How? I don't know. All I know is it's expensive and it works. Had a friend who needed to disappear for a while after a job went bad. Turned his blue eyes jet black. It takes a moment for that to sink in. If I stopped having violet eyes... There's no way they'd find you, not with the way you protect your thoughts. Hope surges like an unchained beast in my chest. I'm so tired of being targeted, of being afraid. Without my eyes, I could be anyone. But then the temple wouldn't know who I was, I say, that same hope faltering. Even if I showed them everything, they could just deny I'm Sturg John's daughter. Gaxna's gaze on me is steady. Would that be so bad? I... I don't know. We'll think about it. In the meantime, I'm going to need my clothes back. What? My clothes, the thief repeats, a gleam in her eye. You didn't steal them. They're not yours. I don't point out how backwards that logic is. Right. Okay. I'll get my other pair. The ones you wore when the witches, overseers, and an entire market saw you? I'd say those are done. You're saying I need to steal new clothes. I swallow a lump. I need to get used to this. Yep. But I'll give you a hint. The market's not the best place to do it. Where is, then? Gaxna grins. The baths. Ten. Around sunset, Saray transforms. The docks close up, market peddlers and merchants melt into the terrace streets, and everyone comes out to enjoy the cooling air. A big part of that are the fountains, which during the day serve as water supply, but at night become public baths, with anyone who wants to cool off or take a soak welcome to do so. In Polities we learned this is one of the things Saray is famous for, not just its complicated aqueducts and beautiful fountains, but the general absence of shame about our bodies that foreigners find so strange. Men and women and children and elderly all share the same fountain, usually the one closest to home, and will often lounge outside the water naked, drying off, buying a bag of milk dumplings or plum fritters from the night vendors, their hanging lamps the only illumination as the sky darkens. Ironically, it's the thing that feels hardest to me. I didn't grow up in this city. I grew up in the temple, constantly needing to hide the fact that I'm a girl, especially after my body started to look different. 
I should be worried about stealing someone else's clothes in plain sight, but what I'm icing is the anxiety of taking my own off. I do it quick and get into the water quicker, sinking in up to my shoulders. It's delicious, flowing and cool after the heat of the day. I haven't bathed in two days or more, and though it's weird to do it with twenty or so other people around me, I spend the first while just getting clean. I used to watch these baths from the temple roof, wondering what it was like to be free, to be normal, to just relax at the end of the day with no worry about trainers reading your blind, theocrats plotting against your father, or students gunning for you just because you were a girl. Now that I'm here, I don't feel free at all. Rather, one eye watches for overseers while I listen to the fountain in Watersight. It's not lost on me that this is a great time to gather information. I know overseers listen every night, but with so many people in the water and my blind still thick as ever, it's unlikely they'll be able to make anything out. But with the twenty-ish people around me so close, I can hear their thoughts clear as a bell. Like the woman next to me, a cloth merchant and mother of five, nursing an aching hip in the water and dreaming about the clove leaf she's going to smoke when she gets out. From what I can gather, she's been pretty successful. Maybe she knows something about the strange trade depression the city entered into at the end of my father's reign. Nothing like a bath after a long day, I say, wishing I wasn't such slop at words. She grunts. Wait till you have kids. You don't know what a long day is. I can't really afford to have any right now, I say, trying to steer the conversation. I wish Deshaun was here. He'd know what to say. Another grunt. None of us can with these new taxes. Okay, that's better. Maybe I can do this. Is the temple adding new taxes, then? You could call them that. She sighs and sinks lower in the water. More like bribes. If you want your storehouse safe, they say, you'll want to add a few marks extra. Or, we're stretched thin right now. If you can spare some extra for the overseers, we could keep them closer. I read a lot more in the water. Theocrats increasing taxes, other merchants complaining of sloppy policing by the overseers, talk of the temple being more interested in money than in its religious duties to the city. This is new? Since Sturg John, yes, he never would have allowed this. Pride swells in my heart so much I have to ice it. Stay focused. This could be proof some merchants are getting special treatment under the traditionalists and Remace listed collapsing trade as one of the things they blamed my father for. This woman might know different. What of the poor trade at the end of Sturg John's rule? Didn't he kind of let things fall apart? The merchant shakes her head. Not that I could see, though they did get better quickly after he left. I scan her thoughts for any knowledge of the temple interfering in trade, any trace of the traditionalists, but there's nothing. Do you think the overseers might be busy guarding whoever helped Narimes into power? The woman sucks in a breath, glancing around. Watch your mouth, girl. That's not talk for a public bath. Floods. I turn the conversation to lighter topics, still reading her thoughts, but there's nothing else useful. Still, she didn't deny some merchants getting special treatment, and the way she reacted says there's probably something to it. I grimace. Not that it will work as proof. I need to find someone who is involved in helping Narimes, who funded the criers. That would be proof. She wishes me good night after a few minutes, and I remember I'm here to do more than sleuth. I'm here to get my first real clothes. So I get out, stark naked, blushing despite the low light. People chat on the edge of the fountain, drying in the warm air, kids screaming and playing in the water. I manage to ice my embarrassment but I don't think I can stand here naked for long. So I walk to the benches and take the wrong stack of clothes. It's a woman's blouse and leggings. I walk toward the vendor stands, trying to look casual while I hold them against my chest and pray someone doesn't come screaming after me. Not that any of them could pose a threat to me unless they called the overseers, but I'm learning it's better not to make a scene. To be water, Erte would say. Maybe that's what I'm doing out here. Maybe that's the lesson I need to find my father's killer and what's allowed me to gather as much information as I have in the last few days. I don't know, but as I climb a nearby tailor shop and run the roofs back to Gaxna's, I feel a strange contentment, as if, for the first time in a long time, everything might be okay.
11. This theft was going so well. Gaxna got us over the wall with an insane throw of her thief's rope. I used water sight on a guard to find the statue, despite them moving it every day. And we found a ton of other loot with it. We're crouched now in a long hallway of Bamani smokewood statues, debating the best way to get out. Actually, I agree with Gaxna about dropping her rope out the window and risking courtyard guards rather than trying to slip through the house. It has the best chance of us getting away unseen and of not breaking the statue that's worth so much money. But that's just it. I'm not here for the money. Or not only the money. Yes, I could use it to bribe criers for more information or put it towards what the ex therikant wants to stain my eyes. But this is the mansion of the head of the salt merchants, and I read more than the location of the statue in the guard's thoughts. The merchant is here, and practically alone. A man like him will know what the merchants in the bath didn't. If any head of guild was involved in bribing the criers or supporting Narimes' rise to power, he'll know it. And that kind of proof, direct sight into his thoughts, is what I need to expose Narimes. So I'm crouched here, arguing back about how I can use the water to tell exactly where people are in the house, how much less chance we'll have of being spotted if we just switch our disguises and walk out the side door like two maids done with work for the day. That's slop, Gaxna whispers, back against the teakwood walls, and you know it. We get caught and we'll be lucky to get out of here at all. The rope's the best way. Fine, I say. You're right. But I've got something I need to do downstairs. I've done my part in this one, right? She hesitates, then grimaces. Flooding idiot. Go then. I'll wait for you up here, and we'll take the rope when you're done. I feel a sudden wash of gratitude, even as my stomach knots over what I'm about to do. I wouldn't call Gaxna a friend yet, but after I got past her mistrust, things have been getting better between us. And come to think of it, I'm not sure I've ever called anyone a friend, other than maybe Deshaun. Thank you, I whisper, and hug her on impulse. She stiffens in my arms. Five minutes, okay? After that, you're on your own. I nod and slip back up the corridor, turning toward the baths. Direction is a strange thing in water sight, sort of like pointing to a sound with your eyes closed, only underwater. Still, I'm pretty sure I read the merchant's thoughts coming from this direction. Two male voices drift through a wide doorway ahead, matching the thoughts I heard good. I pull my mask up higher, leaving just a slit for my eyes, then call, Master, come quick! Ujay's eyes, I hear one of them curse, the other one chuckling, then louder, what is it? Think fast. The statue! The statue is gone! The merchant curses for real then, and wet feet slap the stones. I tense, and the moment he's out of the doorway, I wrap him in coral bind, pressing a hand to his mouth. News of the heresies, I whisper into his ear. At the end of Sturgeon's rule, who paid the criers to call them? He tries to lash out, and I twist his left arm closer to breaking. Don't test me, merchant. Who paid the criers? I read panic and confusion in his thoughts. He doesn't know. Floods. What about the traditionalists? Were any guilds involved in getting them into power? Images flood into his thoughts then but they're of money coming to the guilds, not the other way around, keeping them from bankruptcy. Floods. I need time to sort through what this means, but there's no time. Who is that? Who gave you money? I get some sense of a man, but no clear picture and no name. I grimace. This will have to be out loud. I'm taking my hand off your mouth now so you can tell me who. Make any other sound, I twist his arm just a touch more, and you live the rest of your life a cripple. Understood? Part of me can't believe what I'm doing. The other part of me is ready to do much worse to find out what he knows. All right, I am, the merchant gasps. That, that was his name. That's all I know. He wouldn't let us see him. It's a new Jayan name, but unfamiliar. From the temple? The traditionalists? Who was he? I don't know. Watersight says he's telling the truth. Slops. And the guilds were getting supported this way? Yes, he cries. Keep your voice down, I hiss. Why? Who did he work for? I don't know. His shoulders shake, and it takes me a moment to realize he's weeping. He's probably never been in this much danger. I feel bad despite myself. Fine. Stay here. 
and sorry, I grimace. That's not what heroes say in the legends. But this isn't a legend, and I'm too distracted to come up with something better. This still isn't direct evidence against the temple, but at least I have a name now. Who are you? He moans as I let go. I'm tempted for a moment to tell him the truth, to let the temple know I'm still here and coming for them. But again, this isn't a legend, and I'm not stupid. Anonymity is my only protection. I'm no one, and this was nothing. Forget it, speak nothing of it, or I will be displeased. I slip away, turning a new name over on my tongue. R.A.M. Twelve. Gaxna is still waiting in the hallway, and we get out without a hitch, pulling off masks to reveal old women costumes. She turns on me as soon as we're back on the roofs. What the hell was that? You could have gotten both of us caught. But I didn't, right? I'm still too pleased to care. A successful heist and another lead in finding out the truth, even if it's a confusing one. I needed to find out what he knew. And put us both at risk? That's not what you do to a partner. Her face is flushed and her fists bald. I slow down. Are we partners? No, I mean, yeah, for now at least. That's what I'm training you for, right? There's something vulnerable behind her anger, and I feel bad. Did I break her trust somehow? I grab her arm. Hey, you waited for me back there. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I just, I really need to know what happened to my dad. Whoever did it is still out there, and the traditionalists are still in power in the temple. It's not right. Is that all you care about? No, but it is important. Something tells me now's not the time to say I still don't feel at home out here, much as I've gotten good at stealing and disguises and living without being seen. This isn't home. The temple is. Or it was until they took it from me. And as much as I want justice for my father, I want my home back even more. And you're willing to risk your life for that? I shrug. You risked your life for me when you thought I was a Therakint runaway. That's different. How? She sighs. You're a flooding idiot. You know that, Alethea? I smile suddenly, thinking of Deshaun. I've been told that, yeah. Just don't do it again, okay? I clench my hands. I can't make that promise, but I owe her something. I did put her in danger back there, and that wasn't fair. I'll do my best. She eyes me a moment longer, then shakes her head. Come on, let's get this loot sorted and out of our hands before the flooding overseers track you down and arrest both of us. We start across the roofs again. So is this going to be enough to pay the eye stainer? That was a pretty good haul. Gaxna snorts, backing up to take a running start at a wide gap. This was nothing. At regular fence rates, you'd need 30 times this to pay what the stainer wants. Slops. She leaps a gap and I follow, used by now to the disorienting feeling of one building dropping out below me before the next one flies up. Thirty more like this? Or is she just cutting my share because she's upset? We climb the tower and in, Gaxna dropping to the lower level while I clear a space up above for lunch. She curses. What? I call down the hole. There's no response. Gaxna? Somebody's been here. What? I crawled down the ladder. The place has been ransacked, boxes spilled, everything turned over. Fear grips me, and I grab a staff. Who? Who knows about this place? No one, she says grimly, as if she knows exactly who does. I meet her eyes. The overseers? The witches. Uh, I say, noticing something on the floor. Anything to do with this? It's a folded piece of paper with a single symbol in the center. A triangle inside a triangle. Gaxna sees it and freezes. What is it? Floods, she breathes. And then she's up the ladder. Hey, Gaxna, wait! She's already down the tower and running by the time I get up. Gaxna! She leaps to the next building over and I curse, running after her. Gaxna, don't be stupid! She keeps running, already two buildings ahead and climbing. I run after, leaping alleys, skating roofs, climbing as fast as I can, just barely keeping her red-wigged head in sight. Gaxna! There's no response. I've never seen her move this fast. You'd think there was a blood-borne army behind us, the way she runs. 
I climb an aqueduct to keep her in sight and sprint the narrow length, buildings ten and twenty paces below me, grateful for our training. She's heading steadily up, out of the middle-class districts and into court, the richest part of Nusa Ray, right under the rocky rim where the hillside meets the plateau. Where is she going? My aqueduct branches and I leap onto a rooftop fifteen paces down, rolling to break the fall and sprinting after. Gaxon is just barely in sight as she drops into the streets and pounds up the road onto the plateau. I follow and give it my all, ignoring the startled looks of the well-dressed men and women this high up. This is stupid. We're drawing attention to ourselves despite the costumes. But if something does happen, Gaxon's going to need me there to fight her out of it, like I need her to help me survive in the city and find the stainer and gather more evidence against Narimes. And though I wasn't sure about it when she said we were partners before, I'm realizing it feels right. I'm not going to let her run off and do something stupid like this. I catch up to her as we sprint through the tangle of rickety wooden chops and burlap lean-tos built to serve the Dura caravans, the peninsula's plateau spreading out beyond. Is she trying to get on a caravan? Is that what this is about? Gaxna! She doesn't respond, and I'm feeling pretty done with this, so I kick out her left knee and pin her to the dirt. Let me go, she spits, fighting like a caged beast. I don't. Breathe, I say, getting in her face. You're safe, you're okay, but your emotions are ruling you. Find your breath. Her eyes dart around for a second, body still struggling, till they find mine. She relaxes some, but still shakes her head. Have to get out. Get away. They know. I frown. Who knows, Gaxna? What? The witches. They must have figured out I'm helping runaways. They're coming for me. That's fear talking. Think. If they wanted to take you, they would have waited, or sent Bloodborne after us. And if they're planning to surprise you, they wouldn't have left that paper behind. Either way, we gotta run. Let me up! She's starting to sound more like normal Gaxna, but I shake my head. I'm not letting you up till I know you're not going to do something stupid. Like what? Like run away on a Dura caravan or whatever you came up here for. Now breathe. She breathes, miraculously, and I guide her through the basic tide. In, out, deep, slow, calm, focus, here, now. After a minute, I can see it take effect, and I drag her over to a bench partially hidden behind a burlap tent. A few caravansers gawk at us, short, oily-skinned men in heavy jewelry. I ignore them. Gaxna takes a minute to dust herself off, and I'm relieved to see she didn't bring the statue. There's no way it would have survived that run in one piece. Better now? She nods. Good. I want to show you something. Something you can use in moments like that, if you have control of your breath, to keep your fear from taking over. And I teach her the icing technique, taking the physical sensations in your body and visualizing them as ice, to be melted and dealt with later. It seems to work. Why did you run? I ask when she's calm. There was no one there, and we weren't in danger. Gaxana takes a deep breath and shudders. Because it's proof they're still watching, that they still want me. Who? The Therakens? The witches, she says, stressing the word. They're witches, Alethea. They use their powers to get your blood and control you. I flex my fist. This hasn't been safe to talk about before, but maybe now. And they did that to you? She looks down. Yes, when I was a girl. I was... I wanted to be one of them. One of the witches. I didn't have any money, you know. Neither me or my mom. So life was hard. And when they said they'd take me, she laughs, but the sound is bitter. I had no idea what they wanted me for. What did they want you for? Gexner rubs at her missing eye. Let's just say I left on bad terms, and I've been waiting for them to come back for me ever since. That sounds hard. It's not the right thing to say, but I suck at words. But they didn't come for you. They didn't attack. Didn't make any bloodborne attack. They just came and looked through your stuff and left and made sure I knew it was them who did it. Yeah, isn't that kind of strange? What if it was someone else trying to pin the blame on the witches, like the traditionalists? That sits her up straighter. That could be it. Maybe it was someone else. Ironically, this seems to cheer her up. You're right. Okay, I say. Can we go back now? 
Her face closes. No. Gaxna, we're not leaving on a Dura caravan. I'm not, at least. She doesn't say anything, looking at the circles of canvas-covered wagons. Would she really drop everything and leave? I know I can't. This is where I need to be. I try again. I can't do this alone yet. I need you. We're partners, right? She chews her lip a moment, looking away, then nods. Partners. I realize as she says it, with the internal awareness that comes from years practicing the breathing, that there's more to it than that. And I have to say that part, too. I don't want you to leave. I like life with you. For a second, there's such an expression of fear in her eyes that I almost hug her. Then she firms up and smirks. First rule of thievery. Never trust a flatterer. I'm almost relieved enough not to be annoyed by that right now. Come on, let's go. There's a falafel wrap I'm dying to eat back there. She shakes her head. We can't go back to the tower. What? We have to. All our stuff's there. The loot we just took, the statue. Gaxna sets her jaw. I've got other places. We can get other loot. We argue about it on the rooftops back to the city. She leads me to a walled-off room in the side of a three-story dockhouse close to the Blackwater. It's not as nice as our last hideout, but it's safe and full of Gaxna's signature crates of junk. Plus, the roof has a great view of the bay and the temple hanging from the cliffs on the far side. After getting my bearings, I leave Gaxna, who's still moody, and get as much of our stuff as I can carry, including the statue. I almost feel sad leaving the tower. This place felt safe for a while. The first safe place I've had since... I don't know when. Since my dad, I guess, and I'll never get him back. But climbing up to our new hideout, sack loaded with gold and jewelry and a strange crystal statue, I realize I have something almost as good. A friend. Thirteen. Gaxna is militant about training the next morning. Faster, she barks as I uncoil the thief's rope from my waist. Higher, harder! My arms ache after just an hour practicing on the wide roof above the hideout. I don't know if it's the burglary or the witches yesterday or what, but something has my friend determined to wear me out. I strike back the only way I know how, by training her just as hard. Breath, I shout back coiling the rope with a snaking motion. She hesitates. In. Too long. Gaxna starts running. Rope me. I change the end and snap the rope at her. It catches her waist, coils a couple times rapidly, and I jerk, bringing her down. Breath. Out. Emotion. I start hauling in the rope. G calm. Fish slop, I call, rolling off. You're frustrated. Ice it. She grimaces, then points at one of the bottles on the wall. Hook it! So it goes for hours. It's insane. It's exhausting. And it's almost kind of fun. I can at least tell that Gaxna's working something out with it, maybe thawing her fear from yesterday. And I'm a lot better at thief's rope by the time we finally take a break. You're getting better, Gaxna pants, flopping next to me in the shade of a rooftop lean-to. I massage my left arm where the muscles are starting to burn. The breeze from the ocean plus the shade of the lean-to is delicious. I've been thinking about yesterday, Gaxna says, about the break-in. And the witches? I know she didn't tell me the whole story yesterday. About what you said, whether it was them or not? I decided it doesn't matter. Someone's figured me out, or you out. I take the water skin from her. Could be that runaway that stayed with us a few nights back. Malil? Maybe she went back and ratted us out. No, it wasn't her. I... She pauses, and I can see her practicing the breathing, trying to ice whatever's bothering her. The witches. They can track me. What? How? They have my blood, so they can feel me or whatever. Kind of like you do through the water. I shake my head. How did they get it? She shrugs. Not like it's unusual. They probably got it at birth, along with my mom's. That's why the witches are everywhere, offering the midwife for free, and why some people try to hide it when their time comes, because whoever's there gets your blood and your kids. So they can sense you after that. Floods. That must mean... So pretty much the whole city is under their control? 
and a lot of the peninsula too. How do you think they got that mob to chase you so fast? Doesn't matter what the monks think up in the temple, it's the witches who rule the city. The overseers have to touch you to read your thoughts, but the witches are watching all the time, waiting to take control of you when they want to. And they can control you too? Gaxna again takes a minute to breathe, icing something inside. Yes, not all of them can do it, and I don't know if the lady who helped my mom could or not, but they... They got more blood, later, and whoever got that blood can definitely do it. But that's good, right? That means if they wanted you, or they wanted you dead or something, they would just do it. They don't need to search your house for something, they can just force you to walk over to them and tell them your secrets. Well, they can't force you to say something if you don't want to. They can't really make people talk at all. But yeah, if they wanted to see me, they could just march me all the way to their guild hall. So what's the big deal then? It probably wasn't even the witches at all, if they can make you do what they want. Gaxna sighs. That's not how they do things. They know if they use their power too much, the city will rise against them. And they still need to recruit from the girls. So they do things like this, let you know that they're watching you, that they want you to come in or whatever. They want you to come in? She nods, morose. That's what the paper meant. You're supposed to bring it to them. Oh, Jay. I think through it for a minute, watching two seagulls wheel in the sky. You know, there might be a way to keep them out of your head. What? She sits up straight. How? Well, it's just a theory. Something I've been thinking about. I'm a girl, right? But I can use male magic. And you're starting to get good at icing emotions, which shows probably lots of people can use water sight powers, not just men. My dad knew that. I think I was the first step in him opening the temple to women. But what if it's more than that? What if the powers aren't actually that different? Water sight lets you read thoughts, and the Theracans can read feelings. On our side, we've got the blind to keep others from reading our thoughts. So what if that worked for blood sight too, to keep them from reading your feelings? Gaxon stares at me. And you're saying if it did, they probably couldn't see where I am either. Exactly. It's just a theory, but let's do it. Now, show me. I show her the steps. It all builds on the breath anyway, though it'll be some time before her concentration is strong enough to really pull it off. Flooding hells, she says, after she loses focus again. How do you do this? I've had my whole life to learn it, I say. You've been working on it, what, a week now? Still, I can see she's frustrated even without water sight. For someone who spends her whole life in disguise, it has to kill her that the witches can see right through it. It's going to take time, I say, as gently as I can, no matter how much you practice. So in the meantime, are you going to go in? Hell no. Floods no. But they could come for us here just as easily. Exactly, she bites her lip. Which is why we need to leave. Go someplace safe. Gaxna, I can't. They'll kill you too, or take you. Take your blood. She takes my hand. And you've got the overseers on top of that. What good are you dead? Nothing. I'm no good dead. But it's a risk I have to take. This is where my dad was murdered. This is where the temple is. My home. If I'm going to find out the truth, if I'm going to do anything about it, it's here. Besides, what would I do out there? I look out over the bay, Ujay's fist sticking like a bleached white skeleton from the waters. I'm a seer. I've always wanted to be a seer, to share my gift with people, like I'm doing with you. Teach them to see deeper, to get control of their emotions. Out there? I shrug. I'm just another person. Out there you survive. You can come back later. Do this when no one's expecting. When I've got the blind down. And in the meantime, we do whatever we have to. Whatever we want to. There's a light in her eyes I haven't seen before. Hopeful and pleading and something more. I wish I could read her through our hands, but I promise not to, and I'm honoring that. Still, I feel a warm buzz coming from her touch. It's intoxicating, but it doesn't change the truth. I shake my head. The longer I wait, the harder it'll be to find the truth, and the more secure the traditionalists will get. If you need to go, I get it, but this is where I need to be. She looks away, then takes a deep breath and sets her shoulders. Okay, then there's someone we need to talk to.
14. We're back in the upper part of the city, dressed as two merchants' sons, in flowing trousers and sleeveless shirts. The tight vests we wear to hide our figures make it hard to breathe, but it's no worse than the way the close-cut wigs make me sweat. The city is lively here, children screaming in the fountains and vendors calling out wares while wealthy men and women browse the indoor shops. There are even a few Salem Dale in the mix, the milk-eyed technocrats from the mountains to the north. A new Jay preacher stands on one corner, proclaiming the deluge to all who will listen. We'll wipe out the unbelievers, the dry-minded, the weak. Repent now and bear faith in the waters. No one knows the day or the hour, but children, we know his wrath is great. Gaxna frowns as we pass him. Flood in you, Jayists. Ain't gonna be no flood in deluge. She speaks in the gruff voice she uses for male disguises. I shrug, practicing what she said about men swaying from their shoulders, not their hips. Most seers don't think there'll be another deluge for centuries yet. Maybe never if we keep the faith. Though Narime said something different about my dad. Your father's doomsday fears about the deluge. Ujay, Gaxna snorts, doing a better job than me of sounding male. I don't think there ever were floods. It's just something they used to keep us in line. I raise an eyebrow, and not because Gaxna casually snags a pomegranate as we pass a fruit stand. How do you explain the fist, then? Ujay's fist is a giant metal thing sticking from the ocean a few miles out in the bay, hexagonal beams making a fist-like shape. Rocks, she says, carefully not looking at a witch attending the next fountain we pass. Rocks? The fist is ten times the size of a ship and clearly made of metal, though under all the bird slop and barnacles there's not a spot of rust on it. There are no rocks like that, or metal either. So I'm supposed to believe it was a previous super-advanced civilization that got wiped out in a flood? She nods toward an overseer ahead, and we step into a luthier's shop. I have to ice my fear despite the disguise. My eyes are still a dead giveaway. I've seen one other violet-eyed person in the city since I came here, and I think he was a sailor from abroad. The overseer passes and we move on. I want to ask Axna where we're going, who this person is, and what they have to do with me not wanting to leave. But I know better than to ask in public. Instead, we keep arguing about the deluges, an old argument between the faithful and non-believers. When I was still a second year, they took us to the Serrante Isles off the west coast to see the strange square pillars rising up from the ocean, covered in rust and salt and bird slop, impossible but undeniably man-made. A drowned city, and a drowned people with it. I don't know if keeping to Ujayism will save us from the next flood, but I don't doubt it's coming. Gaxna slows down outside a normal stone house on a pretty average street in the upper part of the city. Here? I ask. Here, stay outside and practice your disguise, okay? This could take a while. She goes in and I find a seat with my back to a wall next to a noodle vendor. I try to relax and really get into the character of a merchant's son, but my mind keeps going back to my father, to the traditionalists, to what I've learned. That someone named Arayim gave that merchant money to keep his business afloat through the trade slump like they knew it wouldn't last long and didn't want the city's merchants to take real damage from it. What does that mean? That someone was affecting trade itself in the city? That would be a much bigger move than just paying off some criers. And who is Arayim? I thought I had it figured out, with either the merchants doing Narime's favors before his rise to power, or vice versa. But the guild had swore Arayim wasn't from any guild, and he would know. So who else would Arayim be serving? And does that make him Narimes' puppet, or the one pulling the strings? One thing I know for sure, Arayim is not a name connected to the temple. I would recognize it, even someone from our upriver posts. Which brings my thoughts back to the crier I talked to days ago. He never answered me directly about who was paying to have my father's heresies played up. But knowing that would give me another stream to follow in figuring out who is behind all of this. I stand up. I'm not great at this disguise, and the city's not safe, but it'll never be safe, and I need to know. Gaxna said it would take a while. So I head for the Blackwater. I think I can find the fountain where I talked to the crier, and I've got money to bribe him now. I try my best to keep my head down, to swagger like a merchant's son, and to watch the street for witches and overseers. 
Taking the roofs would be easier, but I need to get better at this in case Gaxna does finally freak out and leave. I see one overseer, but detour around him without incident. The same crier stands by the fountain, still yelling about a giant squid. I catch his eye across the square and nod toward Nally. He frowns for a second, then probably recognizes my eyes and heads over. Got some money for me then, lass? Or is it lad? Doesn't matter, I say, pulling him further back in the wedge between buildings. But yes, I need a name. He rubs his hands together. And I need money. Cry's gotta eat. I fish in my pocket for one of the necklaces we lifted back at the merchant's house. The stone in it is small, but his eyes light up when he sees it. This enough? He snatches it from my hand, glancing back toward the street. Where'd you get this? That doesn't matter. Now who paid you to bend the news about Sturgjohn? He grins. Not me. The whole guild. Floods. Fine. Who? The crier narrows his eyes. Why do you want to know, anyway? Are you going to expose me? It doesn't flooding matter. And no, I'm not going to expose you. Call me curious, and I'll call you overpaid either way. Don't know much about him, really. Just shows up with money now and then. Ariam's his name. It's everything I can do not to goggle. Ariam? Yeah, you know him? I flex my hands. No, but I need to. Where can I find him? The crier raises his eyebrows. That's valuable information. I grit my teeth. I could force it out of him, grind his face into the cobblestones till he tells me. But that's not the way the streets work, and I need to not stand out here. To be water. I fish in my pocket and pull out the other thing I slipped from the loot. A solid gold statue of Ujay in dragon form. Small, but surely more valuable than the necklace. I should ask Gax no more about what things are worth. His eyes pop, and he snatches it up. Evening after next, Cryas Guild House. He usually comes at sunset, meets with the president. Look for a tall man with his hood up, walks like his hips hurt. Are you sure? I don't flooding lie, kid, unlike you, whoever you are. But mess with me and I'll start crying the news that some violet-eyed girl is asking too many questions. He narrows his eyes. You the one that they're looking for, then? Escaped from the temple last week? Fear grips me, and I think for a second I'm going to have to knock him out so hard he forgets all this. Then he smiles. Don't matter to me as long as you keep the gold coming. I know lots. I release my fists, palm aching where my nails bit into the flesh. I bet you do. Thanks. If R.A.M. isn't there, you can bet I'll be back. I'm pleased to see the hint of fear that enters his eyes, and he scurries out of the alley. I climb to the roofs just in case, head spinning. Who is R.A.M.? Where did he get the money to bribe an entire guild and float a bunch of merchants? Not even the temple has pockets that deep. Which makes it feel a lot more likely that Narimes is a pawn in whatever game Ariam's playing, not the other way around. If he has that much money, he's not going to be interested in getting a few lucrative favors from the traditionalists once they're in power. I grab a roof pole, swing myself to a higher roof. Unless this is about more than money? Could Ariam just be a devout as well as very rich Ujian traditionalist? The pieces don't fit but I have a date at least. Morning after next, a hooded man with a limp outside the Criers Guild. R.A.M. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Fifteen. There's a reason they call it the Blackwater. It's not because of the city's refuse washing into the bay. That's dark brown. It's not the algae that blooms in the summer heat, feeding off that waste to form a mat so thick ships plow drifts as they come in. That's a brilliant purple. It's the goatfish that feed on the waste, the algae, and anything else that gets thrown in the bay. Sharp-toothed and black-finned, they feed in such giant schools that they blacken the water. And this boiling, tooth-mad mass gives the lowest part of the city its name. That, and the stories of what gets thrown to them. Gaxna and I are selling twists of clove leaf on a rotting pier just off the main arc of docks, where pale-skinned Bamani and nut-brown Ujalan sweat under heavy casks, loading and unloading ships from all over the world. The Bamani bring mostly produce and meat, hauling them across the strait in barges so old and patched they look ready to collapse. Traders from the inner crescent bring skins and spices and oils and pearls, and Dara down from the ironway brings salt and cotton and coal, 
all meeting to shout and barter and strike deals under the ragged red canopies of the docks. Scattered among them are the tall and thin Salem Dale, milky white eyes eerie behind their head coverings. Wrapped in dark shawls and clad in a clinging fabric they refuse to sell, they speak seldom and selectively, their steps usually dogged by two or three merchants alternating between shouting and pleading. They trade in metals and cloth and foods like everyone else, but the real exports are inventions, strange devices like hourglasses that follow the moon, or exploding shot for catapults, or the astrolabes that now chart the oceans. Their ships are sleek and black and clad in iron, like predators slinking between the stockier wooden vessels. The Deol had no ships or ports only a few decades ago, but now they trade as widely as any other coastal nation, selling a crate of inventions to fill a ship full of goods. Rumor has it their mountain cities are full of wonders, that they keep many more innovations than they sell, but already their technology has changed the world. Some say the aqueducts that make Surrey possible were originally Deol inventions, though that is too far in the past for anyone to know. Stop staring, Gaxna mutters, lighting another clove leaf. The smell draws in customers, she says, but I think it's nerves. We're not here to sell clove leaf. We're here to steal fortunes. I'm not staring, just trying to get a feel for the Dale. One of their warehouses is our target tonight. It isn't lost on me that Nerimes is getting married to one, that there could be something to learn here. Mostly, though, we're trying to make enough money in one shot to get my eyes stained and fund another batch of Gaxna's Theracant rescues. We won't. Most flooding secretive people you'll meet. Stay on their ships unless they absolutely have to. Think any of them will be in the warehouse? Gaxna's informant, the same one that bought the statue from us, said the target is in their cavernous warehouse just down the dock. Gaxna blows smoke. Maybe. You can handle them, though. This is part of the reason Gaxna never tried this theft alone. There's no way to do it without running into some guards, and she's no good at fighting. The payout is big enough I suspect she was thinking of this back when she first offered her trade. I've never asked why she didn't partner up with someone else, but I think I know, because she's never trusted anyone enough. It's not lost on me that she sees me differently. I can deal with them. The Salem Dale may be known for their technology, but Saray is known for its fighters, and I am the best of my class, though I'd feel better with water under me and a staff in my hands. Gaxna straightens up, and I see a tanned dock worker approaching us, one of the few Ujela on this part of the docks. Gaxna puts on a crooked smile. Smoke for you, sailor? Aye, the woman says, handing over a few coins. How's trade, I ask, trying to mirror her rough accent. She snorts, then leans in to light her stick from Gaxna's. Same as ever. Hard work and no pay. Picked up from last year, though, innit? My grammar teachers cringe inside, but this is how I need to talk. It's kind of fun, actually. The woman draws deep and lets out a lungful of fragrant smoke before she answers. Is it that, I suppose? I lean forward. Why is that, you suppose? That new chosen up there got something to do with it. Chosen, the worker says, and spits uncomfortably close to my shoe. Nothing to do with the flood and chosen. It's the frost eyes. Gaxna eyes me, but I press on. Nerimes mentioned trade slumping at the end of my father's reign, and the salt merchant seemed to confirm that, but something's off about it. The Dale? How's that, I ask? Trade was piss poor, yeah, for everybody but the Dale. Their houses were stock full, ships low in the waters. They just weren't selling. Ought to ban them all if you ask me. Stick to the Duraw and the Bamani. Them at least a person can talk to. Their warehouses were full? Was R.E.M. funding them too? Or does this have something to do with the Salem Dale Nerimes is planning to marry? I start to ask another question and Gaxa kicks me under the table. Right ya, the thief says. Flooding frost eyes ought to stay in their mountains. Night to ya. The woman nods and walks off, pulling on her clove leaf. Gaxna turns on me. What are you doing? I frown. Looking for information. I could learn something here. You're calling attention to us is what you're doing. That sailor will remember us for days. Remember the violet-eyed girl who was asking questions about the Salem Dale. I shift. So? I know she's right, that if I want to stay undercover I should shut up, but it's a risk I have to run. What's the point of staying in the city if I can't get the information I need? Okay, I'll shut up. But I don't. 
I ask the next two workers that come up about the trade slump in the Dale. One of them is too tired to say much, but the other one backs up the woman's claims. The Dale warehouses were full when everybody else's were empty. They just weren't selling. Why wouldn't they sell? Gaxna kicks me again. I ignore her. This worker has a thoughtful air, his facial hair trimmed in careful lines, so I'm hoping he'll have some insight. Drive up prices? Create a shortage so they can profit from it. I nod. That's what my teachers would have said, too. Part of our education was in economics, because some of us would end up as theocrats with direct control over Saray's trade laws. But to do it for months? Seems like they could have sold sooner. The sailor cracks his knuckles, strong hands thick with calluses. Shoulda. But with the Frosties? He shrugs bronze shoulders, shifts his feet, and something about him reminds me of Deshaun, standing next to me in the kitchens below the temple. I miss him. You ladies got plans for the night? I know a great brewer down Wet Leg Alley. Charming, Gaxna says before I can answer, but no. His eyebrows go up, but he shrugs again and walks off. Gaxna, what? You didn't have to be rude. She narrows her eyes at me. You think it was cute or something? What? No, I, he's not my type at all, but no harm done then. I pull out the sleeves on my blouse, adjusting the cuffs. Well, we could have gotten his name at least. She gives me a dirty look. We keep waiting as the shadows deepen until the workers have gone home and the lantern worker makes his rounds. Then we change in the shadow of a pearler ship and slip towards the largest of the dockside warehouses, doors reinforced steel and walls oiled stone. This is the first obstacle to getting in, or would be if we didn't have ropes. Gaxna hooks the rafter of a neighboring building, and from there I get my rope through a ventilation hole high up in the Dale warehouse. We untie Gaxna's rope and shimmy across, then use hers to drop to the teakwood floor. The trick once inside is not to take too long. According to Gaxna's informant, they don't keep a heavy guard. No one does in the City of Justice, where overseers catch most thieves in a matter of hours but they do make the rounds every half hour or so, which is an issue because they're also said to have strange new weapons. Gaxna waves me forward, and I take a minute to ice my anxiety. We need this money, and this might be the only chance to see if the elusive Dale were involved in my father's death, something I'm even more curious about after talking to the dock workers. It's just dangerous as hell is all. We stalk forward, the giant hall full of looming shadows from the lanterns burning along the wall. Stacks of crates and barrels block my view in every direction. It smells of wine and leather and cinnamon, normal warehouse smells, but also oil and metal and something sour. The next issue will be the lock. It's not even a lock, actually, but some kind of series of rooms set into the back wall. According to Gaxna's patron, the first door locks behind you before the second will open. It means I will have to wait outside the vault while Gaxna gets whatever we came for, then let her out when she's done. The key changes nightly, but the vault guard is supposed to have a copy. It's the waiting for Gaxna while frost eyes with advanced weapons make the rounds part I'm not excited about. There is only one guard posted outside the vault, like her patron said. In his hands he holds something like a bent lute, almost pretty except for the long row of gleaming silver spikes on one end. I don't want to find out what it does. Good thing I spent my youth sneaking through a temple of meditating seers. I climb the nearest stack of crates in dead silence while Gaxna waits below, working at her hands. I would be doing that too if I didn't keep icing the fear as it comes up. It's about a ten-foot fall. If I judge it wrong, I'll land on the weapon instead of the guard. I jump. It's over mostly before it begins. I come down with a foot on his weapon arm, another on his shoulder, and deliver a blow called Shifting Tides to the side of his head. He manages only a slight yelp before toppling to the floor. I tense anyway, catching his strange weapon before it can clatter away, listening for any reaction, any shouts of alarm. There's none. Gaxner runs up, gets a large square key from his pockets, and works it into the door. I get a good look at it for the first time. This is no ordinary door. I saw the inside of a safe once, the strange toothed wheels and levers that ran the mechanism behind the dial. This is like a fever dream of that, twisted and complicated and ten times as big. Giant bands of metal run on the outside of doors wider than I am tall, concealing a tangle of wheels and straps and things I have no name for. 
Gaxna fits the key in with a metal snick, and I hold my breath. It turns. The gears and levers and pulleys all spin, smooth as knives through fat, and she slips inside. I close it behind her, icing a bolt of fear as the mechanism spins the opposite direction, locking her in. If anything happens to me, Gaxna has no way out. So I retreat to a hiding place and watch the door, hoping no one heard us. The smart thing to do would be to stay put until she's done, get her out, and go. But there's a Salem Dale man down there, unconscious and unable to block water sight. I wait 100 breaths, then slip down to him, flicking his ears to wake him up while I keep a hand over his mouth to stifle any cries. One amazing thing about water sight is it doesn't depend on language. In the temple, they had us practice on people from Dara, Bamani, the North Shore, the Wastes, and people who spoke no Ujela at all. We never worked on a Salem Dale, but the experience is much the same. I hear his thoughts, understand them, but it's like a picture with the colors reversed, or a sentence set out of order. His disconnected thoughts rove over my attack and what he should have done to me. Interesting, but not what I'm here for. I flick harder, waking him all the way up. He jerks, then stills as I press a knife to his throat. There, I whisper in his ear. Do you understand Ujela? He doesn't answer. Can't, really, given the position of the blade. But I hear from his thoughts that he does. Good. I need to ask you some questions. That certainly sparks a flood of thoughts, not least of them superstitious fears of Ujay Sears and our magical powers. I smile. Who is R.I.M.? Confusion. Damn. It was worth a try but he'll still know more than those workers about these warehouses being full, and maybe that connects to R.A.M. and how he was manipulating trade in the city before my father's murder. I try again. How long have you worked at this dock house? The answer comes in a garbled form of time, not years or seasons, but something close enough that I make it out. About four years. And you were here when the former Chosen was deposed? Yes. Were your warehouses full? An image comes of this warehouse filled to the rafter with goods, along with a lot of memories of hard work and boredom and careful stacking. Why? Another image garbled sentence, this one of Salem Dale trading at ports up the coast, buying goods before they could reach Saray. I shake my head. Okay, you were buying up goods so no other traders would come to Saray, but why? I see a woman then, a tall Salem Dale woman, a dark scar standing out on her pale skin, twisting the corner of her mouth upward in a sneer. Images of her giving orders, inspecting manifests. Cold certainly suddenly hits me. Her name. What's her name? Yeolat, the man croaks. Yeolat of the Salem Dale. Nerimace's bride. The puzzle pieces spin in my mind. The money needed to bribe the Criers Guild, to float the merchants, to get Nerimace in power. It came from the Salem Dale, by far the richest nation in the world. Of course. Wealth they also used to buy up goods without selling them, depressing trade and making my father look bad. The merchants and their guilds had nothing to do with this. They were pawns. But Nerimace's marriage suddenly makes a lot more sense. He must have struck some kind of power-sharing deal, his power in exchange for their money. And my father's death, of course. The guard yelps under me, and I realize I'm pressing the knife a little too sharply into his throat. Sorry, I mutter, then finger the three points of diver's bind, knocking him out for real. Surely this is proof enough. Surely the fact that Nerimace's bride was involved in manipulating trade will be proof enough the traditionalists were involved in setting my dad up, that Nerimace has sold out the temple to get himself in power. I have no doubt this is where the money came from. Aryam will tie it together when I meet him. No wonder I didn't recognize the name. He's probably a Salem Dale. I force myself to focus on my surroundings. None of this matters if I get caught unawares or something goes wrong with the heist. There's no sound from Gaxna inside. She was going to tap on the walls when she was done. Hopefully before I have to knock out another guard, if there is one. The rest of the warehouse is quiet, though sound alone doesn't tell much. Not for the first time, I wish the floor was properly doused in water. Then I'd really be able to keep watch. For now, I drag the guard into a corner and strip him. It's nothing personal. I just need his clothes. Mine don't fit him well, but I leave his knickers on and get my loose trousers over them, so he isn't naked at least. 
the blouse I leave beside him, unsure if he'd be as embarrassed wearing it as a Saray man would. The Salomdale fabric is strange against my skin, clinging but easy to move in, like nothing I've ever worn before. I wrap the man's scarf around my head, aware I'm probably doing it wrong, and my skin is too dark anyway, but it might buy me a second or two if things go wrong. I take my thief's rope, too, then climb a stack of crates and wait for Gaxna's signal. Wait for a guard making the rounds. Wait for any sound, really. There's none. You'd think there would be some kind of sound. If nothing else, the scratching of Blackwater's infamous rats. When it comes, it's almost too soft to make out, or would be if it wasn't so familiar. The swishing of robes. Overseers. Sixteen. I freeze atop my stack of crates. How did they find me? How did they know? There's nowhere to run if they're here, no way to stay silent if I move, but the crates are bone dry, so they may not find me if I stay put. There. Two of them stride into view, strong, arrogant, eyes sweeping the dim space. One of them examines the vault door, runs his hands over it, then touches the other, saying something through the water of their skin. I stay motionless, offering a prayer to Ajay. If my cause is just at all, if there's any truth to the things I've been discovering, let them not see me. They see me. The one looks right at me, and I duck my cowl forward, hoping to hide my eyes, to look like a Salem Dale worker who happens to be balancing atop a stack of crates. You, he barks, with such a tone of command, such an expectation of response, that the student in me looks up before I can stop her. His eyes widen, seeing the violet in mine, and he runs for me. Panic seizes me. I ice it. No way to get down, more overseers below. Up, then. I pull the thief's rope from my belt in one smooth motion and whip it at the rafters far overhead. I miss. I throw again. It catches and I clamber up, just seconds ahead of the overseer. He climbs after, nimble on the rope. I ice panic again. Nowhere to go once we get to the top. Alone, I could swing back and forth, reach one of the high windows, but not with him weighing it down. Sooner or later, then, I will battle him, with the loser facing a crippling fall. Better to do it on my own terms. I swing us out as I climb, stacks of crates and aisles between them swaying underfoot, then pull my knife and cut the rope just as the overseer is about to reach me. He hangs in air for a moment, surprise marring his serene face, then plummets earthward. I scramble up as I hear the crash and his shout of pain. I can't help wincing. That had to break bones. I ice the emotion. I will feel worse if the overseers catch Gaxna. Two of them stare up from below, meditation cool faces like statues of Ujjay in death pose. Where can I go? Anywhere out of the warehouse means abandoning Gaxna. Anywhere inside it means they find me eventually. I swing left, swing right, consider my options. I can't abandon her, but I'm no use if I get caught either. Third option, then, the roof. I swing farther out, farther, more overseers gathering below, six like I thought, like I've been patrolling the streets, or five now. Did I really just do that to an overseer? My feet touch wall and I push off hard, swinging the full width of the warehouse to the other side, where I catch a vent with one hand. I swing my body through, other hand keeping the rope. I tie it off and swing out the window. Flooding gods! It's a fifty-foot drop below me, and the wall is still oiled up here, almost impossible to climb. I grab it anyway, fingers slipping, and scramble up to the roof lip. It's a slight overhang, but my instincts carry me over it and up. The roof is a long stretch of wood shingles, chimney vents for the summer heat studded along the low peak. I stalk up to a pair of them, keeping my steps silent, and take cover between. It's the best hiding place up here, though I'm still exposed on two sides. I can only hope the overseers assume I got down and ran, and they spread out in the streets to catch me, though I'm not sure the one that climbed after me meant to capture me or outright throw me to the floor to die, which, I realize belatedly, I sort of did to him. Hope he's okay. A few minutes pass, the ocean breeze cool against my pounding heart. 
I let some of my panic thaw and my fear, my guilt, let my pulse beat it out of my system. I need to get Gaxna sooner rather than later. If the overseers stay inside and hear her banging to get out, they will find a way in and take her. And the punishment for theft in Saray is simple. You lose a hand. Then again, if the overseers have gone, they will surely notify the Salem Dale, who will come with their own guards and find Gaxna, and the guard I attacked. There's no way to know, and it's bad odds, but I can't abandon my friend. She rescued me, after all. I'm just resolving to climb down and do what I can when a shadow falls over me. I jump up, but a hand clamps over my mouth, another binding my arms. I'm already starting water unwinds the knife when my attacker's thoughts register. I gasp. Deshaun? Yes, he says through our water bond. It's me. Emotion comes with it, as it always has for Deshaun. I don't know why, but my water sight is deeper with him. He's surprised and relieved and worried. What are you doing here? I step back, but keep hold of his hand so we can talk through the bond. Are you part of them? He grimaces, broad face achingly familiar in the moonlight. I've missed him, I realize, more than anyone else I left behind. I am, or I'm not an overseer, but they took me, asked me to help them find you. I tense. So are you going to try to take me to them? I feel the emotion of a laugh, stifled for silence's sake. I don't think I could if I tried, but no, I only agreed to come along hoping that I could find you. We need to talk. How did you know where to look? He hesitates. His blind is up, but I can feel something in him. Regret? They got a tip. A tip? From who? I don't know. That's not important now, Thea. You need to get out of here before something worse happens. I can't. Not yet. My friend is still down there, trapped. So leave her. The overseers will take care of her. Sometimes he's so stupid. My friend, I said to Sean. I'm not leaving her to get a hand chopped off because I failed in my part of the job. The job? What are you, a burglar now? Just gave up on the temple? He's angry. I can almost feel it pulsing in his wrists. Deshaun, the temple gave up on me. Or did you miss the part where Narimes tried to kill me? He squats down beside me, putting on a reasonable expression. He wasn't going to kill you, Thea. That was just for show. Just like when he came to spar. The iron weights they were putting my legs into didn't seem like a show. Well, anyway, he couldn't do it now if he wanted to. Not in the temple. There are a lot of people on your side. My heart jumps. So they heard what I showed in the water when I was running? They've realized the traditionalists are corrupt? Confusion comes through our bond, echoed on his face in the moonlight. What? No. They just think the death sentence is going too far. My blood chills. The death sentence? That's why I came. He's calling for your life, Alethea. Ever since you ran from the overseers and attacked them with Bloodborne. What? That wasn't me. I summon up the memories of the day so he can see them through the bond. See that it was a Therakin who called the Bloodborne chasing me that first day. No surprise registers in him. I never thought it was you. I know you're not a witch. But there are some people in the temple that think, you know, that think I'm a heresy. Trust me, I know. Yeah, well, they're calling for your head, saying you're too much of a danger to the city and the religion to be given a regular trial. Floodwaters. So the overseer before was trying to kill me. They're all trying to kill me. I get sick for a second, thinking of all the times in the past week Gaxna and I have been on the streets, exposed, my violet eyes there for all to see. I could have been killed many times over. Then I get angry. Is Nerimes this much of a pawn that he'll issue a kill on sight order in public just to please whoever's controlling him? Because that's what must have happened. Word got back to him from the wealthy merchant I talked to, or the crier, or both, and they decided I was too much of a danger. It's unjust and obvious, and I hate that only part of the temple is even upset about it. Deshaun takes my hand. I won't let them do it, Alethea. I won't let them take you. I shake my head. Then why are you here? Why are you helping them? Chagrin comes through our bond. I'm not helping them. I just, I hoped they would know where you were. And they did. And now we're here. And everything will be okay. What? I recover myself, answer in water. In what way is everything going to be okay? Deshaun, my friend's trapped down there, and I'm going to get killed if I try to help her. He gives my hand a squeeze. But I'm too upset to feel anything but worried and annoyed. We'll deal with her later. We can help her, Thea. But first we have to get you back to the temple. 
I goggle. The temple? That's the last place I want to be right now. No, don't you see? It's the only place that's safe. The loyalists there will protect you. Loyalists? The ones that want you back, that are arguing you should have had a chance to explain yourself, that the council is going too far with the death sentence. We heard what you said in the water when you were fleeing the temple. His eyes meet mine, dark and glassy in the moonlight. A lot of the temple believes you, but it's not enough. They need to hear it in your words. I'm not... I take a breath, ice the frustration and fear and everything else I'm feeling. Try again. Deshaun, I'm not coming back to explain myself. I did nothing wrong. And if Narimes can send a bunch of thugs to my room once, he can do it again. Kill me before I get a chance to escape this time. I'm safer out here. Where the overseers are trying to kill you? Where they can't find me through the water? Where the answers are to whoever killed my father and got Narimes into power? I grip his wrist harder. Here, look. I call up everything I've gathered. The crier admitting they were bribed to play up the heresies. The merchants proving trade was being manipulated during my father's time. The Salem Dale's revelations about Yaolat. The memory of Narimes listing all these things, then implying the real reason was my father was in his way. That dissent is the ultimate heresy. He gasps. What did you do? I realize in my haste I might have pushed some of the thoughts into him rather than spoken them. Sorry, but that's what I have so far. Ujay and Jaya, he says, thinking through it, looking through my memories. So you're saying the traditionalists had your father killed? Or killed him as part of their deal to get into power? I'm pretty certain they sold the temple out one way or another. He frowns. It's obvious someone was doing something strange back then, but none of this points directly to the council. It points to Arayim, who's either going to be a traditionalist pawn or the one pulling Narimis' strings from the background. Have you heard of him? No, but you're planning to meet him. He must have glimpsed that in the memories I showed him. Deshaun grips my hand harder, and something deep and warm comes through our bond. Thea, no. It's too dangerous. Love. I realize what I'm feeling from him is love, or something very like it. For a moment, I don't know what to say. Deshaun, I... Please. The temple needs you. I need you. It's intoxicating, like a whole twist of clove leaf at once, like magic. I think I used to feel this way for him too, deep down, under my fear and determination. But now? I'm not ready. I need more time, more proof, something no one can deny, something that will rally the loyalists to action, and I won't find it in the temple. Deshaun shakes his head, eyes gleaming in the moonlight. When will you be ready? What is worth more than us being together? His words crush me, but not my core. The truth. Getting justice for my father. Keeping the traditionalists from corrupting our temple and everything we stand for. He looks away toward the ocean, and I feel loss and resignation in him. That's what I thought you would say. When he looks back, he's smiling. You always were a fighter. Always needed to have it your way. Damn right. Speaking of which, my way right now means keeping my friend from losing her hand. Deshaun, can you do anything? He grimaces, and I see the struggle of loyalties on his face, the pull to obey the temple and the urge to help me. He's a good man. I can imagine loving him if my life was different. But it's not, and Gaxon is trapped down there with overseers. Deshaun, please. I pull closer to him on the rooftop. I don't know if this is trusting him or using him, but it's all I've got. He struggles a second more, then nods. Okay, but what can I do? Lead them off. Tell them you saw me up here, running, that you think you know where I'm going. Then take them away. Okay, but then what? When will I see you again? I don't know if the ache I feel in my chest is mine or his. I always knew he liked me. Ujay loves me. But I guess I can't deny now I feel something like that too. Not the same, but deep feelings I've iced and kept iced, because if they thawed, I don't know what I would do. It was never the right time. And now isn't either. I don't know. Soon, another couple weeks, hopefully, and I'll have all the proof I need. If you need something, leave word for a boy named Gaxna with a crier at Elim's Fountain in the Blackwater. He nods. And Deshaun, show the loyalists what I've shown you. I know it'll be memories of memories, but try to convince them there's a deeper reason the council wants me dead. It's not because I'm a threat to the city or the temple or whatever. It's because I'm a threat to Narimes's power. He stands. I should go. Give me ten minutes. 
I stand with him, our hands still tangled. I know I'm making the right choice, that I need to stay out here, but it's hard to see him go, to turn down his vision of returning to the temple, even though I know it wouldn't work. It feels like letting go of my past. I don't know how to say any of that, so I just say thank you, whisper it out loud, wanting something realer than this silent conversation we've just had. He nods and turns away. Then he's back and pressing his lips to mine hard. For just a second, then he runs across the roof, toward where Gaxna's rope was tied to the ventilation shaft. I can't breathe for a second. Then my heart comes back, beating fast. Deshaun slips off the edge of the roof, and I realize distractedly how dangerous that climb is, even for me, that he's risking it for me, and I can't help him down without risking getting seen. I hate this. Hate putting people's lives in danger for something I want. But I have to believe that everyone's lives will be better if I can get Marimes deposed. So I stand on the roofs and count my breaths, icing whatever comes up, watching the sea and the dark ships in the bay. Let it all slide off me, especially what just happened with Deshaun, and focus on what I have to do, why I'm here. I know there's a chance Deshaun won't convince the overseers to go, or the Salem Dale will have come, or any other number of things that will make going back into that warehouse suicide, but I still have to go. What is any of this worth if I have to sacrifice my friends to get it? Ten minutes pass without much sound from below. Maybe they're gone, or maybe they saw through Deshaun's blind and are waiting to kill me. There's no way to know. I ice my anxiety and climb down. The rope is where I left it. I peer down into the warehouse. It's too dim to see much, but the area in front of the vault is clear, except for some scattered crates and the body of the warehouse worker, still unconscious. I untie the rope, swing back and forth above the stacks of crates and boxes till my arc slows. I drop light as rain onto a bale of furs. I don't unhook my rope. There's no way I could stop the end hook from clattering to the floor, and the last thing I need right now is noise. I can buy a new one. I creep down to the floor, press an ear to the door to listen for Gaxna. Still nothing. Maybe she's given up. Maybe she's waiting between the two locked doors, afraid to make a noise because she figured out something's wrong. I pull the square key out and work it into the lock. And it's only by virtue of the blood still smearing the floor that I catch the faintest trace of something behind me, something alive and thinking. I duck left on instinct, and a wooden staff cracks into where my head was. Roll. Come up to find an overseer, armed, stalking me. I can't run. Not now that he knows there's something inside the vault. Besides, I've never been much good at running, really, even if I'm outmatched. I'm a fighter. So I fight. He swings in again and I duck under, knowing going against an overseer is madness, knowing too that I nearly beat Narimes in our sparring, that I've since gained skills the overseer can't know. He chops with a free hand and I seize it, pulling him off balance, trying to kick out a leg. He counters and the battle begins. I do what I can, climbing barrels, throwing things, drawing his staff strikes toward metal edges that might break it, but it's hard without water, hard to guess his moves. So when I clamber up a stack of oak casks from the upper peninsula, once again giving me the high ground and forcing him to climb awkwardly, I kick the barrel chocks out rather than fight. One topples close to his head, but he's too fast to get hit. The barrel smashes into the floor, then a second, a third, and red wine gushes everywhere, barrels bursting into wood and staves. I grab one of these, meeting his blow with a counter, and seek his thoughts in the liquid. They are opaque, with just the slightest hints of intention, but it's something. I keep my blind frozen solid and use the hints against his greater strength, better weapon, and faster blows. It isn't enough. I'm giving ground being fought out of the spreading stain of wine, taking bruising hits to my arms, ribs, and legs. So I push back in the only way I know how, with truth. I shove the memories of Narimes admitting guilt into the water, into his mind. And he gasps, actually stops completely in mid-swing, eyes opening. I take the advantage, swinging in with a blow designed to knock him cold. He manages to block it, but the main force still takes him in the neck, driving him back. I strike again, summoning memories of the criers, proof of the news about my father's heresies being manipulated, shove them into his mind. He again hesitates, and this time I land a solid blow to his chest, knocking him off his feet. 
I leap after, seizing his staff, pushing more memories into him. The merchants pointing to trade manipulation, the dock worker talking of Salem Dale warehouses, the Dale guard admitting they bought up supplies and stockpiled them to depress trade. That Narimes' bride did that, proving a secret collusion. In the end, the overseer is open-mouthed on the floor, shaking his head, his blind and faith tattered enough that I can read his thoughts. The denial and the inability to deny. I press the shattered end of the staff against his throat. There is no move he can make from here that will not first mean his death. Submit, I say through the wine. Roll onto your stomach and submit. Who? What are you? What did you do? I nudge him with a staff and he rolls. I seize a piece of bailing twine and bind his hands. I am Alethea of the Viola, rightful heir to the Ajela Dias, and what I did was show you the truth you refused to see. But there are counsel. They can't... The disbelief, the shock is palpable in his mind. They can and they did. And if you are a true believer, a true loyalist, you will repeat what I've shown you to your age class, to the other overseers, to the temple. The death sentence on me is an admission of guilt. Narimes knows if I'm allowed to live, I will destroy him. I finish tying the knot and move on to his feet. And I will destroy him, with his own lies. But your thoughts, the way you push them into me. I shake my head, though he can't see it. I don't know myself how I do it. That's not important. What's important is putting yourself on the right side of Ujjay and his justice. I will leave you here to think about it. Choose wisely, overseer of Saray. I stride away then, keeping the excitement and disbelief at what I've just done, defeated an overseer safely behind my blind, until I am out from the wine patch. Gexna is pounding now. She must have heard. I grab the key, twist it in the lock, and wait as the strange Dale mechanism does its work. My friend emerges, carrying a long package. Got it, she says, eyes full of victory. Anything happen while I was in there? I step back so she can see the smear of blood, the smashed crates, the overseer bound and gagged on the floor. She just about drops the loot. I shrug. You could say that. 17. I explain it to her after we're out of the building, safely running rooftops back to our new hideout. Whatever she's stolen is long and bulky, wrapped in thick padding, and she moves as though it's made of glass. So you beat up an overseer, she asks at last, and dropped another one off your rope? I did. It's not far to our hideout, but Gaxna is taking a long detour to see if we're being followed. Floods. I thought your fighting skills would be useful in case we saw a guard, but slopping hell, Thea, the hits we could pull off if we didn't have to worry about overseers? Whoa, whoa, I slow on the long wall we're walking. I don't know if I could do it again. What I don't say is that I'm not sure I want to. Inside, I know there's still guilt I iced for hurting the overseer who climbed after me. They're not bad men, just trained to be blindly faithful. A weakness I use to my advantage. Still, flooding hell. And you think the Salem Dale are behind it now? I'm not sure, I say, speech punctuated by jumps as we cross a series of shanty poles. But they're the only source of money that makes sense. And why else would they buy up trade goods and refuse to sell their own unless they were trying to make trade look bad? Makes sense. I leap the last pole, wait for her to cross a long canopy. I still don't know if it was them, or R.I.M., or Narimes that actually killed my dad, but everything tonight confirms I'm on the right track. Though, what the Dale want out of a marriage to the Chosen, I don't know. It's not like they can start preaching craftology or something. Even Narimes wouldn't go that far though he has publicly ordered my death without giving a good reason why. So maybe he would. Gaxna shrugs. Who knows why they do anything? Flood and weird. Wait till you see this thing. She waves the long object she's got wrapped in cloth. Well, it's too much money for them not to have some reason. I slide down a long glazed tile roof after her. Do you know they weren't even trading 30 years ago, and now they're the richest traders in the world? Maybe politics are next. What about the loyalist thing, she asks at the bottom. Did you figure that out from the overseer too? No, I... I don't know why, but I didn't tell her about meeting Deshaun. Thought she wouldn't understand. But I'm slop with words, so there's no lying about it now. One of my friends was with them. He told me. Your friend was hunting you with a pack of overseers? 
doesn't sound like much of a friend. He came to find me, and to help. She passes me the package, then climbs up a boarding house wall, and left an overseer for you when you got down? I pass the package back, it's heavy, then climb. Deshaun didn't do that. He would have drawn them off. They probably just sent one back, or refused to let one go, just in case. Or he helped them set up the trap. I frown. What's your problem? Can't you just believe me when I say he's a friend and I trust him? She sets her jaw. I don't trust anyone from the temple. You trust me. Gaxna doesn't say anything, running along a rooftop instead. I follow her in silence back to the hideout. It's a relief when the rundown building comes into view. I'm exhausted, and all I want is my little pallet in the corner of our walled-off room. Maybe share a clove leaf with Gaxna or some of the fruit we have left from yesterday's market run, then pull the blinds and sleep. Just like the tower had started to feel like home, this place has too. We both have our little rituals around waking up and making food and going to sleep, and I realized that some of the sadness I felt in thinking about going back to the temple with Deshaun was that I'd have to leave this, have to leave our little world. I want to expose the traditionalists, and I want to claim my place in the temple again, but part of me wants to stay here too, make my living stealing things and spend the rest of the time training or doing exactly what we feel like. If the traditionalists weren't evil and the overseers weren't trying to kill me, it would be wonderful. And if a frog could fly, it wouldn't bump its ass when it hopped. I climb down first. Gaxna hands me the package, then climbs after. The room is dark, and I've pretty much decided to go straight to bed when Gaxna freezes halfway in the window. I turn. What? No answer. Gaxon is still as a stone. She's frozen, another voice says from inside the room. A woman's voice. I spin, and in the back corner a shade gets pulled from an oil lantern, revealing a thin woman in a long dress. A therakint. Gaxna makes a muffled sound. I tense, searching the room for a weapon. Calm yourself, Alethea. I mean you no harm. Her knowing my name does nothing to calm me. A broom. I seize it from the corner and stamp the bristles off to make an improvised staff. Who are you, I ask? What are you doing here? The woman raises an eyebrow, unruffled by my broomstick. Why not ask your friend here? Gaxna's head suddenly comes unfroze, and she swivels to glare at the woman. Witch! Something unreadable passes across the woman's face. That is not what you called me when last we met, Gaxana. Gaxna spits. When I lost my eye? The woman flinches. We could have fixed that, could have healed you, but you ran. Fixed me, Gaxna scoffs. You did enough. Gaxana, the woman says, soft, stepping closer to her. You could still come back, still join us. Fear and anger and I don't know what all war on Gaxna's face. I don't need to know it all. I whip the staff between them, train the point on the witch's throat. Step back. Please, the woman says, looking pained. I step back. I emphasize my point with a nudge of the staff, and she steps back, a moment of rage on her face before the icy cool returns. You will need to control that tongue of yours, she says, adjusting her cuffs, if you are ever to make it in the circles. What? But Gaxna is shaking her head. Don't do it, Thea. Don't listen to her. They have ways. They... She cuts off, eyes darting in a frozen face. The woman takes a deep breath, and I keep my staff trained on her. I am exhausted and have no idea what kind of bloodborne she can summon, but I will fight her if I have to. Fight them all. Let us start again, she says, and extends a hand. I am Astresia, of the Sixth Circle of the Therakins Guild. Unfreeze my friend, I say, and we'll start again. She sighs and lets her hand drop. Your friend is not her right self with us, and I am sorry for that, as I am sorry to have to control her like this. I would rather not. But it seems she has not gotten over her anger in the last few years, and you and I have things to discuss. Gaxna's eyes bulge at this, but her mouth and body are still as stone. My skin crawls, seeing the witch's power so plainly. What do you and I have to discuss? A summons, for one thing, Astresia says, sitting on one of the crates and arranging her skirts. We sent one for you days ago, with no response. For me? I thought, I catch myself, get composed. What business would I have with you? I'm no therakent. Estresia smiles at this, a subtle and knowing smile. There is something so feminine in it, so familiar and yet strange, 
that I suddenly feel I have been raised entirely wrongly, that all my years in the temple have failed to teach me who I am. But being female like that has never felt right for me, just like the temple's masculinity never fit either. I am something else, and I've always felt fine with that, proud of it even. But the way Estresia smiles puts all that into question. We have much to discuss, actually, she says, but in proper circumstances. I've come to deliver the summons we thought you might have missed, changing locations as you did. We'd like you to stop by for tea. Another chill runs through me. So they have been tracking us. They know where Gaxna is all the time, or Gaxana? I look at my friend. She's still frozen in place, though I see a tear trailing down one cheek. What is her history with the witches? To talk about what? She smiles that smile again. That is for you and the Ninth to discuss, though I can reveal that we have something you'll want. What? She smooths a section of her sleeves, apparently considering. A letter, she says at last, from your father. I'm so surprised I almost dropped the staff. What? How? She gives a satisfied smile, and I curse myself for not icing my surprise the second it popped up. He knew forces were working against him in his last days, and that no one in the temple would be safe, so he asked us to deliver it to you. A letter from my father. Ujay, every fiber in my body itches for that, but I'm not stupid. What's to say you didn't just forge a letter, or don't have one at all, and just want me to come in? We cannot forge his handwriting, nor the seal of his dais. We will show you at the gates if you wish. There would be no way to fake my father's script or his seal. I know it too well. So you want me to voluntarily surrender myself to you after you attack me with Bloodborne in the streets to give me a letter and have tea and talk about something too mysterious to mention here? Yes. The decision is not difficult. No. Alethea, be reasonable. You're not safe here, nor in much position to bargain, she gestures at Gaxna. I gesture back with my staff. Nor are you. I could kill you well before anyone got here. Don't test me. I've already killed an overseer tonight. She smiles again, only a trifle less certain than before. You are not a killer, and if anything happened to me, your friend would never come out of her freeze. It gets quite uncomfortable after the first few minutes. It could be a bluff. It's probably a bluff. Then I remember something. Gaxna, I say. You're training. You're blind. Breathe. If Gaxna's made the progress I think she has, and my theory that male and female magic are the same basic skills is true, she should be able to block Estresia's control, just as I can block Seer's trying to read my thoughts. Sweat beads on Gaxna's brow, and Estresia's eyebrows raise. The thief's arm moves an inch, then two inches, and her face begins to break into a smile. All the color drains from Estresia's face, and she stands with much less poise than she sat. Three days, she says, stepping to the window. You have three days to seek us out, or we will come for you. She reaches the window, and I realize I have no idea how she got in. It's not an easy climb. And if I still refuse? She smiles, but her words are knives. Then you will learn the price of disobedience. She leans backward out the window and falls. I gasp despite myself and run to the window. Below, two brawny men with the wide stairs of Bloodborne have caught her from a lower window and are pulling her in. Our eyes meet once more, and she nods to me, calm as glass. Eighteen. I curse, pulling myself back into the window. Gaxna unfreezes a moment later and collapses on the floor. Gaxna, are you okay? She doesn't answer, just lies there in the dark shaking. I start forward, then realize that she's crying, that the shakes are giant sobs. I don't know what else to do, so I crawl behind and wrap my arms around her, spoon my body into hers. It's okay, I say, trying to sound reassuring, like my dad would when my mom was sick. We're safe now, it's okay. It's not my friend sobs, voice nasal, tears still pouring out of her. It's not okay. I squeeze her tighter. It is, it is. We have time. Astresia left, and she dropped control of you. We're safe now, for now. The words don't come out right, but they're the best I have. At the mention of the witch, Gaxna just cries harder. I hug her close. 
Her muscles are hard under my touch, her hip round, her body warm where it pushes into me, and I get flushed suddenly. I ignore that, or try to, and focus on my friend, on calming her down. Shh, I say, pulling a blanket over us. Shh. We lie that way a long time, her sobs dying down into little quakes, until everything is quiet except our breathing and the howl of cats in the street. The moon drops low out the window. I'm sorry, she says at last. For what? For, for everything. For being an idiot like this. For bringing her here. For putting you in danger. I shake my head. I'm the one who should apologize. I knew they could track you. I just, I didn't think they wanted me. I was stupid. No, you weren't. But you have to go now. Run. They want you. And when they want someone, they won't stop until they have them. I shrug. Then I'll go to them. Not like they have my blood or anything. I could have knocked that woman out any time. And the pack of bloodborne that chased you that first day? Just a hint of the usual Gaxna sass enters her voice. Can you knock all of them out too? I grimace. Well, maybe not them, but you can't go. The things they do... She shudders, then composes herself. It's suicide. We have to run. This is a conversation we've had before. It's her fear talking. She's still shaking in my arms, and my water sight senses a hurricane of thoughts inside. I shake my head against her back and hug her closer. What did they do to you? She doesn't say anything, and I think maybe even now, maybe even after all we've been through, asking it is going too far, like that first night in her tower, that this is something she'll never talk about. She takes a breath. I started training with them when I was twelve. That's the standard age. You can't work blood until you've had your blood, that's what they say. Mom and I were poor as dogs, living on the back end of Blackwater, and the witches offered a good life, better than I could make selling flowers anyway. I nod, not wanting to break her moment, knowing how hard it is for her to talk about it. And it was at first. I did good at the program. I learned all the letters and numbers they wanted, and scored pretty high in the competitions. They gave us enough spending money that I could bring some home to Mom, though she found a man after a while. We're your new family, the witches said. Your oldest family. Sisterhood. She snorts against me, as much sob as disgust, and goes on. That's where I met Astresia, the witch who came. She was different then, younger, like me. Our age, if you can believe it. I goggle in the dark. Astresia looked ten years older than us, at least. She always did one better than me at the test, but we didn't fight. We, well, we were best friends, even though she was from Old Saray and I'm from the gutters. And then it was more than that. Not just lovers, but, I don't know, just different. Special, somehow. The witches started taking us out, just us two. Giving us private lessons. At the end of the year, we were the only ones they elevated to the second circle. The rest stayed just therals, or washed out to work for the guild. But we were different. We were better. They started teaching us blood sight, practicing on each other. That's how she got my blood. And you... did you learn it too? Could you do it back to her? Gaxna sighs, ribs pressing tight against me. I can read her blood. I'm always reading her blood. Any time, any place, if I concentrate, I can tell where she is, how far she is, how she's feeling, if she's hurt, all of that. Like a flooding parasite in my brain. And she can sense me. But no, I can't control her. Blood pushing, it's called. I didn't stay long enough to learn that. Why not? She sighs again. There was a night. They'd started sending us out on errands, the older sisters blood pushing us, making us into bloodborne to get us used to it. To focus your trust, they'd say. It was little stuff, usually. Running a message, buying a twist of herbs, following someone to see what they were up to. It was kind of fun, though I hated not having control of my body. And then? And then one night they sent me out late, after midnight. I never knew where I was going, what I was doing. That was part of the trust. And I found a monk in the street. A theocrat, I think, though I didn't really know what they were back then. And I... They made me talk to him. Not with words, they can't make you talk, but they got my point across. I was fifteen. He followed me into an alley, and there was a shout, and... She breaks off, and I just hold her close, knowing the rest will come. She takes a deep breath. 
and screams. They were trying to kill him, to shoot him in the alley, but they missed. Or he figured it out. There was fighting all around me and then running, and the whole time they just had me curled up in a little ball. I thought it was done when everybody left. Hope to a J and Jaya it was done. There were three dead people in the alley. Not monks, but like assassins or something. They made me follow the monk. He was bleeding bad, so it was easy. We found him lying half in a fountain down the street, dying. But that wasn't good enough for them. It wasn't complete. There's anger in her voice now. Old anger. The same anger I hear whenever she says the word witches. So they made me kill him. I didn't have any knives or anything, so I had to, to hold him under while he fought. He wasn't strong, he'd already lost so much blood, but it took a long time, him just kicking and splashing, then his body started twitching all over, and they made me keep holding him there still. She breaks off. I don't say anything, stomach twisting at the idea. I've never killed anyone, unless I killed that overseer by accident, but Erte says it's terrible. How much worse if you were being forced to do it, if you had to sit there and watch and feel everything but had no choice in it. I hug her closer. They brought me back after that, washed me off, told me they were sorry, but had been a good girl, a good theracant, and they would raise me to the third circle the next morning. She snorts, and I finally hear the Gax and I know in it. I didn't go. For a week, I stayed in my room. I knew they wouldn't blood push me to the ceremony. I didn't want it. I didn't want any of it. But they knew I had no choice. You can't run from it once you're in. Why not? She shrugs. They have your blood. They can do whatever they want. I shake my head. So what did you do? Tried to run anyway. I wasn't going to let them do that to me again or make me do it to someone else. Nothing was worth that. So I waited until the middle of the night, until most of the witches who had my blood would be sleeping, and I slipped out, or I tried to. The guard stopped me at the door, told me to go back or I'd be forced in. So how did you get out? I feel her belly tighten in a mirthless laugh. Estrige is the one who told me how, actually. She said she heard if you hurt yourself bad enough, if there's enough pain coming through the bond, they can't hold it and you're free. But you have to do it before they take hold or you never will. Ujay. So you stabbed your own eye. She nods. With one of the guard's knives, just shoved my face into it. Anything to get out. I cringe despite myself. I had no idea. She laughs, a little more humor in it now. I think half the guild woke up screaming. The guards dropped too, and I ran out. They let me go. Probably thought I'd have to come back from my eye. It's the only way to get healed in the city, right? Well, I didn't. I would have rather died. I just let it fester, walked the coast past the bay to swim in the ocean, keeping the wound in salt water like my mom told me. She came out and helped me. I got better. And they haven't bothered you since? Oh, they still sent summons. Every week at first. Didn't matter where I went, they knew. They'd send them to me. Even when I ran up Peninsula, spent some time training under the seamstress, they'd find me. Send me another summons. So I'd move on, even though I knew it didn't matter. Finally came back. Figured I might as well be here if they could track me anywhere. Help the other ones like me. She sighs. And that's my whole long sob story. Floods, Gaxna. I never knew. I'm so sorry. For what? It happened. It's done now. You move on. Except you can't because the witches are following me. She sighs, heavy and deep in her chest. Yeah, because they're following you. She rolls over then, tangling the blanket and bringing us face to face. We can't stay here, Thea. I'm sorry, but we can't. All they need is to get one drop of your blood and you'll never get out. I'll put out my eye, I say, though I'm not sure if I could. They'll still get you, take you back, make you theirs. I couldn't, I can't let that happen. There's a fire in her eyes, something more than the anger and pain from before. Gaxna? Alethea, she says. Thea. I'm suddenly aware of her body again, pressing against me, our legs tangled beneath the covers. She takes my face and pulls me in, and I'm only startled for a moment. Then I kiss her back just as hard. Nineteen. Things are a little awkward in the morning. Not with me. I knew exactly what I was doing, realized that I'd been wanting it for a while. 
but Gaxna wakes up next to me and kind of jumps out of bed, muttering about being hungry or starting coals or something, and before I know it all her clothes are on and she's lighting a clove leaf and climbing out the window. Hey, I say, when I'm dressed and get up to the rooftop. You okay? Yeah, of course. Why? I take her hand. Gaxna, we... Something happened last night, and you can't pretend it didn't. I don't want you to. I kiss her again in broad daylight to make my point. She blushes, but doesn't pull away. And when I'm done, her expression is softer. I... Floods, I don't know what I'm doing, Thea. The last time I got involved with someone... She looks away and pulls hard at the clove leaf. Well, you know. I take her hand. I'm not Astresia. I'm not going to force you to join some cult, and I'm not going to stand by while you get hurt. She blows smoke, still gazing at the sea. It's just too similar somehow. You teaching me the breathing, the temple after you like the witches were after me. She sighs and turns back. I don't want to make the same mistakes again. I can't. I don't think I could take it. My heart lurches. I don't want to lose her, lose this thing that we just now started that we should have done weeks ago. But more than that, I don't want to hurt her, so I force myself to say it. We don't have to do this. If you can't stay anymore, or if this is too hard or whatever, you can go. You should. No, she growls, squeezing my hand. I'm not leaving you. But this is what happened with Astresia. She wouldn't leave the guild even after what happened. Just like you won't leave the temple even though they're trying to kill you. Some of them are trying to kill me. The other ones have my back. They want justice just as much as I do. Justice, Gaxna snorts, fragrant smoke puffing from her nose. One woman's justice is another's villainy. That's what the witches used to say. What if your dad was evil? Did you ever think of that? What if the traditionalists had good reasons for getting him off the dais however they did it? If he was, then I need to know it. Find out the truth. And then I will walk away. But not before. She doesn't say anything, pulling on the clove leaf again. The sun is already high in the sky, cutting everything in sharp detail. I find myself wishing for the darkness again, for the simplicity of Gaxna's touch. It's the letter, she says at last. You want to know what's in the letter, don't you? Of course I do, I say, taking the clove leaf from her, pulling on it though it makes me cough. I didn't talk to my dad much the last few years. Students aren't supposed to talk to full seers, really, and even though he was the chosen, he didn't break the rules for me. It still hurts when I say it, still makes me angry, but I realize with the start I don't resent him for it the way I used to. Maybe he had his reasons. So yes, I want to know what he wrote to me. Floods yes. Gaxna takes the clove leaf back. If it's real, do you really buy the witch's story? I want to. And if they lied about it, my hands clench into fists, then Ujay helped them. Gaxna whistles. Slops, I actually almost want to see that. But you know it'd be suicide. I don't know that. Well, I know it. Did you not hear my whole sob story last night? Yes, I say. But I also saw you start to break Astresia's control on you with the little practice you've had and I know that I'm one of the best water blinds in the temple. You saw how afraid she got when you started moving. What's it going to do to them when they try it and I don't even budge? That's when they send the Bloodborne after you. Which I easily outran weeks ago before I even knew about the roofs. She sighs and grinds the clove leaf out. I'm not going to convince you, am I? Probably not. Then hear me out, at least. Your dad's not going anywhere. Nerimace isn't going anywhere. They'll still be here in a year, but by that time the overseers will have forgotten about you, the witches will have moved on, and you can do what you need to without risking getting killed. A year? What would I do for a year? I can't think past a day, in my meeting with R.A.M. What would we do, she says, taking my hand again. We'd travel, see the castles of Bamani, the gladiator pits in Dura, floods, climb the Salem Dale Mountains, maybe, or go visit your home tribe on the northern coasts. See the world, Thea. Together. It sounds wonderful. And impossible. They'd still find me. They'd track you, and I still have violet eyes. Not anymore. Sell what we got last night, and we can do it. Get your eyes changed, and you're invisible. And the witches don't care about me. I think they've finally used me up. She rubs at her empty socket. As soon as I'm out of the city, they'll forget about me. And we'll be free. Ujay, it's tempting. I love the life we have together. 
I might even love Gaxna. The electricity of her touch is overwhelming, like what I felt from Deshaun times a hundred. What did he ask me last night? What's worth more than us being together? I bite my lip. What did we steal, anyway? She gets up. You want to see? It's a tall collection of glass tubes, bound in brass, filled with colored liquids and smaller glass balloons. I squint at it. What is it? Gaxna shrugs. A barometer, they call it. Supposed to be able to predict the weather. I turn my squint to her. Predict the weather? Nobody can do that. The Salem Dale can. That's how they sail so far in those ships. Every one of them has one of these, apparently, but they haven't been willing to sell it, and nobody can figure out how to build them just by looking. So someone's going to pay a lot of money for this. I look back at the thing. I wouldn't pay ten coins for it. And you know this someone? My patron does. And the sooner it's out of our hands, the better. She stands, then pauses. You never really answered me about leaving. My guts heave. I hate both options and feel committed to both options. I need some time to think about it. The witches said we have three days. She works at her collar. Two now. Less if we want to escape without them noticing. Well, give me one at least. She draws a deep breath and nods. One day. One day to decide my life. Twenty. I feel like I'm ripping in half. We eat breakfast, or lunch now, sausage and figs left over from last night. Gaxna carefully doesn't say anything else about my plans, and I carefully don't bring it up, but it hangs between us like fog. This is why I never got into relationships back in the temple, because I knew they'd only complicate things, that my life is hard enough as it is. I know what I need to do. It's the same as I've always needed to do. Find the truth. Find my father's killer and expose the traditionalists. Get my home back. The way to do it is different now. Instead of rising through the ranks of seers and finding out what happened from inside the temple, I'm doing it from the outside. I don't know if I'll ever be a seer now, or if the temple can go back to how it was, but I have to try. From the outside now. There's just one thing left to do. Meet with Ariam. If it turns out like I expect, no one will be able to deny the traditionalists bribed, lied, and murdered their way to power, whether they were in control or the Salem Dale were. Half of me is dying to shove this in their faces. But the other half of me, the deeper half, glows every time Gaxna looks at me, melts at every touch, asks Deshaun's question deep inside. What is life for, all this questing for truth and justice, if it means turning down happiness? A year traveling with Gaxna would be bliss. We would be loaded to the gills with money, seeing the whole world, and we'd have each other, with no one threatening to kill us or seize control of our bodies. It would be glorious. Except that I'd never forgive myself. So I keep ripping in half. After lunch, we pull on disguises, Gaxna going for an older Bamani woman, and me putting on a porter's garb. There's a moment when I have my shirt off and she's only half-dressed, and we almost don't get anywhere, but I pull away, and she doesn't question it. I need clear-headedness right now, clarity, and every time I touch her, I get rich fuzziness instead. I find out I can't ice these feelings either. It just doesn't work. Maybe that's why most seers only take mistresses, never wives. There's something I need to do today, I say, someone I have to meet. Her gray eye is unreadable. A witch? R I am. She pops a knuckle. We could go to the stainer instead. Fence this barometer and get you safe first. You go. Fence it and meet me back here. I just... I feel like my head will be a lot clearer once I find out what's going on. She presses me close. Be careful, okay? Always. Saray is the same as it's ever been. Markets crowded with afternoon shoppers and patched canvas awnings flapping in the breeze. I take the rooftops, streets too dangerous despite my disguise. Every overseer in the city has to be looking for me now, if they weren't before. Floods, I fought one of them last night, and cut another one off a rope thirty feet in the air. Then again, the worst thing they can do is kill me, and they were already planning to do that. The Crier's Guild House is a long, squat thing a few blocks up from the Blackwater. It's still early afternoon, so I settle onto a sheltered rooftop across the street to wait, thawing my emotions from last night with careful breathing. 
A few criers work the front of the guild house, their news troubling. Salem Dale invention stolen. Merchants Guild denies involvement. Authorities cracking down. But it's the last one that gets to me. Overseers killed. A cold hammer hits my stomach. The fall couldn't have killed that overseer, right? And I know I didn't kill the second one. But hearing this over and over all afternoon rattles my nerves. It's all I can do from climbing down and confronting the criers, bribing them to hear the truth. I keep my peace instead. Ariam is more important, a hooded man who walks like his hips hurt. I finally see him as the sun is touching the tops of the buildings. It's not a hood so much as a cowl, hiding his whole face, but there's no mistaking the walk. He doesn't strike me as old, but he moves stiffly, like every joint in his body aches. I slip down the rope I've tied in an alley, try to remember my disguise as I cross the street, remember my plan. I ice anticipation three times on the way across the street. Excuse me, I say, taking him by the sleeve. I'm looking for a man named Arayim. The hood turns toward me, and I get a quick impression of a youthful, bearded face. Then he punches me in the chest and starts running. It's so unexpected I almost lose my feet, but the forms are too deep in my bones for that. I sprint after him. Fortunately, he runs like he walks, jerkily, and I gain on him quickly. People seem to get in my way more than usual, a foot here, a bulky porter there, but I duck and weave and use some of the new balance I've learned running roofs to get past them. I need to end this chase quickly and privately. Learning what Ariam knows won't do me any good if overseers find us and put a knife in my back. I leap over an old woman who suddenly stumbles, squeeze through two swerving carts, and finally lay a hand on him. I throw myself to the left, using wave strike stone to spin him around me and into a crevice between two buildings. He gets up quickly, but not before I am on him, praying we didn't make much of a scene in the street. I will have to do this quickly. Who are you? I growl, kneeling on his arms and seizing his throat. And who paid you to bribe the criers? He says nothing. Wide, panicked eyes stare up at me, and in another moment the water sight comes up blank. Not the intentional absence of a water blind, just blank. I've felt this before somewhere. I narrow my eyes, pressing down against his wild attempts to rise. The bloodborne in the streets, the day after I escape the temple. Bloodborne read blank like this in water sight, and they have the same wide, panicked eyes. Shock makes me lose my grip. Ariam's not a Salem Dale, or some upcountry traditionalist I've never heard of. He's a bloodborne, which means he's being controlled by a witch. Who are you? I snarl, grabbing him again and shoving down harder. Why are you doing this? He starts to choke, and I remember Gaxna saying the witches can't make bloodborne speak. I'm also not pressing hard enough to make him choke, so they must be doing it, making him choke himself. Ujay, I curse, leaping off him. I can't learn anything from this man, and I won't be responsible for his death. Go! Don't kill him, you witch! Go! The bloodborne turns to me, as if uncertain, but I have a staff in my hands. Whoever is controlling him, she probably realizes her bloodborne will be no match for me, despite our difference in sizes. The thing called Ariam turns and runs. I stumble the other way, then climb the wall, head spinning. The witches control Ariam? Which means they bribed the criers to proclaim my father a heretic? And they floated the merchants to keep them in business? What's their connection to Narimes and Yale at? More importantly, what did they have against my father? I leap a gap between rooftops, then balance along the long eave of the Dyer's guild house. It doesn't make any sense. Getting rid of the witches is one of the core tenets of traditionalism. Why would the witches help them take the temple? And where did they get the money for all that? Unless they're both in the pockets of the Salem Dale? I walk the railing of a high balcony, then jump and catch the roof of the opposite wall. But what would the Dale want from the witches? They're marrying into the temple, not the Therakin's guild. And most importantly, why would the witches help the temple? They're sworn enemies. I don't know. I don't have the answers to any of these questions, but I know who does. The Therakin guild. I need to know what they know. I'm sorry, Gaxna, I whisper as I change my course. She would feel so betrayed if she knew. But this is where the evidence leads and I need to know more than I need love or safety or any of the happiness I've found out here. At least, 
I think I do. The ripping I've been feeling all day tears deeper. This might not be a wound we can heal, but I think we both already have some of those. We'll get through it. And this is the only way I'll know if there's any reason to stay here and keep fighting the traditionalists. If there isn't, I'll be free to go with her, to travel like she talked about. My heart beats at the thought. And if there is, I'll have everything I need to destroy my father's killers. Twenty-one. The Therakin's Guild squats in Old Saray like a giant rose beehive, rows of windows and arches spiraling inward to a giant domed peak. It was once a theocrat's palace, like the rest of the buildings in Old Saray. Each new chosen would commission a new palace for the glory of Ujjay, forcing the faithful to build while living in the mud and clay hovels that became New Saray. It's ironic now that the sworn enemies of the theocrats occupy the last and largest of these palaces, built of rose quartz mined hundreds of miles away and hauled here in caravans, centuries before the construction of the Ironway. I am in the streets, porter's cap low to hide my eyes, though there are few overseers or even people out in this part of the city. The guild house is an exception, buzzing with activity next to the serene mansions of Saray's elite. Women in long skirts pass in and out, supplicants come from all over the peninsula to wait for healing, and waterfalls splash down from verandas, where stately women dabble feet in the water and gaze down at the city. I avoid their gazes. They likely know I'm coming anyway, have spotted me and let each other know, but I hold on to my last minutes of freedom. I'm confident in my fighting skills, in my ability to climb and escape, and my resistance to their blood magic, but still there's something intimidating about the place, something powerful and alien about the way the witches walk, like the proud posture of the monks, but softer, understated, as if they have no reason to flaunt their power, and therefore flaunt it all the more. I pull the staff from my back. The outer walls have been carved down to a breezy latticework. I pass within, keeping my breaths deep and regular. A girl approaches me almost immediately, dressed in muslin like the other students in the yard, but with a few traces of embroidery on the chest that must mark rank. Alethea Viola? I start. It's been a long time since I heard that name. I am, I say, summoning the posture of a seer, the posture Gaxna has been teaching me to change while in disguise in the city. No reason to hide it here. Mender Temerana, she says in return, and turns towards the palace, expecting me to follow. I don't. I'm not an idiot. Neither is she. She stops after a few paces and walks back to where I stand in the middle of the front courtyard, fountains splashing and supplicants milling about, many of them gravely ill. I don't like disease, don't like the ever-present threat of plague, but I'm still safer here than inside their palace. The letter, Temerana says flatly. You want to see the letter? I do, I say, before I go anywhere near that building. She sighs and returns inside. They must have expected my resistance, for just a few minutes later a pack of dark-faced women come out, swords on their backs, dressed in leather armor over skirts and vests. The Therakint Guard. I've heard of them, but never seen one. They surround me in a tight circle, hands on weapons. I deepen my breathing, icing the tension. I am ten times the fighter these women are, but there are sixteen of them, and they don't have the letter. Temerana comes with it a minute later. Temerana and another woman, older, black eyes sharp in her lined face. Miara Shalohe of the Eighth Circle, she says by way of introduction, short like the whole thing is a waste of time. You wanted proof. I nod. The old woman pulls a bamboo case from her purse, opens it to reveal a roll of parchment sealed in black wax. I lean in, and the nearest guards draw swords. That's close enough, one barks. It is. Close enough to see the seal, anyway. It's my father's, the curling water-to-steam symbol he chose on elevation, so familiar from the thick ring he wore on his middle finger. Alethea is written on the outside in his bold hand. Give it to me. With time, Miara says, again as though resenting the breath the words take. It is not safe here. I'm not going further. Miara raises an eyebrow, glancing at the circle of guards. I do not see that you have much choice. I lean the bare side of my foot into the ground and push my consciousness out. Earth is a poor transmitter of thought unless it is soaked, but the fountains here keep their soil moist, as does the grass. 
Sex, hunger, father, itch, I snap in rapid succession, pointing to each of the guards as I read them, giving their current thoughts word. Monk, spear, dog, temple, tooth. With each word comes a gasp, a widening of eyes, as they realize I have read their minds. Position chosen, I finish, pointing first to Temurana, then Miara. Your minds are an open canvas to me, woman, and I am trained in the temple's martial arts. I could take the letter now if I wanted. It's a bluff, but the sword points waver. Temurana gasps. Miara, for her part, looks undisturbed. You might, she nods, but you would not escape. That much I promise you. And we have more to tell you than a letter can. I do not doubt that they could stop me. That their play is always having more power than they use. Like the witches quietly observing marketplaces and the threat they've held over Gaxon's head the last three years. But it's curiosity that keeps me from grabbing the letter and running. Maybe they do have something I need to hear. At the very least, I want their take on the threat my father posed at the end of his reign, and whether that was real or played up somehow. That, and I'm dying to ask them about R.A.M. Then we go in, I say simply, dropping my staff butt to the ground. I find myself in need of some tea anyway. Miara turns and the guards part, allowing us passage into the palace, though a few still trail behind. The inside is simple, white polished floors and walls, rooms with patients and witches and small antechambers where worried families wait. The place smells of soap and smoke and lavender oil, and under that, of vomit and raw meat. Moans and wails echo down the long hall, and blood runs from beneath a closed door we pass. Miara steps neatly over it, like a cat, and we take a side set of stairs at the back. The upper floor is as rich as the lower is sterile. Vibrant tapestries line the walls, water babbles over intricate statues, and diffusers send sheets of mist that catch the afternoon sunlight, mixing with cedar incense in a warm haze. Miara strides on, never slowing, past groups of women gathered on cushions or soft carpets, sharing cups of tea or listening while older women talk at length. Lessons, then, though they look nothing like temple classes. We stop at an arched doorway, opening beaded to let the air move through. Wait here, Miara snaps. Teme, fetch tea. White, I think, with anise and cardamom. I'll gather the others. Tamarana scurries away, and the old woman turns to me. Mind yourself, you're a guest here, and few are allowed even this high. Five minutes. They leave. Cushions are arrayed around a low teak table, a window on the far side letting in a whiff of ocean breeze. I choose a cushion that keeps my back to the wall, sit, and focus my breathing. There is nothing now but readiness. I will not let these women intimidate me. They file in three hundred breaths later, skirts and skins in all shades, but each bearing that same glowing, grandmotherly cast to their lined faces, as though each year they get older makes them healthier instead of the opposite. Estresia comes last her weathered face looking positively youthful next to the other women, but she stands apart with Tamarana along the wall. There is still one cushion open, and the witches stand in a circle behind their cushions, apparently waiting for someone. I stay sitting, to hell with these women and their customs. The standing women stay calm as glass, but I notice their eyes darting at each other and at me. It takes a minute to remember they have no way of communicating, that they're not holding the sort of silent watersite conversations that fill our days at the temple. In the next moment, I wonder if there is a bloodside equivalent, if they speak to each other through awareness of each other's bodies, but it can't be the same. The final witch comes two hundred some breaths later, back straight and face unspeakably ancient, as though she's had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and watched them all grow old and die and learned from every moment of it. Sit, she snaps even less patient in tone than Miara. They sit, and the cutting glance one of them gives me leaves no doubt as to how rude my already sitting is. I ignore it. Temurana scuttles in a moment later, tea tray rattling, and lays it on the low teak table, before offering a cup to the youngest of the ancient women gathered there. The woman in turn offers a cup to the woman next to her, and they continue around the circle like this, skipping me, until an ancient woman with a cloud of white hair offers the most ancient one a cup of steaming tea, fingers steady as a clockworker's on the delicate porcelain. No one offers me tea, but there's one cup remaining on the table. I take it and pour myself a serving, to hisses and grunts and muttered skirt rearrangings all around. 
The water is lava hot, and I set it on the stone before me to cool, as others have done. Now then, the eldest says, let's get this over with, shall we? Alethea Viola, I am Regiana Shearjay, head of the Ninth Circle and matron of this hen party of a guild house. Girls? I almost laugh at calling the centenarian faces around me girls, but they nod gravely and introduce themselves, one after the other, with more formality than Regiana did. I like the old woman instinctively, despite myself. When they're done, Regiana turns to me. I'm not going to beat around the bush. You're here to study with us. What? I recover my cool a moment later, icing the surprise. This is not what I expected. You're here to study with us, the old woman repeats, her silver-laced locks hanging unornamented nearly to the floor. We know things you need to learn. I lace my fingers. I appreciate the offer, but I'm not here to become a Theracant. I'm here because I have questions I want answered. First, who is R.I.M., and why are you working with the traditionalists? Confused looks meet my question, but it could be a bluff. I grit my teeth, wishing we were in water, that I could just read these women. Never heard of him, Regiana says. Your agent, the one you used to bribe the criers into lying about my father's heresy. The one who passed money to merchants so they wouldn't go bankrupt during the trade slump. Don't deny it. I have proof from the criers and the merchants, and I caught R.A.M. last night. He's bloodborne, under your control. I know you know this. Miara glances around the room. Nonsense. We clearly know nothing of the sort. And whatever plots you have concocted in your head, girl, they mean little to us. We had no special love for your father, but we certainly would have never helped the traditionalists into power. Think about it. I have thought about it. And the annoying thing is, I agree with her. It doesn't make sense to me either, I say, but the man was bloodborne, and therefore clearly your agent, unless there are witches outside the guild who can make bloodborne. They hiss at the word witches, but I don't care. Miara sets her teacup down with a clink. There are none, girl, and though we have invited you here with good intentions, mind that you do not offend us. Perhaps you misread the man, Regiana says. He sounds like an agent of the temple. Could he have simply been putting up a water blind? I know what a water blind feels like, I grit, even as a seed of doubt grows in me. Nothing about R.A.M. being a witch agent makes sense, but I know what I read. He was bloodborne. Be that as it may, Regiana says, sipping from a steaming cup. We know nothing of this R.A.M. I reach my hand across the circle. Fine, prove it to me. Prove that you know nothing of him and everything I just said. It won't take long to read you. The head witch watches me with cool eyes. Then to the muffled gasps of the others reaches her papery-skinned arm across the circle and grips my hand. Her mind is wide and deep, like looking over a cliff edge to find a valley circling with birds. Ariam, I say, focusing on the front of her thoughts. Confusion registers, and there are memories of a young man long ago with that name, but no knowledge of a bearded, blood-born man, or any related thoughts of criers and merchants. Her thoughts begin to spin off into what I'm trying to accomplish, in fears of the temple, and worries about her sisters. I let go of her hand, decent enough to let her thoughts be private. There's nothing there. You see, then? Regiana asks, unruffled. I bite my lip. Yes, but it had to be one of them. Let me read someone else. You! I look to Miara. Her face is a thundercloud. You seek to command what you do not understand, child. Regiana bears all of our blood. If any of us know anything, she knows it too. The others nod at this, and I feel like when someone strikes left instead of right, knocking me off balance. It doesn't make sense, but fine. Give me the letter then. We will speak our peace first, Miara says, knuckles white on her teacup. I have made this woman angry. Good to know. I keep mine ice deep. Under what authority do you keep it from me? These are the kind of words the overseers use. Reminding them of my connection to the temple can't hurt. We're not keeping it from you, child, Regiana says, eagle eyes cutting into me. We are telling you you're not ready for what it says. So you've read it. We've read you, Estrigia says, or I have at least. You're angry and impulsive. Those are not the emotions the city needs right now. She hasn't answered my question. I guess I will have to speak like a first-year trainer to these women. Have you read the letter? We have not, Miara says, if you must know. But you are too important to get killed wandering around the city. Gaxana was a clever student, but she cannot protect you from the overseers. 
I can take care of the overseers, I say, with a glance at Estresia. I told her last night that I killed an overseer. The others likely know now, have put it together with the day's news, though Uje send that the news isn't true. Regiana lifts her tea and sips. It's a simple gesture, but somehow it carries weight, commanding my attention. This may not be a lesson they teach you in the temple, she says when she is done, but it's never about you. Not really. And the mind's attempts to make it about you, about your ability to handle overseers or your reasons for coming here or your expectations, are always a distraction from what is true. They actually teach us something very similar to that, but I don't give her the satisfaction of knowing it. And what is true? The truth is our city is in danger, Miara says, and you are the key to saving it. I frown. I'm the key to changing the temple, maybe, and restoring its service to the city, but all of Saray? How? You have heard of Narimes' marriage, Miara says, not quite a question, that he plans to wed the Ojela Dias to a Salem Dale. And of his calls for a return to J Fundamentals, Regiana adds, what he means is a return to the time when the temple ruled Saray entirely, the time of theocrats and peasants, before we rose and struck a balance of power. He would sweep Therakins from the city, a third woman says, plump and red-faced. Replace us with Salem Dul craftology. Trinkets! These people worship trinkets! How can those save us from the flood? Miara puts a hand on the woman's arm. Feel about them as we may. It is no lie that the Salem Dale in the last two decades have gone from an isolated string of cities high in the mountains to a major coastal force, with their own ports in Dura, Bamani, and Idroads among the pearls where no outside ship has landed before. Saray is one of the few old polities that stands. I've heard this before, that the Salem Dale are taking over, but I hear it from the same people who clamor after their technology, blacksmiths working their improved forges, Dura chandlers trading along their iron way, likely soon from sailors using barometers. I remember a favorite expression of Verte's. Does the steam from your cup die when it becomes a cloud? Change is inevitable. Suffering comes from denying that. Don't lecture us with Ujjay truisms, Regiana snaps. Salem Dale politics have real consequences for real people. They would not be making this move if it wasn't tied to their beliefs, or to some knowledge they have of the next deluge which means they will be trying to convert us to their beliefs, or making trinkets that do it for them. And there are no wars like religious wars. My hands go cold. You think the city would convert to worshipping things? No one is really sure what the Dale believe, but most agree it centers around praying to their own inventions. Some would, Miara says, and then perhaps there would be a backlash, something the temple could encourage while we cleaned up the casualties, enough to upset the balance of power. And that is what we do fear, Regiana says, that the temple is creating this whole mess in order to capitalize on it for their own good. Because you can't see a way to turn it for your good? No, the woman cracks, like a beast handler's whip. Therakints do not seek power, child. It is in our oaths. We seek health, peace, and prosperity, all of which will be threatened if any single force gets an upper hand in survey. The only reason the city has survived this long, prospered this long, is because we have kept the monks in check, and vice versa. With us gone, the temple will get ahead of itself, and we will have a return to the old days. You've likely already seen some of this since your father passed. I think of my classmates, more concerned for political position than studying the craft. Overseers seeking bribes from the guilds. Seers too busy to meet with supplicants. Narimes whipping up resentment against the Theracans. Recent changes in the temple have not been good, but I still don't trust these women and their claims to be doing it for peace and prosperity. I haven't forgotten Gaxon's story. I may have. Imagine, then, if they didn't have the threat of an entire city of Bloodborne to hold them back. If the Therakin's guild were gone, imagine what Narimes would do. We don't have to imagine, Miara says coldly. He's announced it in his preachings. A return to classical Ujjayism and a firm hand to deal with the growing Therakin threat, and his theocrats eat it up like sweetmeats. Are you a growing threat? Is there no truth to the accusations? Aside from Ariam, this is what I've come here to ask, to find out how or why the Therakins were suddenly a threat in the lead-up to my father's death, when they never had been before, and why my father was blamed for it. A few of the women glance at Regiana, who takes a long sip of her tea before answering. The truth is made by the threat. 
We have always wanted only to keep the balance, to keep the peace, that people might come to Saray from all over to get healed and to seek insight from our therapies. But when we heard of the temple mobilizing against us, we had to respond in kind. I shake my head. What mobilizing? The temple did nothing of the sort, at least not during my father's time. Regiana sighs. As I said, the threat made the truth. We know now that the mobilization was a lie fed to us to make us worried, to put us on the defensive, that Narimes might then point to us as a threat and discredit your father for allowing it to happen. We were duped. The word comes bitter from her mouth. And now we need all the groundwork we laid then if we are to stay strong in the face of the temple in the Salem Dale. So you were never a threat? My heart beats fast. They were lied to, of course. I couldn't believe it of my father, no matter what Gaxna thought. And this will be a crucial piece of evidence in exposing the plot against my father. Who duped you? How? The theocrats, little one, Miara says. Or just Narimes, working with the Salem Dale. We're not sure, but they discovered my spy and fed him the lies they wanted us to hear. Confirmation. I almost jump up and walk out right there. Proof from the Therakin's own mouths that it was a setup. My father wasn't weak against the Therakin threat. There was no Therakin threat. Only traditionalist lies. See what the overseers think when they read this memory. Only I don't walk out, because there is a threat now. Taking down the council is going to mean dealing with the Salem Dale too, whatever they're planning. And I have a feeling I'm going to need these women to do it. Twenty-two. I take another sip of tea, icing my excitement to keep a clear head. I will have a lot of de-icing to do when this is all done. Why didn't you expose these lies when you found out? Pay the criers to shout it from every square. Miara makes a pained face. We could not expose it without showing weakness. No, I say. I see through that, see through all their careful words. That's not the whole truth. And these women need a kick in the ass if they're going to be any help. You mean you could not expose it without showing fear. That's all I see here. Fear of the temple, fear of the Salem Dale, fear of looking weak, instead of standing in your power. Exactly, a narrow woman cries, smacking a fist into her hand. We need to stand in our power. We can raise an entire city of bloodborne, and yet we sit here wringing our hands. The room splits. It's only a momentary thing, only something I see because I have kept my breathing, because I'm not distracted by my own emotions. For a moment, half the women there wear the same fierce expression, and the others frown, disagreeing. Then it's all gone under those neutral grandmotherly masks and Regiana offers me a smile. Some of us believe in a more moderate course, dear. And that is? A city united behind us, with you as the moon that turns the tides. Regiana was one of those who frowned. What do I have to do with it? You are the bridge between us, dear. Daughter of the rightful chosen who chose to leave the temple, I was thrown out. Eyebrows raise at my interruption, but she goes on unperturbed. Well, you didn't really want to stay, did you? Either way, after you have studied with us a while, you can convince the public of the justice of our cause. Be the bridge between our two factions. Prove the temple is overstepping its bounds, and that we ought to have more control over the city, not less. Ah, I say, so you do want power. A balance, Regiana says, the balance we had that's now slipping. You've seen the packs of overseers in the streets, the way they are intruding into people's homes with the excuse of looking for you. How soon till Nerimes uses other excuses, or doesn't need an excuse? The temple needs a check to its power. Miara shifts at this, and I guess that she and her friends disagree with Regiana. They want to use the Bloodborne somehow. What did the narrow woman say? An entire city of Bloodborne. I ice a shiver of fear and focus. I still don't see what this all has to do with me. No, Regiana says, smoothing a fold over her legs. That is your ego speaking again. The question is, what do you have to do with all this? Fine, I say. And? And you are the only woman, the only person, who will have been through both trainings, who can use both types of sight, who is of both sides, and who has a legitimate claim to the Ojala Dias besides. I frown. I can't use blood sight. I'm a seer. Some of the Therakins shift at this. In name, at least, the plump woman says. Surely you don't, you can't use much male magic. I raise an eyebrow. You just saw me do it. 
You are a seer, yes, Regiana says, but you are also a Therakant. My brows are still up. In what way am I a Therakant? I've trained since I was seven years old to read water, to find insight and to fight. I am the opposite of a Therakant. At this, Regiana smiles, in that same untouchably feminine way Astrija did last night. I do not know how you are both, dear, but you are. We have ways of knowing. Prove it. At this, Regiana nods to the plump woman, who assumes a professorial air. Have you ever felt the emotions of your friends, girl? Any moments where you knew what they were feeling without them telling you outright? I shrug. I don't have many friends. Enemies, then, Astrija puts in. What about Gaxana? I laugh. I wish. Half the time I have no idea what she's thinking. Feeling, the plump woman corrects. A Theracant reads feeling, not thought. I shake my head. Not for the first time I miss the water of the temple, the easy awareness I had of everyone around me. I'm blind here, especially in this room with these strange women. What about location, then? The plump one asks again. Is there anyone you've known a long time, someone you feel like you could always point to, whether or not you've been told where they are? Deshaun. I know it before she's even done talking. I've always sort of been specially aware of him. If I concentrate, I can even point to him. Right now he's to the south and west, in the temple. But of course he's in the temple. Where else would he be? It doesn't prove anything. Maybe. Regiana sighs. Tamarana? The muslin-skirted student appears from just outside the door. Go and fetch us a girl. Type three, I think. I shake my head. I don't know what you're trying to do, but I'm not a Theracant. I'm a seer. A good one. You can't be both. Miara raises her eyebrows. Can't you? You're a woman and a seer, something thought impossible twenty years ago. Tamarana is back a moment later, with a scared-looking girl of about ten behind her, in the first awkward phases of growth. Miara gestures her over and the girl comes, cowed. Blood, girl. The girl extends an arm, and Miara makes a strange fist, with one knuckle extended. I notice the ring on that finger now, a thick band with a wicked hook coming from it. A blood hook, what the Theracans use to take samples from their patients. Temple tales are full of witches appearing from midnight alleys, jabbing you in the arm and forcing you to do their will. Miara pricks the girl with a practiced motion, a single bead of red appearing on her inner arm, where I notice there are other pinprick scars. She gestures toward me. That one. Go. A wave of revulsion hits me. What am I supposed to do with it? I don't actually know how Theracans take in blood. Miara shares an amused glance with the other women. Your tongue. Just touch it. The girl holds out her arm, eyes fearful behind a mask of obedience. My gorge rises. The last thing I want to do is lick this girl's blood. But they are still watching. Best to have this over with. I do it, one quick swipe, but there's no denying the water sight that happens in the moment my tongue touches her skin. The million thoughts running through this poor girl's head, the fear of the witches, interesting, she calls them witches, and memories of her mother and confusion and wonder at who I am. Then the copper tang of blood is in my mouth and she's backing away, but something's different, like I'm still holding her arm. The women watch me with hawk eyes. Do you feel her? Pure resistance makes me say no. But I do. At least, I feel what it's like to be her. Because I know. Because I remember being a cowed girl in a temple full of men, worrying about everything, worrying why my dad left me there, forced to do endless hours of meditation and chores and studies, and that deep knot of worry and sadness deep inside. I'm crying. I ice the feelings, whatever they are, the compassion for this girl, and look up. Miara wears a victorious expression, as though she's already won, but the plump woman butts in again. Concentrate on your heartbeat, she says. Do you hear it? Of course I do, I snap. Anger is a great cover for sadness. Just yours? I frown but listen, and gasp. There's another heart beating alongside mine. The girls. The circle breaks into smiles. They are leaning in to offer me congratulations, but I shake them off, shake off the brief flashes of water sight their touches give me. I want none of it. Her name, I say. What's that? Someone asks. Her name, I growl, fists clenching. It's wrong to feel this girl inside me, wrong to have forced her in here, wrong to have knowledge of her like this. It's all wrong. So at the very least, I'm learning her name. What is her name? 
The women glance around. Yellen, the plump woman supplies at last. Theral Yellen, a second year. Theral Yellen, I vow to seek her out later, to learn everything I can of her, to apologize. But there are bigger things at the moment. What does this mean? How long will I feel her? Regiana is the only one not smiling, the only one who seems to understand how this feels. You will feel her for life, girl. That is the gift and the curse of a Theracant. We feel everyone we've touched. Congratulations and welcome, Miara says from across the circle. You are one of us now. And a strong one, the plump woman nods, to feel a heartbeat so fast. I feel sick. As your mother was, another says. She passed the test, you know. My mother? Confusion intrudes on my anger. We offered her training, Regiana says, though she ultimately declined. She would have felt you all the days of her life. There is no bond tighter than that between mother and child. My mother, a Theracant? It's too much. I lurch up. I need some space, some time. The woman next to me lays a hand on me, and her thoughts are 100% patronizing. The sight is disorienting at first, dear, she says. Take as long as you need. Anger claws out of the confusion inside me. I won't need long, I grit, stalking out of the room, trying to ice everything. It won't ice. Temerana is in the hall. She points fearfully to a room across the way, mercifully empty. My mother? Testing for the Theracans? What would she think of me doing this? What will Gaxna think? I pace the floor, working my hands, Yellen's emotions like a second flood inside me, mixing with my own, confusing, maddening. I'm a witch? What will Erte think? That stops me dead. The temple. Water sight. My life until the last few weeks. What does it mean that I can read blood? Were they right that I'm not actually a seer? That I never belonged? But I know myself. No, that's not right. No water sight is as deep a part of me as my blood or my bones. I'm a seer, just not a normal one. Like I'm not a normal girl. Or am I? Is the male part just a coincidence? An accident? Am I actually supposed to be a Theracan? To wear long skirts and smile mysterious smiles like these women? Cursed to feel everyone I've ever touched in this impossible flood of sensation? I try to ice it again, try to ice the aching stress and loneliness coming from Yellen. It won't ice. I try again, pacing, then remember my forms. Maybe they will help. I pull the staff from my back, begin slashing from ice-carved stone through current meets air to stream bed in the downpour, the first year form, the most basic, demanding form. There's a familiarity in it, a freedom, a comfort I never felt anywhere else in that first year. A power. I jab forward, spin, faint, and kick. I am a seer. I feel this deep in my bones, deeper even than Yellen's sadness. A woman, yes, an etherikant, or at least someone with blood sight, but male like the solid stones and arching balconies of the temple. I'm both. I'm more than both. More than the shitty definitions or politics either side try to force me into. I'm me, my father, and my mother. Of course I have both their magics. I calm some time later, pause at the tip of droplet meets waves, chest heaving, sweat beating on my forehead. I let out a long breath. I find Yellen inside, her second year emotions so familiar to me, despite her different training, and ice them. Find my own emotions, my anger at what the Theracans did, my fear at what it showed me, my loss at wondering if I never belonged in the temple. I ice them too. Turn it all into a frozen block. Then I let it melt, let the emotions come out, and just sit and breathe through them. I know the women are waiting for me, that maybe never in the history of the Theracans Guild has an uninitiated novice made the entire Ninth Circle wait, but I don't care. I need the time. I rise when I'm ready, when I'm settled with who I am and what I can do, rub the tears from my face, though they undoubtedly heard me crying, and straighten my clothes, the porter's disguise I donned with Gaxna this morning. It feels like years ago. Sorry, Gaxna, I whisper, knowing what I have to do. I will make this up to you. Twenty-three. I have not forgotten what happened before Yellen. The Theracants confirmed they were lied to, that there was nothing wrong with my father's rule or relationship to the Theracants' guild. 
The whole thing was based on lies. This will be crucial in exposing the traditionalists, in unseating them. But I still need time to figure out who is behind R.A.M. And when I'm ready, I need to do more than stick my hand in the water and show people my proofs. I need to confront Narimes and have the temple see the proof on his face. I'll need time to figure out how to do this, not to mention protection from the overseers until they're convinced, and the Salem Dale, however they figure into this. Which means I need the Therakens. What I don't need is to get caught up in whatever plans they have for me. Good thing it sounds like they're divided on what those plans are. I can use that. The Therakens are chatting pleasantly as I walk in, something about new silks down from the ironway. I try to affect the same tone. That's better, I say, settling down. Thank you. One question. Do you hear them all the time? We can train you to block them out, Regiana says. Broodlings, we call them. But if you wanted to? Yes. You can hear everyone you've ever touched, and echoes of those they've touched. For some of the Therakins who've worked the streets a long time, that's most of the city. I wonder if it's like my water blind, only reverse somehow, if I could learn it on my own. Either way, I have to make peace with Yellen for now. There are more important things afoot. Ooh, Jay. And you could make all of them into Bloodborne, right? Why do you need me? Regiana blows on her teacup. We have never needed that kind of power, and if we were to summon much of the city, they would rebel against us as soon as we let go. A woman to her left nods. The best power never has to be used. Ah, I say, so you just want to threaten that power. No, Regiana says, just as Miara says, yes. I raise my eyebrows. Miara eyes Regiana, then says, if you'll excuse us. The two step into the hallway, and the rest of the women fidget. I hide a smile. I have them. They know that I know now that they are divided on how to use their powers against the temple, and by association divided on how to use me, which means I have room to bargain. Fresh tea, perhaps, a Therakin says, and Temerana scuttles off. The eldest women come back as the tea is being served, settling themselves with calm faces as though there has been no disturbance. Thank you, daughters, Regiana says. That will be all. Alethea, if you'll stay? Like that, the other seven women rise and make polite motions, along with Astresia and Temerana, the youngest leaving her teacup half-filled. I seize the opportunity, sliding next to Miara and pouring her cup, as their ceremony seems to require. I leave the lid off the pot, steam wafting out. With any luck, it will be enough water to catch a glimpse of their thoughts. Miara pours for Regiana, and once the old woman has settled her cup, she turns to me. I'll be blunt, girl. You don't have much choice here. There's a death sentence on your head in the streets, and with last night's news that danger will be tenfold. We are the only ones that can keep you safe. Nothing useful in the steam yet. I shrug. I could leave the city. I know ways out. Regiana's dark eyes bore into mine. But you will not. Your heart is too true for that. You wish to right Narimes' wrong. I start. Damn the woman. Did you read me somehow? Is she a seer too? You don't need magic at my age, girl. You monks, or do you call yourself a nun? Read minds so much you forget you have faces. We can help you with the traditionalists, Miara says, if you support us. I catch a hint of her thoughts, just a touch, enough to infer that she wants that support badly. Which one of you? I ask blandly. They glance at each other. What do you mean? I may be young, but I don't need water to read your division. You're split on how to resist. Some of you want to use the Bloodborne, and the other is something more subtle. I catch a flash of thought in the steam, something about using their influence to keep the other guilds from paying taxes. A kind of temple boycott. Interesting. And you two are divided as well. There is a time when you should hold its tongue, Regiana says. Another flash, in a thought tone I'm starting to identify as hers. You would boycott then, and Miara favors the Bloodborne. Their scowls deepen, and I have to work hard this time to hide my smile. I do not favor the Bloodborne, Miara says. It's the only strategy strong enough to work. And to fail in the next moment, I say, thinking through what I've seen of their thoughts, when you release them and the whole city turns against you. Regiana scowls, and I read more hints in the steam. Then again, I go on, if you use your influence to stop the guilds from paying taxes, 
There's no guarantee the drop in money would stop Marie Mace's plans, especially with the Salem Dale supporting him. So neither the Bloodborne nor the boycott will work, I finish. Is that about the sum of your arguments? Rigiana stares. Miara's mouth is actually open in shock. I take a sip of tea. Miara glances at the steam, realizing, and hurriedly gets up. Regiana sits unperturbed, face going still again. I have nothing to hide from you, girl, she says. You are the only solution. That's what I've been saying all along. The city distrusts us and the temple equally, but they hate the idea of being bloodborne far more than being subjected to water sight. You can't blame them for that, I put in, remembering Gaxna's story. No, I suppose not but it means the only one they will trust is an outsider. At this point, that's either you or the Salem Dale. If the Dale come out against us, our hand is forced, and we lose the game even if we win the battle using Bloodborne. But if you come out against the Temple, Miara continues, or against the traditionalists at least, the city will listen. You are of both sides, having both magics, the daughter of a Chosen and a Therakint. The city will admire you, will hopefully remember the good times under your father, and not how his reign ended. It ended in lies, I say, the lies that tricked you into getting defensive, and lies about trade and heresy. Regiana raises an eyebrow, as if she knows something of my father's heresies, but says, those are exactly the things you need to say, to prove the temple is in no position to rule this city, and, by inference, that the Therakins are. It's the old power struggle, and for all their talk of balance, these women are as locked in it as Narimes and the rest, though it's probably better not to say that. In exchange for this, you give me the letter. The letter, Miara says, and our protection, and the chance to develop your blood sight. I have no plans of following through with this, at least not in the way they're going to want me to, but I will expose the traditionalists. Give me an hour to think, and to read the letter. Regiana chuckles. Only to have you decline? Oh no. We need your commitment first. Then I commit. What else can I do? I need these women as much as they need me, if for slightly different reasons. And I'm burning to know what the letter says, why my father distrusted the temple enough to give it to the Therakens. I will be the figurehead you need to show the temple is not fit to rule. Regiana gives me hawk eyes, then nods. And so we commit as well. We will deliver the letter, and offer the support you need to expose the traditionalists. Miara shakes her head, though, reaching for me. Give me your arm. I see her making the strange fist, blood hook out, and roll to my feet, dropping into Floodwater's rise. Try it. Miara, Regiana says, holding up a hand. We can trust the girl. The gaze Miara gives me looks anything but trusting, but she nods. As you say, mother, I'll fetch the letter. I keep my staff up. Regiana rises, too. Well, there are other things that need doing this afternoon. Temerana will attend you. Send for me if you need to talk after the letter. I get the feeling again that they've read it, no matter what Miara says, or that the whole thing is a hoax, just a ploy they use to get me to agree. Ujay help them if that's the case. 24. Miara delivers the parchment, and I step back into the other room, unclasp the top and pull the scroll out. The seal looks unbroken, the parchment yellow but still supple, like you might expect from something a few years old. All of that could be faked, but my father taught me to write. I will know his script. I break the seal and unroll it, and there it is, my father's stern hand, straight-lined and narrow-looped, a controlled kind of elegance, just like him. A wave of sadness hits me, despite all the things I resent him for, despite the way he put me in the temple and then ignored me, as though he had better things to do than be a father. Under all that, I still miss him, still hate whoever murdered him, am still his daughter. Dear Alethea, if you're reading this, I have failed. I am sorry. I could not tell you of my plans, for fear of the truth getting through even your thick blind. I have enemies in the temple. I'm not sure who yet, but the list narrows. Who can use water sight in ways I never imagined. They are likely in power now. I do not doubt they are devious enough to take the council, if I have not stopped them. Beware these men. Your blind may be no protection against them. Narimes. I remember the way he saw through my blind in the temple. The way he impossibly knew my thoughts. 
and how he could control which parts of his mind came through his blind, giving me just his sight or just a few words. I didn't imagine it. This is only more confirmation of his guilt, as if I ever doubted. Beware also the rumors that spread against me, even now. I am no heretic, Alethea, or if I am, it is because we all should be. You have had no choice, have been a challenge to tradition since I entered you in the temple, and I apologize for that but I believe it has made you stronger. I stop here, read the lines again. My father never apologized for what he did, and I think he is trying here, but this is not what I wanted from him. Not to justify it, but just to say he's sorry. Even if he's right, that I am stronger for having gone through it. I needed you here. You are the smartest of your class, and the strongest, and the rule against females entering the training is one of the many tenets of Ujjayism that needs reform. It has nothing to do with the truth, and anyone who has been immersed knows this. Your power is proof the religion is wrong, that our traditions have strayed from Ujjayi's truth. I suck in a breath. Even this, in the hands of a strict believer, or in the mouth of a student, would be a potent heresy, enough to cause upset among the theocrats. Perhaps there was truth to the rumors he was a heretic. Not that it matters to me. I've always been one and I couldn't care less for our traditions so long as we stay true to our principles. My enemies will likely try to kill you for that, to keep the traditions from changing, lest they lose power at the same time. I half laugh. Now you tell me? I mutter to the empty room. Could have used that information a week ago. The immersion chronicles hold the truth, Alethea. Every monk's experience is chronicled after his first immersion, and gathered there. I hope you already know this. I hope you have survived the immersion, and remember the truth others do not. The signs are there in the chronicles, too, but it has taken years of study to decipher them. The deluge. The deluge is coming, and sooner than any have thought. If we do not reform Ujjayism, reform the beliefs of the city, we will be swept away with the rest. You must ready the city, Alethea. Ready the world, if you can. I frown and read it again. The deluge? The best scholars say the next one is still centuries away, maybe more. But Nerimes mentioned this as one of my father's heresies. His script changes below this, looking more hurried. Find the chronicles. Read them. Defeat my enemies. Do not let them corrupt Ujjay's message. Find the truth and spread it to anyone you can. This may have been my fatal error, to attempt change within the temple first. I have been blinded by this quest. Obsessed. I may have let you down in this, not been the father you need for the sake of fathering the world. Your mother's death. There's something crossed out here. I curse and lean in close, try to make it out, but my father blotted it out entirely. What did he want to say? What about my mother's death? There are only a few lines below this, scrawled as though written while running. You are the best of us, Thea. I am sorry to have given you this life, but I had no choice. I hope you see that. Your father, always, Sturg John. And then it's done. I read it again and again, trying to soak it in, to find my father in it, to understand what he means about the deluge, about the immersion chronicles. The immersions are the final test before being elevated to seer when we get immersed in the ocean. A few students go mad from it every year, especially those who try it before they're ready. Everyone is forbidden to speak of it afterwards, but apparently they record their experiences. Still, what can they say? That Ujjay spoke to them in the ocean, told them the deluge was coming? No one would be able to keep that a secret. No one would want to. My father says he spent years studying them. Could he have gone mad doing it? Or become too heretical to interpret what was written there? No. I can't believe it of my dad, even if he put me into a temple full of men. He was brave and stern, but never a fool. Whatever he found there, I don't doubt it's right. I linger on the other parts here, too. The apologies for what he did to me. The crossed-out section about my mom. The way he signed the bottom. Not, love your father, or I miss you, or even I'm proud of you. Just, your father, always, Sturg John. A slop hole to the last, I mutter, even as I'm wiping my eyes. Even as I know I'm probably going to carry this piece of paper with me till I die. I read it again, then fold it carefully along the seams and shove it into the tight wrappings under my porter's shirt. 
It hasn't told me anything new about the traditionalists, or who else was involved in the plot. My dad doesn't say anything about the Salem Dale, but it does show he knew it was coming, was trying to stop it, and it gives me another clue into his plans. He must have been rethinking Ujaism for a long time to have entered me in the temple almost ten years ago. And the deluge. He seems really convinced that it's coming, soon. Conventional wisdom says that anyone who follows Ujaism will be saved from the deluge by Ujay, who is, after all, god of the waters. But every religion says something like this. According to fifth-year lessons, the Dara believe the wealthiest will be saved, the Dale the most craftologically advanced, the Perler is something about the most peaceful, and the Bamani the ones who earn the most glory, and the Therakins, who basically believe in Ujay but call him Jaya and think the truest form of water is blood. I stand up, and Temurana appears at the door. Is everything all right, my lady? Very different tone from when I met her outside the palace. Do you believe you'll be saved if you follow Jainism to the letter? She starts, then nods. Of course. Therakin Ainma even thinks there's proof that some Therakins have already been saved. So what about the rest of the world? We just got lucky enough to be born in the place with the correct faith? Temurana shakes her head. No, I think maybe they're all right. That the truth is different in each place, or... Or the whole thing is metaphor, I say, readjusting the staff on my back. That none of it is really true, exactly. It's just trying to explain something you can't say directly in words. She narrows her eyes in thought, and I revise my low opinion of this girl. She is the product of a hard system, but there's quality underneath. Maybe so, she says. You're done with the letter? I am. And need to see Regiana or Miara? I purse my lips. They will not like me leaving, but I have to go. I need to talk all this over with Gaxna. No, no, I don't think so. I'll find them later. As you wish. She steps out of the doorway. I walk out unguided, through the sterile lower hall with its closed rooms and scents of vomit and lavender. I know Regiana is right, that this is probably the safest place in the city, but Gaxna isn't going to come here. And whatever else happens, I'm staying with Gaxna, so... The courtyard of grass and fountains is full of waiting people, even in the fading evening light. We will work it out somehow. I didn't really realize it until I read my father's letter, until I got clear on who he was. But I need Gaxna. My father is dead, and his last words to me were about politics, not about us. Maybe he never loved me like I remember. I climb onto a minor guild house as the mansions give way to New Saray. Either way, he's gone now, like my mom, and I need someone here and now. Someone to love me and laugh with me and watch my back, not just be a memory I waste my life on. I will avenge my father. But if it doesn't go well, I can still be with Gaxna, maybe travel like she was talking about. This is just one thing I want to do in my life. She is the rest of it. And I need to tell her that, now, before whatever tempest is building up finally breaks. Twenty-five. I take the longest, highest, least visible route across the city to our hideout. I'm starving, but Regiana has me spooked about overseers, and I can get food with Gaxna anyway. I want to see her more than anything, to get her help sorting through the Therakins and my father's letter, and just because I want to see her. She's not there when I climb in, though, probably off stealing something or looking for runaways. She spends a fair amount of time doing this and sending messages upstream with the ones she supports. Still, We've spent most of our days in training and thefts and slow evenings cooking food. Surely she wasn't just spending all that time alone before me. She must have other friends she would see. Maybe that's where she is now. I feel a twinge of jealousy but ignore it, digging through her piles of crates to find something worth eating. I settle on some dried beans and spices. She's still not there when the beans are done, moon rising low over the bay beyond the city. I eat them in silence, thinking about my dad, thinking about the Therakins and their plan to fight Narimes. I don't like Miara, I realize. Tamarana is fine, and Regiana I like even though she's tough as ox hooves. But Miara just leaves me feeling slimy, like Narimes. Proof that no system is perfect if people like them can get to the top. The sun goes down, and I light a candle in another clove leaf. I'm just starting to get worried when I hear feet on the roof, 
the scrape of someone climbing down the narrow handholds we chipped into the stone. She swings in. Only she's a he. I start up. Deshaun? Thea, he says, all smiles, like we're running into each other in the temple kitchens. What, what are you doing here? Where's Gaxna? I feel stupid as soon as I say it. How would he know where Gaxna is? He grimaces and I feel a sudden dread, then remember I can feel him like I do yelling. Blood read him. This is his dread. She's gone, Thea. What? The overseers took her. The floor drops out from under me. What? I grab my staff. The clove leaf fog burned off in an instant. Where? We need to go. To get her. He puts a hand out. Calm down, Thea. They took her to the temple. The pits. She's been there for hours. The pits? Floods. That's where they keep murderers before execution. They're dark and deep and guarded by overseers. I have to go. Thea, he puts a hand on my shoulder. There's no getting her out of there. Rage boils up, and I almost shove him out of the way, telling him there's no keeping her in there. Then I ice it. I know it won't serve me. I'll save that for later. What? How do you know this? He makes a pained face. He sent me. Nerimes. Nerimes sent you? What, are you working for him now? Suspicion boils in me, even though I know it's Deshaun. No, I'm working for the temple, but it was the only way to get out, to get to you, and I thought you'd want to know. I shake my head. How did you find me? I can feel you, T. He hasn't called me T since second year. I always know where you are, especially since the last time we met. I nod, understanding. You have it too. Have what? I feel a surge of hope inside his chest and suddenly remember what happened on the warehouse roof. That he kissed me right before he climbed down to lead the overseers off. That this whole time, maybe, he's been sensing my feelings for Gaxna through the bond, thinking they were for him. Floods. Blood sight. Remember when we sparred in fifth level and you got angry and split my lip? What? I... You were the one who got angry. You broke my nose. Anyway, we traded blood, and that's why we can feel each other. It's blood sight, Deshaun. But... That's impossible. I'm a man. And I'm a woman, remember? With water sight? Yeah, but you're special, he shakes his head. Or maybe we're special. That's why we can feel this. He's like a lost puppy, all love and hurt and vulnerability inside. It's sweet, but not what I need right now at all. I need to get my friend out of the pits. The suspicion comes back. Did you lead them to Gaxna? His emotions vanish. He must have seen me reading him, or felt it, and put his blind up. Maybe it's better this way. Mine has never wavered. No, I wouldn't do that to your friend. They got another tip. But they sent you. Suddenly, I'm the one full of dread. Gaxna, what did they do to her? I grab his shoulders. What did they do? Nothing, but they... They're going to. Nerimes wanted me to say, he swallows, that you need to turn yourself in by the wedding, or they'll kill her. I'm so sorry, Thea. She's alive. Thank you, Jay. But the relief only lasts a second. Kill her? Why? For what? For attacking an overseer. What? But that was me. He starts back. That was you? But how do you attack an overseer? I... He was in my way. Deshaun stares at me like I'm suddenly a total stranger. Floods, Thea. What happened to you? No acolyte could... I shrug it off. I got lucky. It doesn't matter. Is he alive? Yes. For now. They're not sure. Relief sags my shoulders, followed as quick with frustration. Temple medics are never sure. Suddenly, the whole thing is so stupid to me, how monks don't use the Theracans even though they're by far the best healers, because they can't risk the Theracans getting their blood. And so people die for flooding politics. I grit my teeth. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Marimes doesn't care who did it. He just needs a reason to pull me in. I should feel sorry, but I just feel angry. Deshaun cocks his head, thoughts and emotions still behind his blind. You really care about her, don't you? Damn right I do. She's my friend, Deshaun. I'd do the same for you or anyone. And I would too, he breathes. I'm feeling it from him again, that mad rush of energy, of love. Not from his blood or water or anything, but like through the air. Like I feel with Gaxna, but different somehow more forceful, more directed. I ignore it. I have to. 
Gaxon already has my head spun enough without letting Deshaun in, too. We'll get her out, Deshaun is saying. How? I frown, happy to talk about anything else. Anything but this dread I can't seem to ice. The pits are behind ten locked doors and twice as many overseers. Deshaun shakes his head. That's what I came here to tell you. The loyalists. They're ready to act. We can take the whole temple. Hope surges in me like a riptide. The ones inside the temple? They believe me now? Yes. They listen to what you showed me on the rooftop. The proofs against the council. They agree now, Alethea. They want Narimes gone. And I think they're ready to do something about it. This is the best news all day. Maybe the only good news, actually. I have even more proof now, I say. The Therakins Guild. They admitted they were manipulated. That the whole threat Narimes was talking about was a lie. I can see the resolve on his face. He believes me. That means a lot. What happened with Ariam? That's the one piece that doesn't fit. What do you mean? Wasn't he the connection between the criers playing up Sturg John's heresy and the traditionalists? And the merchants getting floated? Yeah, well, he turned out to be a bloodborne. He starts back. Bloodborne? Like, from the witches? Yes, although they denied it. He frowns. And you believe them? They let me read them, Deshaun. The highest therakant there, like their version of the Chosen. She knows everything the rest of them know, and she had no idea who R.E.M. was. But how can that be? My shoulders drop. I don't know. It doesn't mean R.E.M. isn't a tool of the traditionalists or the Dale. I just don't have proof for it. He shakes his head. How could a Bloodborne be a tool of the temple? That's what I was saying. Maybe a rogue Theracanth they bribed? There's one in the city, at least, a woman who will stain eyes. But why would any Theracanth help the traditionalists get into power when the traditionalists are the one preaching against them? He narrows his eyes. Maybe they were trying to get someone else in. Maybe someone they controlled and it just didn't work. The traditionalists got in instead. That stops me. You mean they played up the heresies and manipulated trade to get my father out, but instead of their replacement, Narimes and the traditionalists swooped in? Yeah. That would explain the Salem Dale, too. Say they made a deal with the witches and gave them the money for all those bribes. Then when it failed, instead of giving up, they managed to get one of theirs engaged to the Chosen. That would make sense, except Ariam is still out there doing whatever he does. And I know what I read in Regiana. The Theracans have no idea who he is. So you're saying someone in the temple can make Bloodborne? I think of what my father wrote in the letter about Ujaism being wrong. Think about Yellen, the heart I can feel beating inside me even now. I'm a woman who reads water. You have blood sight, whether you believe it or not. Maybe someone in the traditionalists can push blood. Maybe it's Narimes. I told you he already has powers he shouldn't, and my father mentioned that too. Either way, it's a lot simpler explanation that the traditionalists are in league with the Dale to shut the Theracans out than the idea that the Theracans were working with them and their attempt failed and then the Dale somehow managed to get Yalad in there anyway. He nods grudgingly. That would explain the chests, too. What chests? I saw a Salem Dale chests coming into the temple a few months ago. Not many, but you could tell they were heavy from the way the overseers carried them. Money, I breathe. Like they must have given them money before for the bribes and merchants. He nods. Dale don't pay bride prices, so it's the only thing that would make sense. R.E.M. still doesn't make much sense, though. I flex my hands on the wooden spoon I'm holding. Maybe it's not going to make sense completely. What I know is all of this points back to the traditionalists, and they admitted to trying to kill me because I was in their way, like they did my dad. That plus everything I've found out here, I don't think anyone could deny they sold us out to get into power. Deshaun blows out a breath. I don't know. Even if they believe it, the traditionalists still have more numbers. They will need more than my memories of your memories to change their minds. They could read it directly from me if I could get in sometime when they're all gathered. I chew on my lip a moment. The wedding! The temple will be there, right? Deshaun nods. And a lot of the city, I think. They're holding a big feast afterwards. Perfect. When is it? The day after tomorrow. Two days. Enough time to make a plan and get the Theracans behind it? For Deshaun to ready the loyalists inside the temple? For Gaxna to stay alive? It'll have to be. Okay, I need you to get the loyalists ready. Show them these new proofs. I'll show up at the wedding. How are you going to get in? They're holding it around the deepling pool. 
You couldn't get any further from the city than that, and there'll be overseers everywhere. I smile. I've learned some things since I left the temple, but I'm going to need your help once I'm in. Even if Narimes admits his guilt, or everyone sees it, he's still going to fight. You need to get the loyalists ready for that. The temple... Fighting the temple? Jay's eyes. Deshaun shakes his head. But what about the overseers? They're basically all traditionalists because they've stayed out of all this. Even if we take the temple, they'll retake it in a second. I have a plan for the overseers, I say, if I can get the Therakins to agree to it. If we keep them out long enough to prove my case to the rest of the temple, the overseers will have to see the truth, too. If I hadn't nearly killed the one that attacked me, maybe they'd already be on my side. I ice the regret. Wishing won't change the past. Just get them ready. I will. His wide face is so earnest, so loyal, that I can't help feeling love for him, too. Not like the intoxicating kind rolling off him, but love nonetheless, like for a brother, maybe. Here, I say, holding out my hands. He cocks his head, but takes them. My proofs, I say, and drop my blind. Carefully think of only those moments when I learn new information, then slam the blind down again. If he saw me in Gaxna. His gaze only firms, so he must not have. Thank you for helping me take them down, Deshaun. I know there's nothing in it for you, and you're probably risking your elevation. He shakes his head. You're in it. That's all I need. You... Like I said, we're connected. Somehow, I've felt everything you've been going through. I want to do something to help you. Anything. I take a deep breath, realize I'm shaking a little. Thank you. You don't know how much that means to me right now. No, he shakes his head, grip tightening on my hands. I realize a second too late what he's doing, and then he's kissing me again, pulling my head into his. I freeze. Even though some part of it feels right, it's wrong. Especially not now. Not with Gaxna. I pull away. I can't, Deshaun. I'm sorry. I... What? Why? The pain on his face is more than I can look at. I just... There's too much going on right now. I just need to get through this. How could I explain about Gaxna? It would break his heart. Okay. I should go. He turns. And I'm not sure it's not to keep me from seeing tears. For once, I'm glad his blind is up, that I'm not reading anything in blood sight. I want to hug him, to do anything to make this easier, but I know it would only make it worse. Two days, I say instead. Just get the loyalists ready, and I'll see you in two days. They're not the right words, but he nods and climbs out without looking back. I clench my fists in the darkness, not even sure what I feel. Angry at the life that made me get Gaxna locked up and hurt Deshaun like this? Determined still to show everyone the truth, even as I start to wonder if my dad's memory is worth it. But I know if I don't, the council will keep ruining other lives, corrupting Saray, destroying the things my father stood for. I need to fight them. That doesn't make it any easier. Somewhere in the night, Yellen is curled up and crying. I want to join her, but instead I light a candle and start making plans. There's work to do. Twenty-six. I climb out of our room hours later, all too aware this might be the last time I see it, that Gaxna won't see it again if I fail, that I might lose the person I love most in the world. I'd rather die, but I'm not going to let either one happen. The sun is just an orange line on the horizon, slightly bumpy with the hills of Bomani across the strait. The black water is quiet at this hour, but I take the roofs anyway. At this point, the climbing and sliding and balancing rooftop dance is more familiar than walking the streets, and there are still the overseers out to kill me. I see none of them below, but I do notice a few faces turning to watch me as I look down, which is odd. People usually ignore the rooftops. Then they start climbing. Not fast, not well, but ordinary people in the street start climbing the buildings toward the roof I'm on. I leap to the next, using my staff for an extra push, and they all climb down, moving to the next building. Ice slides down my spine. Bloodborne. It can't be coincidence that I just left the Therakens Guild, that I just struck a deal with the most powerful women there. Word has surely spread. Is one of the witches upset about that? Or is Regiana angry that I left without permission and is sending Bloodborne to bring me back? I balance along a steepled roof, one Bloodborne who actually made the top running after me. He loses his balance with a cry, 
and I wince at the crash when he hits the street. I'm coming back, I yelled to the bloodborne beginning to climb below me, in case Regiana is doing it. Calm down, I just had to check on some things. I'm not going to break our deal. I don't know if the Theracant can hear me or not, but it's worth trying. They keep climbing. I curse and keep running. The ones climbing behind me aren't much of a threat. They don't have a thief's climbing skills, nor does the woman controlling them likely have any knowledge of the rooftops, whereas I know all the best routes by now. Still, they start to appear on the roofs ahead of me, their controller guessing where I'm heading next. I curse, ducking around the awkward grab of a middle-aged woman who's waiting wide-eyed at the end of a long dockhouse. What do you want? I shout at her, hoping her controller will hear. To drag me in? I'm coming already. Lay off. They don't. If anything, the bloodborne get thicker, crawling up walls on all sides, until I'm facing them no matter which route I take, and I have to start rerouting around buildings where they cluster. I don't want to hurt these people, don't want to attack them, but I swear they're trying to stop me from getting to the Therakin Palace, not bring me there. Who would want that? Miara? Estresia? Or whoever controls Arayim? I run harder, risk longer jumps, take a zagging route up the city slope rather than across it, trying to shake them off. They only come on stronger. It's either a senior Therakent who's doing this to be able to control so many, or a whole team of them working together, so it can't be R.A.M.'s controller. Unless Regiana managed to hide her knowledge of him when I read her. Narimes could do that. Maybe Regiana is one of the enemies my dad mentioned in his letter, who have powers they shouldn't. I ice the fear that comes up. I am not in true danger here. It doesn't matter how many they throw against me. I'll be able to outrun them. Then a shaved head pushes through the line of bloodborne ahead. Flowing robes. Oakwood staff. An overseer. With the wide eyes of a bloodborne. An overseer? How did they get an overseer's blood? No time to wonder. I spin, taking an opposite route. I have no illusions I can defeat him like I did the overseer in the warehouse. There's no water here, and my skill is no match for his. I leap a wide alley, then run downhill along a wide, shingled roof. The man follows, eyes wide but steps as sure as any thief. Gax Naseta Bloodborne is only as skilled as its host body, but the Therakint can push it to do things it would never choose on its own. That's a dangerous combination in an overseer. I slide down a steep tiled roof, use the momentum at the bottom to leapfrog across a precarious line of shanty poles, and roll to the other roof panting. I look back and curse. The overseer follows just as quickly, actually pulling out his staff as he leaps the poles. Ujay! Guess there's no question what his controller intends now. They don't just want to stop me from getting to the guild palace. They want to stop me, period. Which makes my decisions a lot easier. Whatever they don't want, I do. I wait till the overseer is midair, then leap low toward the poles again, grabbing the nearest one and sliding down to a lower roof. I beeline for Old Saray, for the Therakin's palace. See if they'll walk a bloodborne overseer into their own guild hall. The overseer follows, of course, and they're a regular bloodborne to deal with, but I start using my staff, knocking people and weapons aside, taking the fastest route I can think of toward the old part of town. The overseer gains on me, and I remember one thing I have that he doesn't. Gaxna's rope. I unspool it as I run, grateful it still has the climbing hook from the warehouse job, and start swinging. A few bloodborne get in the way, but I manage a long throw onto the roof of the cobbler's guildhouse. It catches and I climb like mad, pulling the rope up behind me. The overseer gets to the bottom and leaps at me, but I'm already too high, and he can't climb the polished wall. The overseer stares blankly with those wide eyes for a second, and I grin, imagining his controller cursing. I give them the rudest gesture I know. The overseer sprints away. This is better. There are three paths off this roof, and they cannot guess which one I will take. The overseer is nearly to the bottom of the leftmost one when I scale the guildhouse, so I take the rightmost, regular bloodborne completely left behind. This becomes our dance for the rest of the city the overseer closing on me with speed and strength, me staying ahead with skill and thief's rope. Until we get to Old Saray. The roofs are too wide and irregular here to keep using them. I stretch it out as long as I can, running the narrow width of a stone wall around some merchant's teakwood mansion, then drop to the street and sprint. 
The overseer is after me three breaths later, and it's an all-out race to the guild house. I pour on the speed, throwing whatever clothes and tools I can strip from my body backwards to slow the man, but it will make little difference. All is the running now. The palace appears around a curve in the road, rose gold beehive rising from the latticework walls, cupolas catching the first rays of morning. The breath roars in my lungs. I never thought I'd be so glad to see anything, let alone the Therakin's guild. Another five hundred paces, three hundred. Stars flash and I fall, momentum tumbling me across the marble flagstones. I spin, raising my staff in time to block a blow that would have cracked my skull. The force of it drives me back to the stones. My head spins, but I kick at his legs and lurch up, mounting a desperate defense. He's so strong and fast. There's no water here to read him or to push my thoughts into him like I did with the last one. I'm done. I know it even before the overseer slams me into a granite wall, thick hand closing like a noose around my neck, wide blank eyes staring through me. I kick at him, claw, try feather shifts the river course, but it makes no difference. In desperation I seek his thoughts, but they are as blank as his eyes. I scream in frustration and fear, but it comes out a mule, my throat crushing, my lungs hitching. How ironic, I think, as the world dims, to be killed by one of the men I was trying to protect. Twenty-seven. I wake up gasping, to shouting, to the overseer staring at me across the flagstones. It takes a minute to process the arrow sprouting from his ear. His eyes stare dully, and a pool of blood widens around him. I start up, ears ringing, world's colors blurring into focus. Three men run up to me. No, three women, one of them with a bow. Therakint guards. Thank you, I rasp. My throat is going to have a necklace of bruises by noon. They ignore me, grim-faced, two wrapping the body in a long white cloth while the third cleans the blood from the street. You, she snaps, finishing her work. Come with me, now. Who am I to argue? In this state, I couldn't put up much of a fight if I wanted to. Besides, they just saved my life, so I assume they're not also trying to kill me. They hustle me around the outside walls to a small wooden door that leads down, under the yard with its fountains and sick waiting for treatment. We enter an underground network of tunnels, burial chambers, it looks like, though now they're filled with casks and foul-smelling herbs. I need to know who I can trust among the Therakins. One of them probably sent that overseer against me. Who ordered you to save me? The guard in front of me snorts. Quiet, girl. You've gotten yourself in enough trouble. I risk a casual brush of our wrists and catch the memory of Regiana barking orders. Good. I can trust her, at least. Not so much the witch who sent the overseer. We pass a stairway on the left, and the woman not holding the overseer's body pulls me aside. The others hustle on and we climb the narrow stairwell, shadows shifting in the light of the lantern she holds behind me. There, she says, and I open a creaking door into the back of a broom closet. Wait here. She leaves, and I wait a few moments, my throat starting to feel normal again. It's probably safe in here, but if more bloodborne show up, I'll do better in an open space. I step out to a hallway twice as rich as the one I passed through yesterday. Low talk comes from a room to my right, but I stay where I am, keeping my staff ready. Regiana descends at the far end of the hall, three women attending her. The woman's grandmotherly face is a thundercloud, and she snaps orders at the women as much with her hands as her mouth. They disperse and she stalks up to me. What happened? I tell her, trusting she wouldn't have sent the overseer after me, then ordered him killed. An overseer they could control would be worth his weight in gold to the Therakins, or whatever faction within them wants me dead. Her eyes narrow. No hints as to who? Why they did it? I was hoping you'd know that. I have a fair idea. Her eyes harden, and she glances around. Come. Regiana leads me to a room just large enough for two, with carved latticework windows and silk cushions on a plush rug. She closes the door. Are you the one who ordered the guards to save me? I ask, settling myself. I am. She sits across from me, giving her skirts a series of brief jerks. One of the fifth circle spotted Bloodborne in the streets, and it was easy from there to follow your progress through town. You're a brave girl. I shrug, watching the door. I was just staying alive, but thank you. I owe you my life. Regiana snorts. You and half the city, girl. 
you get used to it. A young girl knocks and enters with tea, two delicate cups and a steaming black kettle. I take a moment to pour for Regiana, and she surprises me by pouring mine in return. Who would do this, I ask? Who would want to keep me out of the palace? Regiana takes a sip, though the tea is scalding. Those are guild secrets. I give her a level gaze. Well, mates in war, mates in truth, I suppose, she sighs. Miara. Miara? I feel my eyebrows raise. I don't like the woman, but why would she want to stop me? Don't be stupid, girl. You know I overrode her yesterday, that she was never as keen on the agreement as either of us. So she tried to kill me? I doubt she would have killed you, Regiana adjusted the cup on her tray, likely just trying to scare you off. Oh? I pulled the scarf I'm wearing lower. You're a Theracant. What would you say about what just happened to my neck? I can feel it purpling already, where the overseer choked me. Regiana sucks in air. Jaya's mercy. It's worse than I thought. She snaps her fingers and rattles off a quick order to the girl at the door, who runs off. All this for a disagreement in strategy? I pulled the scarf back up. The ancient woman grimaces. It runs deeper than that. I don't know what it is, but it's been in the guild a while now. Since I took office, at least. The division you saw. Miara and Tarawin, and I can't be sure of who else. Women acting like they forgot their training. Forgot their vows. You can't read them or something? You're the one who reads thoughts. Feelings are much less precise. Why does a person have a stomach ache? There could be any number of causes. Same with Miara feeling angry, or Terowin being bone-tired. Sometimes I wish I had a shaved head. Then I might know what was going on in this guild house. But you have her blood, right? Where is she now? Yes, she takes another sip of scalding tea. And I don't know. What? But I thought... Yes, I should be able to sense her anywhere. Point to her and give you an estimate of distance, even. But according to my reading, she's nowhere. Not dead, just not anywhere. I shouldn't tell her about temple secrets, but at this point the Therakins are as much on my side as the seers are. There's an ability we have. The water blind, we call it. It keeps others out of your head. I think it works with blood reading, too. Maybe Miara learned it somewhere, is using it to block you. It's a nice trick. Yes, I know of your techniques. And Astresia told me of Gaxna's resistance. This is not that. Then what is it? I don't know. It's like she's here still, in the city, but I can't see where or what she's feeling. It's not the blankness of a blind, but more like, she gestures at the air, a glass painted over. I think of Narimes' blind, of how it felt different from any other blind. Is there another magic somehow? Is Miara a craftologist? Regiana frowns. What did the Salem Dale have to do with this? Other than marrying into the temple tomorrow? Well, I think their money was behind my father's murder, and I know it was distributed by the bloodborne I mentioned, Arayim. Have you sent anyone after her? Covertly. Things are balanced too finely to act openly against her, and I do not know if this was her doing. I shift in my seat. Well, does anyone else control overseers? I'd rather not die before I face Narimes. Regiana sips again. Not to my knowledge. I would be able to feel them. The girl slips back in carrying a small case of clay jars. Regiana takes it and moves to my side of the table, lithe as a ten-year-old. What? Hold still. She starts rubbing cream into my neck, into the bruises. It hurts like hell, then burns, then tingles cool. It feels strange to be tended by someone so old and obviously respected, but she has such a practiced hand that I settle after a moment. I trust this woman and read only legitimate thoughts in her when our skins touch. I take a breath. So does our deal still stand? Her hands pause for a moment, then continue their work. I am a woman of my word, but we may need to wait a while. Word of this will get out despite our best efforts. We can't afford to... We can't wait, I cut in. Her hands don't pause this time, but she sounds irked. And why is that? Because Gaxna is in danger, but that won't sway Regiana. The best time to expose the council is at Narimes' wedding tomorrow. Tomorrow? No. There's no way that can work. Think about it. Everyone in the temple will be there to read my proofs through the waters. Guild heads will be there too, and they'll see the crowd's reaction, hopefully see the council admit their guilt one way or another. There will never be a better time to get everyone's attention. Regiana gives me a final rub, then recaps the jars. It won't work. They'll just have you arrested, thrown away somewhere. 
There are monks in the temple loyal to my father, who've heard a lot of what I've found out, who want the traditionalists out. If it comes to a fight, they will protect me. Against the overseers? There are practically as many overseers in the city as there are monks in the temple. No, not against them. That's where you come in. She gives a rich laugh. I what, heal them into obedience? No, you stop them with bloodborne. Regiana snaps the case closed. As Miara would have me do? That, on top of word of us killing an overseer, it'd be too much. The city would rise against us. Unless they hear the truth about the council, understand the reasons you did it, then they would rise with you. Regiana sighs, sitting down across from me, and for a moment I see a much older woman in her, not just her skin, but her eyes, her attitude towards life. A bone-tired woman. It's a good idea, but things are too uncertain. If I act now, I risk the entire guild's future. If you don't act now, you risk it just the same. The Therakin stares at me for a long moment, eyes hard, then shakes her head. You'll make a good Therakin someday, girl. I'll make nothing of the sort, but I thank her anyway. So do we still have a deal? We have our damn deal. Now leave an old woman to drink her tea in peace. Twenty-eight. The attending girl shows me to a private room with a locking door on the same level. It's barely noon, but I'm exhausted from the morning and the night and Regiana and Deshaun and the Bloodborne. Still, I can't make myself sleep, so I sit up on a low pile of cushions and call for oil. A different girl brings me some, I am apparently important enough to merit my own serving girl now, and I begin to work it into the knots in my staff. It's always struck me as a contradiction that the main weapon of a water-worshipping people should need oil, should need to repel the very element we see as holy. That water, when it gets inside anything, wood or iron or stone, destroys it eventually. I wonder if I am like that, if the deeper I get into this game of religions and guilds, the more destruction I bring. It doesn't matter. I wouldn't stop if it meant the destruction of the whole city and the temple too. Better that than corruption destroys it slowly. Better to make a clean break. The girl brings me tea about the time I have the staff polished to a high gloss, and I turn to my thief's rope. It needs oil, too, to stay supple and silent, and as I work it in I wonder about Gaxna, wonder if they're feeding her, if they're torturing her, if she thinks I'm coming for her. Ironically, I wish I had some of her blood so I knew what she was feeling, even though she'd hate it. It kills me not to know. I have the rope polished and it's still barely mid-afternoon. I will leave before dawn to sneak into the temple, but that's still hours away. I call the girl back and she appears quickly in the door. Yes, ma'am. Bring me Mender Yellen. Confusion shows on her face. Who? Mender Yellen. She's a second-year student. Currently that way. I point, using my new awareness. The attendant's eyes widen in understanding and she goes. This is one wrong, at least, that I can write. The girl returns with Yellen a few minutes later. She looks like I remember her, wiry and scared and hiding it all under a brave mask. I know her too deeply now not to see through it, not to see myself in her and the fear that pulses underneath. You needed me? she asks. No, I say. I needed to apologize to you. Confusion mixes with the fear in her breast. I don't understand. I wave the attendant out and pour Yellen tea. What happened yesterday was wrong. I should not have taken your blood. They should not have made you give it. It's your place, ma'am. I wince at the honorific. Have you experienced blood sight yet? She shakes her head briefly, looking down. Well, it's too intimate for strangers, not something that should be given without permission. Will you sit? She sits. It's what they do. I do not miss that she calls Therakins they instead of we. Well, they shouldn't, not without permission. But I can't undo it now, so I want to offer you two things. The first is my blood. She gasps. It's only fair. When you learn blood sight, then you will have the same knowledge of me I have of you. Here, take it. I poke my thumb with a belt knife and offer it to her. After a moment she takes it, and I again get a flash of her thoughts overlapping the emotions of her blood sight until I almost feel as though I am her. I'm glad when it ends. And the other thing, ma'am? Call me Thea. The other thing is freedom. I meet her eyes. 
I've felt you weeping in the night, Yellen. I know what you think of these women in the safety of your own thoughts. There is a way out. Her eyes widen, but she shakes her head. It's, it's already been agreed. My family has nothing. The Therakins took me in. I remember Gaxon's story. That's what they do, apparently. Take girls with nothing to lose, then break them down so they can train them. They tried it with me, too. But there's a place up the peninsula from here. They take in girls like you, teach you a trade, give you another chance at life. A friend of mine knows them, Gaxna. Tell them Gaxna sent you. From the way her eyes widen, she knows about Gaxna, or maybe Gaxana. But I have nothing, not even these clothes are mine. The Therakins can spare those, I'm guessing. I pull a small gold ingot from my pocket, the last of my stash from the raid with Gaxna. Here, this will be enough to buy you passage on a caravan and pay for your first year's expenses. There are other girls there, girls like you. You can start again. Why are you doing this, she asks. The mistrust in her eyes hurts me. Yellen has not had an easy life. I shrug. To make myself feel better, maybe? It doesn't matter. There are a lot of things out of my control right now, but this is one thing I can do. She takes the ingot, and some part of me relaxes. Now it's up to her. You're the one, aren't you? She whispers. The one they're talking about. Probably. Her eyes widen. Are you really battling the overseers? I grimace. Not exactly, though, yes, I have fought a few. I pull the scarf down so she can see the bruises on my neck. The last time didn't go so well. Cautiously, she takes a sip of tea. Then why are you doing it? They murdered my father. I'm surprised to feel tears well up, surprised at how strong they are. They murdered my father. Yellen looks uncomfortable, then reaches a hand over. Not that I even knew him, I go on, making myself, but he deserved better. And they're corrupting the temple. It used to be a place where people could go for answers, for justice, for guidance in their problems. Now it's all money and politics and people getting disappeared. Yellen sets her cup down. That's why the Therakents are posting women at every fountain, to try to keep order. My laugh sounds bitter. Maybe, or maybe they just want power. As I say it, I realize my reasons for fighting feel different now. That I still want justice in a safe city, but I haven't said the deepest one. They have someone I love, I say. Maybe the only person I love. And I want her back. Yellen nods like she knows, and consolation comes through our bond. And if you lose her, you lose everything. Yeah, I say, words failing me. Pretty much. Her fingers start tapping against the wood. Her eyes widen, watching them, fear spiking inside. I have to go. I frown, then realize someone is blood pushing her, probably calling her to class. She stands. Remember what I said, I say. You don't have to stay here. Use the gold to book passage up the peninsula and ask for a seamstress named Agrita. You'll be safe there. She nods, and the panic, fear, and hope surging in her breast surge in mine, too. Then she scurries out, and her emotions fade into my waves of worry and fear and responsibility. I take a deep breath. The currents are too strong to ice. I visualize them as a waterfall instead, and myself a great mossy stone in the center. I let it all run over me and downstream, and try not to get caught in the current. The current I can't avoid is Gaxna. Gaxna, who never wanted any part of all this, but stuck her neck out to help me anyway, who was just trying to escape the city's politics, and I dragged her back into it. Gaxna, who's lost an eye to her last partner, and now could be killed for knowing me. She's probably cursing my name right now. She, more than anyone, is the reason I have to do this. I don't want Narimes to win, or the temple to fall, or the world to get swallowed in a sudden deluge. But more than all that, I want her back. Want the life we got a little taste of before everything went to shit. Because what is all this worth if I ended alone? I try to ice the fear that wells up, the deepest one, sitting cross-legged on the Therakin's cushions, breath slow and steady. The fear of being alone of being abandoned by my father and now maybe losing the only person I have left. I recognize that deep down this has always been my fear, that my dad put me in the temple because I wasn't good enough, that he died because I wasn't good enough, that Gaxna would figure me out sooner or later and leave too, that she hates me even now. I know it's crazy, I know it's probably not true, but I can't ice it. 
It's too strong. This is something I have to live with. So I sit on a cushion the night before the world ends and breathe deep, stealing myself for the fight. Twenty-nine. I'm out before dawn. There's no guarantee of safety outside these walls, that there won't be another blood-born overseer, or just a regular overseer, seeking my death. So I take my time working across Old Saray. The rooftops are too widely spaced to really run, but with a combination of thief's rope and long climbs, I keep myself off the street and out of sight. I'm not headed for the temple, not directly. It's surrounded on three sides by gardens, where the contemplatives often spend the day reading and meditating. I have no illusions that the maid's outfit I took from Gaxna's yesterday will fool any of them, even with all her training on how to move and talk. My eyes are still violet, and what would a maid be doing climbing a wall into the temple? So I head across Old Saray, not up it, toward the sea cliffs that rise straight from the waters. This is the fourth side of the temple, the bleached limestone cliffs and caves, where hermits and retreatants go to be alone, or to prepare for immersion. I have to be careful. Ironically, the risk is greater to me once I'm on the cliffs and above open water. A fall from a rooftop or wall would likely mean injury, maybe a broken limb or arm. But a fall into the ocean would be death, not from broken limbs, but from a mind unprepared for immersion. Most aspirants spend ten days to a month in the sea cliffs, meditating and preparing themselves, and some still go mad, or just never come back to the surface. In this state of mind, I'd probably crack before I was all the way wet. So I take my time, crabbing across the steep cliffs, thankful for all the hours of training with Gaxna. My goal is not the temple itself. Hundreds of feet above, the white marble juts from the edge of the cliff, River Thel spilling from its edge. That's where they almost threw me off last week where they did throw my dad's body off, along with lies about how he died. And it's where the wedding will be, so I can't just climb up. Instead, I search for one of the caves that pepper the cliffside, that will lead back to the maze of stairs and tunnels that connect to the temple proper. The sun rises while I climb, purple glow warming to orange, and then brief flashes of light through the clouds on the horizon. My arms are aching by the time I notice an opening above me and climb into a narrow cave. It's empty, though the incense and urns of water tell me it connects to the rest of the caves. They are supplies for a retreatant to live in isolation. Strange to think that some of my classmates are probably doing that right now, somewhere else in the caves. That that could have been me if I'd stayed in the temple, and survived, and not been a girl. I take a long pull of the water. No, that never would have been me. I see it now. No matter how good I was, how strong I was, the traditionalists would have kept me from the top, kept me out of the houses, delayed my immersion, then my elevation to seership, because every step would mean another challenge to their system, another proof that the city's male-female divide is wrong, that there is no divide outside people's minds. I take a deep breath and head into the caves, keeping the urn of water. This is where the real danger starts. Not only do I not know where I'm going, my maid costume looks out of place here. Not to mention my eyes, though the darkness of the caves helps. The only light comes from the intermittent caves opening to the sea, many of the stretches dark. I head up, taking every set of stairs I find, choosing randomly at branchings, praying I don't see anyone, and knowing it's only a matter of time until I do. The first person I meet is a senior monk, I think. I don't dare raise my eyes to look at him, just clutch the urn as though I'm bringing it up to be filled, and pass as quickly as I can. He keeps going, likely heading down to the water to spend the day immersed. It is the ultimate meditation for seers, and while it's not required, most monks retire from active life in their fourth or fifth decade to spend their waning years in the caves. The next few I meet are the same, weathered old feet sticking from threadbare robes. My heart seizes when one of them grabs my arm, a firm grip, too strong for an old man. None of our plans will matter if I get discovered right here. Girl, he says, casually commanding. I keep my eyes down. Yes, Lord. Fetch me some sweetmeats from the wedding preparations when you're done with that. I'll leave the celebrating to those more inclined. Cave of watered promises. Yes, Lord, I say again, wondering if I will have to fight this man. 
I left my staff behind, of course. What maid carries a staff? But I am deadly with my hands, too. If he was an overseer before retirement, it still might not matter. He grunts and moves on, and I breathe a sigh of relief. I wonder briefly if he's a loyalist, for not wanting to be at the wedding, or someone caught in between, loyal to neither side. This last seems more likely from his tone. How many more are there like him, caught between my father's legacy and Narimes' lies? What will they do when they read my proofs in the waters? Which side will they take? I make it the rest of the way to the kitchens without incident. Here, at least, I am dressed appropriately, and I know my way around. Know which stairs to take to get to the roof with the least amount of exposure. A wave of nostalgia hits me, walking through the early morning kitchens with a bowl of diced eggplant in my hands. This was one of my favorite parts of the temple, one of my safe places, a place I could remember my dad. I passed the spot where Deshaun snuck up on me, offering me a position in his house if I'd let them all beat me. What would have happened if I'd said yes? It already seems like a lifetime ago. Thea, a voice sneers, and I nearly drop my bowl. I spin to see Meldon, the kid I beat up in the kitchens, one of the gang who came to take me from my room. Someone's going to be happy to know you're here. I react without thinking, slamming him into the wall by his throat. Don't be an idiot, Meldon. You remember what happened last time you crossed me, and I'm not bound by the rules anymore. His eyes widen, and through his skin I read the sheer, panicked thoughts that have always made his blind so flimsy. My first instinct is to knock him senseless, but I calm it. He could be useful. In here, I snarl, jerking my head at a supply closet. He goes, already too cowed to call out. I shut the door behind us and kick him in the knees, remembering the way he grinned at me the night they came to abduct me. He falls, knowing better than to fight, apparently, and I kneel on his arms. Tell me what's happening upstairs. I push the thought through our skin. He gasps. He's probably never had thoughts pushed into him before. Opens his mouth, and I shake my head. Think it, I say. Show me. His thoughts are a jumble, but I see laborers setting up chairs on the wide balcony beyond the deepling pool, where the temple juts past the cliff edge, preparing for the wedding. Who's coming? I see all the theocrats and students and a line forming at the gate from town, Important people coming to pay their respects. Good. How many are loyal to me? Confusion. I hold back a curse. Was Deshaun lying? The loyalists. How many think Narimes has gone too far? His mind clears up some then, and I get a rough sense of many people, including Erte and some of the other trainers. Not nearly half the temple, though, according to Meldon's estimate. Then again, I can tell he's not one of them, so maybe he's seeing what he wants to. Is there any talk of me? of setting up a trap or anything like that? Gaxna comes up in his mind, dirty and bruised, blood scabbed down one side of her face. Being dragged through the temple halls, one of Narimes' men announcing there would be a reward for anyone who had information on her or me. I unclench my fists, calm my breathing. She's alive, at least, or she was two days ago. Meldon doesn't seem to know anything else about me or a trap, but that doesn't mean much. He's just a student, after all. I lean down into his face. Who sent you that night? Who got you and the other guys together to drag me out of my room? Narimes. I follow the flurry of Meldon's thoughts from a whispering in his student house to a note with a theocratic seal to the memory of them dragging me, unconscious, up to the deepling pool, where Narimes thanked them and praised their house leader for his bravery. The ass. The whole lot of asses. Anyways, it's what I needed to know. One more nail in the traditionalist's coffin. And now there's just one more thing I need from Meldon. Strip, I say through the bond. He goggles. What? Strip, I repeat, then get up and watch him, ready to respond if he tries anything. He doesn't. I almost wish he would, the pathetic way he pulls his robes off, eyeing me like a beaten dog. He reaches for his undergarments and I wave my hands, then pull off my own disguise. He goggles at me and I snarl, pointing to the ground. He gets down and I'm glad I can't read his thoughts, from the mixture of fear and anticipation on his face. What does he think will happen here? I tear my maid's blouse into long strips and use them to tie his wrists and ankles, then knot those together, then tighten a blindfold over his eyes and a gag in his mouth. His mind is a panicked whirlwind when I touch him. Stay here, I say through the bond. Don't do anything stupid. 
In about six hours this temple will be mine, and your whole future will be at my mercy. I haven't been impressed so far. I will be less impressed if you try to rat me out. So do what you do best, and lie down until the danger's over, okay? He actually nods. I pull his robes on, adjusting the sash around the middle until they look more like they fit me, wincing at the stale odor of sweat in the sleeves. Drag him behind a stack of empty sacks and start to leave. Then I remember my hair. Gaxna cut it, but it's still too long. Most students and seers keep their heads shaved. I refused out of principle, but now I need to blend in. Ironic that I still need a disguise for it. So I rummage on the shelves till I find a sharp paring knife, then spend an unpleasant fifteen minutes shaving as best I can in the runoff water that flows in a channel across the floor. The shave job is not pretty, uneven under my hands, but it will take me from standing out to just looking a little odd. That in my eyes, but there's nothing I can do about them. I walk out of the storeroom, standing straight, letting my body relax into the familiar posture of a seer, the fluid readiness that still feels more natural than the thief's crouch or the porter's swagger or any of the other stances Gaxna taught me. I will always be a seer at heart. I'm not ashamed of it, despite what the temple's become. I climb stairs to the upper level, taking side corridors around the dormitories till I get to the training rooms. There are students training, though fewer than usual. It's likely been declared a rest day. I keep my head down, my pace quick, and pray no one stops me. They don't. I slip into a training room, the same one where I face Narimes, and walk to the far wall. The water feels wonderful on my feet, but I don't linger. The vine carvings on the outside of the wall work like handholds, and I pull myself up to the roof like I used to when I needed to be alone. It's easy as climbing a ladder now, and I smile to remember how hard it used to be. The temple roof is a long, peaked stretch of marble slabs, visible to both sides, so it's a tricky walk down to the end, but I make it. The air bustles with talk as laborers prepare the ledge below, and incense smoke wafts thick from the altars they set up to either side of the pool. It will likely be hours until the ceremony, but I'm here and safe. I can only hope Deshaun and Regiana are having the same luck. 30. The sun crests in the sky, and wedding guests start to arrive, a charged undertone to their conversation. They will have heard of the overseer, of course, and Gaxna getting arrested for it. Has there been any mention of me, or of the overseer the Therican guards killed yesterday? I'm too high up to make out any words in particular, but I find a place on the edge of the roof where I can observe the crowd below. It would be better to stay totally hidden, but I need all the information I can get where the guests are sitting, who the loyalists are, if I can make them out, where my safety will be when things go wrong. I ice the anxiety inside and correct myself, if things go wrong. The first thing I see chills me to the bone. Overseers, eight or ten of them, lining the wall to both sides of the hall. Where did they come from? Did the Therakins fail? Or did Regiana sell me out in some further political game of her own? I trust the woman, but a lot is at stake here. Then two more overseers march to the front, something held between them. No, some one. Gaxna. It takes everything I have not to cry out, not to leap down from the roof and attack the men holding her. Gaxna is beaten and bruised, her hair matted with blood, her eyes swollen to nearly double. Anger and guilt swell in my chest. This is my fault, but they also didn't have to do this to her. They herd her to the left of the ceremony platform, hands tied, and one of the guards tries to adjust her position. She bites at him and I grin. They haven't broken her, at least. But why is she here? Why have a prisoner at a wedding? Unless they're planning to drown her as part of the ceremony, to show Norimes' justice or something. Or they expect me to be here and need her for whatever they're planning. Either way, I know the truth about my father, have damning proof that the traditionalists sold out the temple even if I don't know exactly how Arayim or the Therakins fit. When the temple reads my memories, there will be no denying Narimes' guilt. Still, I would feel better if Gaxna wasn't here, in case it comes down to a fight. I spot Erte and Deshaun in the crowd, Erte with the trainers and Deshaun with our class, back in the student section. I try to see any kind of signs on them, any indication they're standing with other loyalists, but I can't. I don't see anything new in the ranks of seers either, anything to indicate whether they are loyalists or traditionalists. 
Was Meldon right that the traditionalists outnumber the loyalists? What will happen if it comes to a fight? I'd like to think my evidence will be proof enough to convert the whole temple, but... Music starts, the overlapping flute textures of a Nujayan hymn, and everyone quiets, looking to the back. Nurime centers, flanked by senior theocrats, his narrow body accentuated by the flowing robes of state. He looks calm, in control, black eyes glancing at the hundreds of people arrayed to either side. I want to leap down and wipe the smug expression from his face, but there will be time for that. A crier at the front announces him in his full, undeserved title, then the crowd quiets again. The flute changes to a lower, more mournful song, and the door at the back opens. A Salem Dale woman steps out, tall and elegant, with a dark scar standing out on one cheek. Shejon Yeolat. She is another piece I haven't quite fit into this, though I know she's involved. Ooh, Jay, but I want to jump down and end this, to spit in the Chosen's face and turn his temple against him. But there's one more thing I need. It comes as the theocrats intone the cleansing of the waters, the ritual beginning to any important event in the temple. Yellen has been outside all morning, doing chores in the hot sun, her feelings a familiar knot inside mine, loneliness and fear, and a touch of hope now. Those emotions shift as the theocrats finish, and the Ujela chronicler, second only to Nerimes, steps up to the dais to begin. Yellen feels surprise, then confusion and mistrust, then her whole body is suddenly cold, like she's been tossed into a fountain. She has been tossed into a fountain, actually. This is the sign from Regiana, the signal that they've summoned Bloodborne in the streets to control the overseers, and that it's working. The temple's police force won't be able to interrupt me. This is it, then. I stand up, loosen the staff on my back, and jump off the edge. Thirty-one. I land with a splash in the running water between Nerimes and the crowd, one fist to the stone. There's a sudden uproar, and I stand with deliberation to face the people, throwing my hood back so they can see my eyes, violet eyes, my father's eyes. The sight makes the crowd fall silent, then the roar is doubled. I raise my head, eyeing the temple that raised and rejected me, then push my thoughts into the water. I am Alethea Viola, of the House Viola, former student of this temple and daughter of its rightful chosen. There are gasps. Many of these seers have likely never experienced thought-pushing. I use the advantage it gives me to press my case. Since Nerimes tried to kill me one week ago, I have hidden in the city gathering evidence about his crimes against us. I stand here today to tell you he is a usurper and murderer, unfit for the Ujela Dias. The roar triples, men leaping from their chairs. I glance back at Nerimes, unsure how much time I have. The man stands unperturbed, watching me as though I pose no threat. I ice the fear that comes up, the sudden sense that this is all going according to his plan, not mine. To my left, two overseers detach from the wall, their thoughts too buried in the absolute chaos of the water to read, but their intentions clear enough. I tense, glancing at Deshaun. I knew it might come to a fight, but I'd hope to have more time. No matter. I start to uncoil the rope from my waist. Stop! Nerime says, echoing his speech in the water, and his command cuts through the roar. The crowd stops talking like it was slapped, and the Chosen smiles. There, that's better. Alethea, how nice of you to join us. The overseers stop too, for now at least. I turn to Nerimes. There's nothing nice about this, except for you finally getting justice. Justice? For what? he asks, playing neatly into my hands. Too neatly. He has a plan, I'm sure of it now, but I don't know what. And this is my only chance to expose him. I have to risk it. For spreading lies about my father. For selling us to the Dale to get into power. For trying to kill me when I learn the truth. Thoughts churn in the water like a barrel of snakes. I ignore them, focusing on Nerimes, on figuring out his angle. Alethea, he says, we all mourned your father's passing but the training should have taught you better ways to deal with your grief. I grip my teeth at his tone, like I'm some wayward student and he's a teacher forced to make an example of me in front of the class. I turn back to the crowd. 
Narimes campaigned against my father on claims Sturg John was a heretic, that he ruined trade, and that he created conflict with the Therakent Guild. I have proof those were all lies, were in actuality problems the counselor the allies caused in order to make my father look bad, and that Yeolat paid for all of it. There is a rush of nervous whispers from the back of the hall where the merchants are clustered, but closer in the seers all watch with still faces. They're not surprised. Deshaun spread what I knew a few days ago, so they know the arguments, though they haven't seen direct proof. Nurime steeples his fingers. Oh, do tell. I frown. This was the moment I expected he would call in his supporters, on the overseers, that a fight would happen if it was going to, to stop me before I could reveal his guilt. Instead, he invites me to do it? Everything is wrong about this. I push on. My father was no heretic, I say, to the crowd as much to him. I spoke to the criers in town and got confirmation their guild was bribed to spread those rumors, to announce he was a heretic, though there was no truth to it. The merchants' whispers increase, but the seers still watch me with silent eyes. Bold claims, Nurime says. And your proof? This is also the moment I was waiting for, with more anxiety than the thought of the temple descending into civil war. But I have to do it. I stand up straight, take a deep breath, and drop my blind. It's like stripping naked in front of my entire school, and it takes me a minute to just ice every wave of embarrassment and shame and fear that comes up, doubly hard because they can all read my thoughts as I do it. I get my emotions under control, though, and direct my thoughts to the memories of the crier in the streets of Surrey, confirming the guild was paid to spread lies about my father. It does what I want. I stand there mentally naked and let them read my memories, my past, unable to hide all the thoughts I had at that time about Gaxna, about stealing, all my anger and fear and rage, but more importantly, all the information I learned about the criers getting bribed. The seers gasp, looking at each other, water again roiling with thoughts, some of them so surprised that they start talking out loud. There, they're learning the truth now that Nerimes and his council didn't just sweep in after my father's murder. They set it up. I turn to the Chosen, victorious, but he still looks unconcerned. Waits for the hubbub to die down, then makes a dismissive wave with one hand. Criers, you can't trust the things. If they can be paid to lie once, why not again? How do we know you didn't first pay these criers to say what you wanted? Because I didn't. You can see it all right here in my memories. I run through them again, including more time before and after, but again he waves a hand. Selective memories. Still no proof you didn't bribe them some other time. But go on. You had something about trade? The crowd seems to sway back on the basis of Narimes' argument, on the man's unshakable confidence, but I'm not done yet, not by an ocean's length. The city's trade slowed in the last few months of my father's rule, I say. It was one of the things Nerimes used to argue Sturgjohn was unfit for the dais, but Ujian dock workers and Salem Dale laborers alike confirm it was a cover-up, that the Dale warehouses were actually full to the rafters with goods they were just refusing to sell, that they were buying goods for higher prices up coast to keep traders from coming to our port, all to make trade look depressed, and all on Yeolat's orders. I call up the memories and let them play out. Not only that, but local merchants confirmed they were given money to stay in business during the slump. The whole thing was a manipulation to make it look like my father had sabotaged trade. A further proof of which you can see in how quickly everything went back to normal after Narimes took office. The Chosen raises an eyebrow. Some call that competence, my dear. Still, I see the faces in the crowd growing sympathetic. There's no denying my memories. What's more, the Salem Dale dock worker confirmed Yeolat was involved in the manipulation. He remembered her specifically when I asked who was behind it. I play that memory too, lingering on the image I read in his mind of Yeolat. My age mate Deshaun may not have been the only one to see Dale chests of money entering the temple a few months back. I play that memory too, and am pleased to see Deshaun echo it with his own in the water. Is taking foreign money to gain power not treason enough to condemn Narimes? Is Arujela Dias just another trinket available to the highest bidder? It is no accident you see a Salem Dale woman standing before you in matrimony today. More mutters in the crowd. Narime still looks unworried, but Yeolat's face is a thundercloud. Mind which games you play, girl, she hisses in the clipped tones of the Dale, especially when you don't know the rules. 
Nurimes gives me a tight smile and turns to the crowd. Again, dock workers, would you take their word against mine? Especially when Alethea here used force to coerce the one and flirted the other into saying what she wanted? I blush, remembering the interaction with the first dock worker, then ice the emotion, hard as it is with everyone reading my thoughts all the while. That had nothing to do with this, and I used force to make sure the man was telling the truth. Anyway, I was reading his thoughts. There was no way he could lie. Unusual methods, to say the least, Nurime says. But go on. What is the man's plan? A knot of worry kinks in my stomach even as I see my proof sway the monks. He should be running, fighting, anything other than smiling a pleased little smile. You mentioned the Therakins, he prompts. Yes, I say, icing the uncertainty. I have proof from their own mouths that they had no conflict with my father or the temple, but were tricked into thinking we were going to attack them, and that's why they started policing the streets more, which you then used to argue my father was stirring trouble with them and to fuel your current call to arms against them. I bring up the memories and let them play out, knowing this is my last piece of evidence, my last chance to make it all stick. So I ask you, seers and merchants of Ujjay, is this the man you want leading your city? The one who lied and manipulated his way to power? That would start a war with the Therakins? That sold our dais in exchange for who knows what? Can you in good faith witness this marriage? Enough, Nurime says, but I roll on. Knowing it was paid for by the death of our rightful chosen? Enough, he thunders. And I relax for a moment, even as I worry about what he has planned. Because I know I got to him. Can see it on the faces of the seers, too. They know the truth now. Yes, I turn to him, it is enough. Enough to prove that you usurped the dais, that my father was innocent, and that you should be given to Ujjay. On the basis of the Therakin's proof? On the basis of all this proof, I say. I see my mistake a moment later. Nurime smiles, victorious. You condemn yourself, young Alethea. He turns to the crowd. How would any seer from the temple get information from a Therakin unless they were secretly in league with them? The current of opinion swirls like the rage and worry in my gut. I am not in league with them. You all know me, know my father, know the Viola have always been loyal to the temple. Your father was a heretic, Nurime says. Why else would he put a girl into training? It is high time we finally erased his heresy. The swirl resolves into pure anger. I don't bother icing it. I am no heretic. Everyone in this temple knows I have water sight, knows I've always been at the top of my class, and my sex has nothing to do with it. Erte, will you not speak for me? The wise and trainer raises his head, but does not spoil his dignity with words, speaking instead into the water. She is of true heart and mind. This I have seen after many years of working with her. She is an asset to the temple, perhaps our greatest. Nerimes raises his eyebrows. I see. How, then, do you explain this? He snaps his fingers, and a new mind enters the water. I look up to see a heavily bandaged man at the back, his fingers trailing in the water. The overseer I attacked. Floods. His memories are damning, of course. Of me attacking him in the Salem Dale warehouse, knocking the barrels down, forcing my proofs into his mind, and using the resulting confusion to defeat him. He conveniently leaves out the last part, where I argued for the justice of my cause, and asked him to tell his age mates. I add this, but the water is astir with his revelations, and Nerimes rides the wave. You see, brothers, what sort of loyalist she is. I was defending myself, I cry, leaving the memory open. He attacked me unjustly. You were stealing, Yelat spits, from my warehouse. To survive while the whole city hunted me, I retort while Nerimes called for my death so no one would ever find out the truth. It does not change the fact, the Chosen says, that you are in league with the witches. The seers turn to me with cold eyes. Sympathetic to me or not, the temple has always hated the Therakins. I am not. You heard Erte. Ah, but you have blood sight, don't you? I think of Yellen before I can stop myself. I slam my blind down a moment later, but the room goes dead quiet. I have water sight. That's all that matters. Then why have you closed your thoughts, little one? You were one of them all along, as your father was. He was selling out the temple, and you are the witch he tried to plant among us. I am no witch. 
I'm a woman, it's true, but I'm just as deeply a seer. You all know that. I could not show and read these proofs before you if I did not have water sight. And I wouldn't be here risking my life to expose injustice if I didn't think the temple was worth it. I can't help a glance at Gaxna as I say this, because part of me hates that I put the temple before her, before us, that I was willing to risk her for what I wanted. Guilt presses in on me just when I least need it. Then why do the Therakens protect you, Nerimes goes on, oblivious now that my blind is up. Why do you not mention the overseer they killed for you? I gasp. He snaps his fingers, and another memory opens in the waters. Not mine or the dead overseer's, but someone else, someone who is watching from a rooftop nearby, watching my brief struggle against the overseer, then the arrow that takes him in the ear, and the Therakent guards cleaning up the evidence before hustling me away. It is damning. And yet, I didn't ask for that. The man was trying to kill me. Probably no good saying he was bloodborne too. Because you ordered it. Still, I can feel the temple's tide shift further away from me. What they see is the Therakent's killing an overseer, a brother, to protect me. Like I was a Therakent. I turn to the crowd, desperate. Drop my blind again, heedless of the memories of Yellen in my blood sight, to show what really happened that morning. That's not what happened. Yes, I consulted with them to learn the truth. Yes, I bargained for their help because I could not do this alone. But I'm loyal to the temple. As I say it, I realize it's not exactly true. I'm loyal to a memory of the temple, not this one. To Jay, to the city, to all the people who've been forever held back by this stupid war between Seers and Therakins. Would you follow me to finally making peace with them, or follow this man, I jab my finger back at him, into more war and conflict in the name of pride and petty division? The tide shifts again, but I can't tell in which direction. My plan is coming apart. The question, Narime says, is whether you believe the daughter of a deposed heretic and proven witch, or the rightful chosen of Ujay. Too many faces turn at his words. You've seen my proofs, I counter. The waters don't lie. But what of your leader? Why does he not open his mind to us and prove he did none of the things I accuse? Why does he fear the transparency of Ujay? Narimes freezes, open mouth. I've got him. Then he smiles. Secrets of counsel, he says. There are things too delicate to release into the general public. It is for the temple's own good. It's a good argument, but a second too late. The crowd has seen his hesitation, seen my proofs and also his, and I watch for a sickening moment as the whole room lurches, a ship caught in a midwinter storm, water seething beneath my feet. Guards, Nurimes calls, uncertainty lighting his face too. Overseers, take this girl away. They hesitate, looking from Nurimes to me, another disaster balanced on the razor's edge. The girl is rightful, Erte cries, echoing his words in the water. Her cause is just. All those loyal to Jay rise up and defeat the usurper. The room hangs a moment longer, every man looking to the other, then shatters into a hundred different knots of men, all pulling staffs and spears and swords. A battle it is, then. I never wanted this, but I'm ready for it. I raise my blind, pull my staff, and push my awareness into the water. Hundreds of voices cry there, men in pain, merchants in panic, loyalists calling to each other, and undecided seers caught in the battle. Then the sharp, rapid thoughts of men locked in combat. One comes for me, a tall seer I recognize from the overseer's council, swinging a heavy ironwood staff. I duck under its blow, seeking his mind, finding a hint behind his shaking blind of an old stomach wound. I dart forward, punching the wound on my way past. It's not the way of the temple to fight like this, not the tactic of an honorable seer, but I was never a seer in their eyes, and I've learned a lot since the temple. That, and I have someone I care about more than honor. Others come for me, some to attack, some to defend, and I dance through them all, trading staff for sword for cudgel in the shifting sea of bodies. Already a few men lie on the floor, trampled and dying. A seer jabs at me with a knife, and I catch the blade in my cudgel, then punch savagely across his wrist, shattering it. His blind shatters at the same time, sending a wail of pain through the water, and I use the temporary winds of everyone nearby to push through. Gaxna. I have to get to my friend. 
get her free and able to climb out of here before the overseers take matters into their own hands. Or Norimes does. Something hits me in the face and I swim sideways, turning it into a rising kick that takes someone, my attacker, in the sternum. This is probably a trap. Norimes probably brought Gaxna here knowing I'd defend her, knowing I'd go for her when the fight started. I don't care. I've done what I can for my father. Now it's time for me. I lean sideways around a sword thrust meant for someone else, slip behind a trainer I recognize from second year, and break out into a clear space. Clear because a trio of overseers stand back to back, fighting off anyone who comes close. Gaxna is tied up between them. I don't wait. I can't wait. The first lunges for me and I counter his blow, left hand freeing my rope. He strikes back, snake fast, and I counter again, seeking his mind in the water, finding only a winter cold blind. The other two ignore us, fending off anyone else who comes near. He strikes a third time, and I'm ready. I step left and take the blow on my forearm, using the opening to throw my thief's rope. It catches on his calf, and I jerk back as he swings in again. His blow lands, but my rope pulls a leg out under him, and as he teeters I strike with my club, a quick slash to the knee and a two-arm swing at the temple once he's down. His mind vanishes from the water, unconscious, and then the other two are on me. I pull the thief's rope up, but with two overseers attacking, it's all I can do to stand my ground, to keep from getting gutted by the sword of the first or brained by the staff of the second. Then a knot of men push in behind me, Deshaun at their head, and suddenly the numbers are on my side. Deshaun and a senior seer engage the first overseer, and I use my rope against the second, catching an arm and pulling him off balance enough that the men behind me can land blows. I don't wait to see how it ends, to check on the battle overall. I run to Gaxna, ungag her, untie her hands, wrap my arms around her, though it's the middle of battle and we could die at any time. I can't help myself. Gaxna, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. For what, she barks, gruff as ever, though she hugs me just as tight. For everything, for getting you into this, she shakes her head against mine. First rule of thievery, never apologize for something if you don't need to. I smile in relief, pressing my cheek into hers. I missed you, I whisper into her ear, battle raging around us. Ujay and Jaya, how I missed you. She breathes in as though to speak, then shoves me away. A second later, a staff swishes between us, in the space that would have been my head, and I ice my shock. I spin to find Norimes, his narrow face still supremely confident, but angry now, too. Stupid girl, he snaps, sweeping his staff left in a low strike I block with my cudgel. You were supposed to be dead. Turns out, I say, stepping on his staff and throwing the cudgel at his head, I have a thing for staying alive. He dodges, but the move pulls the staff from his hand, and I snatch it up. Gaxna, I hiss, advancing on the Chosen. Go! I can't see if she does or not. Nurimes is striking in again, fists as deadly as any blade, and it's all I can do to counter him. I seek his mind in the water, any premonition of his moves, but find only silence there, a dead bubble in the middle of the room's shouts and cries and panic. He chops left. I dodge and try a sternum strike. He grabs the staff. I kick his hand, and the dance is joined, fist and foot and staff and steel. I'm good, the best of my class, better than most full seers he's better. I take a bruising blow to the forearm as I'm trying to sweep his feet out and revise that. He's not just better, he's inhuman. His punches land too strong, his hands blur too fast, his blind is too perfect even in the middle of battle. His moves are always a split second ahead of mine, like he can see right through my defenses. There's no space to use my thief rope, or to climb, or do anything but desperately block and dodge and try to land my own blows. I get maybe one in for every three of his, and my body starts to weaken, pain and exhaustion creeping in. I miss a jab and he pulls the staff forward, jerking me in for a crushing blow to the ribs. I stagger on my feet, trying a downward kick meant to dislocate his ankle, but the man dances away, then, before I can react, swings in with a fist that will knock me unconscious. This is it then, the end of my story. I have no doubt he will kill me, and once I'm dead, so is Gaxna, so is my father's legacy, so is any hope of stopping Norimes' pollution. A fist catches the blow. 
I turn to see Erte, weathered face a mask of determination. He nods at me, already shifting into wind carries wave to meet Narimes' next move, and I clear my head, ice my thoughts, breathe deep, and attack. The fight is much different with two of us. Narimes is still impossibly fast, his moves always the perfect counter to what we try, but the man only has so many hands. We begin to drive him back. Erte's spring erodes the stone, matching my thunder shakes the rooftops, my foot and his staff landing on the Chosen's lean body in rapid succession. We push him out of the melee, over the dais, toward the edge of the balcony, where the temple's water flows off the cliff. Men rally to his side, others rally to ours, and for a period of minutes or hours we are the edge of a greater tide, shifting back and forth in a sea of blows and counters. In a brief moment I glance back at the wedding chamber, now a mess of shattered dishes and overturned tables and men fighting for their lives. It's not easy to tell, but those around Deshaun seem stronger, more numerous. Gaxna is there, swinging the leg from a table, and I want to go to her, but a moment is all I can spare. We're winning. That's enough. I turn back to find Arime striking at me with a sword he took from a fallen seer, and I bash it aside with the ironwood staff, pushing closer. Men are falling to either side, dead or disabled, but Erte and I keep hounding Narimes, forcing the man to give ground beneath the fury of our combined attacks. There is a peace in Erte's mind that I admire, a stability that I don't have, but what I lack there I make up in speed, in water sight, and in tricks neither expects, like climbing the balcony to leap at Narimes from above. He counters with wave strike stone, but it's awkward against someone falling from above, and Erte gets in a solid blow to the Chosen's ribs. There's a noise behind, some confusion, but I land and keep pressing, Erte and I to either side of the man now, keeping him spinning, wearing him down. I strike at his legs and he jumps, far hand blocking a blow from Erte, who counters with an ice fingers rising that makes his fall awkward. Seeing an opening, I leap in, jabbing hard at the Chosen's temple with my staff. It's why I don't see the spear that goes through Erte's chest until I hear him gasp. Until I turn from Narimes' last second block to see the overseer behind Erte, grimly pulling the blade from my trainer's chest. Behind him, waves of overseers crash into the battle, stoic and methodical and deadly. They shouldn't be here. Regiana was supposed to stop them in the city with Bloodborne. Narimes rolls to his feet with a snarl while I fend off the overseer and kicks Erte into the water. Flooding heretic, he curses, shaking his robes loose. I should have killed you years ago. I have no space for grief. The overseer is joined by a second, and in my weakened state their combined attack is almost more than I can handle. I try pushing my thoughts into them, stunning them like I have other men, but my concentration is slipping too. One lands a blow to my side, and the other kicks me onto my back, knocking the wind from my lungs. Overseers, Narime snaps, and the attack stops. They look to him in surprise, and he waves them back. Enough. This one's mine. Fear floods me. Erte and I did well, but we didn't weaken Narimes enough for this to be a fight I can win. I ice it anyway. Give it up, Narimes, I gasp, trying to get up. The temple knows now. The city knows. Kill me or not, you won't be able to keep the dais. Won't I? He asks, turning to me with new focus. With an army of overseers behind me and a friend in the Theracans? I bare my teeth. Miara. And a few of her friends. He smiles, the confident ruler back, and gestures behind him. I see them then, ducking and weaving beside the overseers with their hooked rings flashing. Theracants, harvesting the blood of the fallen. You'd be surprised what those women would do for a chance at some blood. But the traditionalists, they would never agree to this. They hate the Theracants. His smile is oily. You'd be surprised what you can convince fundamentalists of in the name of orthodoxy. <laughs> the fools. So it was just Narimes, not his whole party. Narimes and Geolat and Miara. She must have been pushing R.A.M., but why? I shake my head. What's in it for you? He chuckles like it's a clever joke. What's always been in it for me? Control. These women control the loyalists, I control the overseers, and a new balance is born. Theracants under overseers under me, with your friends dead or bloodborne. Regiana, she wouldn't... 
Oh, your friend was quite loyal to the end, but despite her age, a touch naive. Miara's in control now, and she's quite all right with keeping me in power in exchange for a little loyalist blood. The horror of it hits me like a stone to the chest. Regiana didn't betray me. Her guild betrayed her, as the temple did my father. The ideals of both religions corrupted, and with Miara and Nerimes in control, were lost. And still, you can't. I push myself up. I won't let you. His smile widens, and my anger finally comes back. And what, my little one, are you planning to do about it? I attack and answer, put everything I have in a lightning strike to his face. He slaps it aside and plants a fist in my sternum that slams me against the rail. With so many loyal to you, he says, gliding up to me, I could not kill you outright, but now you have no one left. I strike again because I do have someone left, Gaxna. Gaxna, who I pray to Ojay, got out of here before the overseers came. He grabs my staff, jerking it from my hands, and throws it over the edge. Oh, I'm afraid she didn't, he says, closing in on me. I gasp. He read thoughts through my blind again. How? That smile again. There are greater powers in this world than Ujay's, girl. A pity you couldn't stay down when you were beaten. We might have made something of you. Gaxna, where? Nurime sparks something in the water, his voice like a thunderclap, and behind him I hear her scream. I lunge for her. No! His arm stops me, solid as ironwood, though it's slick with blood. I taste copper on my tongue. She's mine now, Alethea, though I think I might not kill her. An ex theracant with hints of water sight. She could be useful. He grins, and my hate knows no bounds. Who would have thought? I try a third attack, desperate. I'd rather die than let him have Gaxna. He slaps me down again, my head bouncing painfully off the stone. I'm just feet from the open edge of the balcony, with its 200-foot drop into immersion and death. There's nowhere left to run, Alethea, unless you'd care to repent and renounce your family line. Never, I spit. He would kill me anyway. Better to die here. Let my death be a message. You know, your father looked like that the moment before we pushed his head underwater, like a little lost puppy. Goodbye, Alethea, and good riddance. He raises his foot for avalanche meeting stone, a blow to end my life, and I do the only thing I can. I roll backwards off the edge. Thirty-two. For a moment, it's like I'm not falling at all, like I and the river separating into sparkling beads around me have learned to fly. Then the wind grabs my robes, and the cliffside plummets past, and the ocean rushes up. It's all I can do to get my feet downward in Seagull's beak. I don't know if I will go insane from immersion, but I'm going to do my best not to die on impact. My last thought before hitting is wishing I'd had time to go through the training, to spend the days in isolation, to take this test like a true seer. I hit. Momentum shoots me straight down, see green light fading as I descend, until I can't see the surface anymore, and I finally slow to a stop, the water is seeming to gel around me. I should be floating up, but it seems like I've paused somehow. The ocean isn't cold like I'd expect, and it doesn't move either. I've always been in water with a current. I try to swim, but it doesn't work, like running in a dream where I'm being chased. I get nowhere. Is this death? Is this what happens to students who never come back up? We just die down here? Funny how my thoughts haven't ended. They're not supposed to, Alethea. I gasp, somehow, in water, and turn to see Erte floating a few feet away from me, wise and face peaceful despite the bloody wound in his chest. Am I dead? Death, life, water carries both. But you, you're dead. I saw you die. Even now, blood seeps from his chest, fogging in the murky water. But my water continues as it did in life. There's something so natural about his tone, about him lecturing me on Ujay principles, that I almost forget where we are, what's happening. Or have you forgotten your fifth-year theology? It's natural enough I feel the usual spike of annoyance. That the body doesn't keep water more than two days, I recite. That we are like another stream, a slowed one, in current with the rivers around us. That yesterday my blood was water, 
and tomorrow will be again. Good. And where do they all end? Here, in the ocean. I get a spike of fear in my chest. I'm in the ocean, too deep to see light. Immersed. The death place and also the birthplace of all water, all life. Knowing Erte, this is as straight an answer as I will get from him about whether I'm alive or not, so I ice the fear. I'm conscious, at least, and there are bigger things to talk about. I'm sorry, Erte. I never meant to cause your death. He smiles. I have already told you I did not die, but if I did, it was not defending just you. It was defending Ujjay and the temple. He looks troubled as he says this last part. Even though I'm a heretic, though I caused so much trouble in the temple? You are no heretic. It is we who should have been labeled heretics. Do you remember the last time we talked? Our discussion of water, steam, and ice? In the training room, the day I had to flee. I remember. Then it is my turn to be sorry. Somehow in the city, you learned this lesson, while we in the temple failed to follow it. We remained ice, confident in our traditions, and allowed Narimes to break us. But you, my dear, you have learned how truly to be water. I am proud of you. This feels good for a second. Then I remember where I am. Not that it matters much now. I'm going to die down here, aren't I? Erte smiles. So wise, and yet so much to learn. He glances over my shoulder, and I sense someone behind me. I turn to see Regiana, hair floating in a halo all around her, face peaceful despite a mottled black hue. You're here too? It's a stupid question, but she doesn't snap at me. We all come here, child. I was faithful to Jaya, and her blood carries the same salt as the sea. Her voice is strange, like it's coming from all directions at once. Then I realize Erte is speaking too, in unison with her. You of all people, I would expect to understand that. The overseers, I say, remembering. They were the reason we lost the fight. What happened? Regiana scowls. I was betrayed. I should have seen it coming. Should have known they wouldn't stop at politics or bloodborne. They poisoned me, Niara and the rest. Saren root in my tea, I think. Tasteless until it begins to clot your blood. She was in league with Narimes. He said so up above. With Yaelat, too. I tried to stop them. You did well, child and you're not done yet. How? We were wrong. I didn't know before, but this... She gestures vaguely at the water around us. We were all wrong, ancestors and kin. But there's still time now. Don't ask how. Ask why. I understand this even less, but she's nodding to someone behind me. You would have made a fine Therakind, but I guess it's too late for that now. Do your best, girl. I turn to see who she's nodding to, and find a stern figure in robes of state, beard cut in a square line, eyes wide and violet. I gasp. Dad? Thea, he says, his voice echoed in Regiana and Erte. You've come. Anger comes up just as fast as the love, like you never came for me. His face clouds. I was preoccupied. The insight was never so clear as this, but I had tastes of it of what was coming. The Immersion Chronicles. So this is what was more important than being a father? This experience is unique to you, but all immersions say the same thing deep down. So what? What do you want to say to me? I'm too proud to ask for it even now, even with this strange underwater version of my father who might just be me going insane. Sturgjohn clenches his jaw. I was not a good father. I know that. I am sorry. It was hard for me once you'd grown. When your mother died, I, I spent a long time in the caves, in the water. That was when I realized we had missed Ujjay's message. So you abandoned me to the temple. No, I needed you in the temple. Needed someone I could trust. And the forces against me, Narimes, the others, he shakes his head. It was enough that I put a girl in without also seeming to favor her. I never thought they would kill me. I thought there was time. Well, there wasn't. I want to stay angry, but I feel it slipping away. Feel the deeper sadness coming up. The loneliness. Instead, you wasted the time we could have had. He shakes his head. I always knew you would survive the immersion. Knew we would have this time together. Have I survived it then? The thought of going back to the surface, 
to the ruin I made of the temple, to an undefeatable Nerimes doing whatever he wants to Gaxna, is suddenly horrible. The urge rises in me to just stay down here, to stay with my dad, though I know it means my death. No, you have to fight that urge, the urge to give up. Your trial is not over. He turns, and behind him is my mother, not the fragile, wasted thing she was on her death, but the vibrant, sweet-tongued woman I remember from my youth, violet silks floating all around her. Mom, are you okay? She cannot talk, Alethea. My father still speaks with the voices of Erte and Regiana, too. She has been here too long. My mother mouths the words, though I can't make out her voice. Can't remember it, either. The urge rises again to stay down here, to stay with her until we can talk. A new wave of anger brings me back. You never mourned her. It was like she died and you just gave up on the whole family. I mourned. In my own way. In the waters. That's where I saw that the plague that took her is part of our larger fate. It was a Salem Dale invention, Elethea. All the plagues have been. I clench my fists, anger redirecting, remembering Yaelat and what she did to destroy my father. So she killed my mother too. What do they want? What we all want, Father Mother Regiana Erte says, to save the world. What? I don't. But another figure is coming. My mother again, only shorter and less distinct somehow, her skin blurring into the water. Who is this? Your grandmother, the pilgrim from the North Shores. I never met her, but I know her all the same, recognize her violet eyes. Her blood runs in yours, Alethea. It is the second river of life. Behind her I see a long line of people, all violet-eyed. They don't speak, but I get images from them, flashes of light in the dark water. I see a long and frozen coastline. They see itself icing over, see them gathered around crackling fires, smoking dulse and telling long tales against the winter nights. I smell salmon cured and smoked twelve different ways, feel the brief, glorious summers when the mountains burst into green. There are more people now, a great ring of them, expanding above and below me, showing me their life, our life, before we came to Saray. The palaces we built on the rocky promontories, the huts that came before that, the simple mud shacks along the shore in an early time when the ocean didn't freeze and the waters teemed with clams and sea spiders and kelp forests. To a time before that, when the mountains above the shore were still dirt, still silt and mud, to the last deluge, when a starved boatload of people arrived on the shores, their strange clothes in tatters, their gleaming cities destroyed in a single day. This is our past, Alethea, and our future. What? Wait. But the images roll on, back to the North Shore palaces, to the decrepit shambles I understand are today, to the winters that grew longer, forcing my grandmother and others to leave. But there are still people there, still chopping holes in the ice to fish, still lighting cook fires in the ruins of palaces, as they always have. I see a sunny morning when the water rises higher than any wave, all the way up to the cliffs, and I know now I'm seeing ahead. See people fleeing up the mountains in a panic, escaping while others stay and chant. This is the religion we've left behind. Something of seaweed-induced visions and reverence for plant life. A whole worldview based on it. A belief it will save them. It doesn't. The water swallows the priests, swallows the people fleeing, swallows the entire land like it never was. I shake my head, crying. It's so sad, so awful. Keep looking, Alethea. You need to see this. I look again and see the high mountains above the North Shore, see fabulous cities clinging to them, shining metal and glass towers against snow-capped peaks. Salem Dale work amongst them, fixing gadgets, mining deep in the mountains and sweating in cramped manufactories. I see the water rise for them too, higher than the mountains, defeating all the ingenious devices they built to keep it at bay. They are swept away too, clinging to their machines until the very end. The Dara are next, the swarthy caravansers with their belts of gold and gems, in a city of towers and palaces I can only assume is their island capital. I see the power those with wealth exude, the strength and vitality that keeps them strong into their second and third centuries, and the reverence the rest of the people give them. I see it all swept away on an unremarkable afternoon, a million souls drowned. 
then the Bamani, the pale and proud warriors of the southern continent, making wars behind the high walls of their stone castles. See the inhuman strength and power that flow to those in command, and the way their serfs worship them. See a single dark wave engulf the whole thing, leaving only ocean. I cry through it all, but tears don't hinder my vision underwater. And then I see Saray. The shingled rooftops and cobbled streets I've come to know so well in the last week. There are a few additions, a few subtractions, as if this were next month or next year. It's not far away, that much I can tell. Therakins keep watch from fountains as overseers patrol the streets. The water starts to rise, the bay forming a vast whirlpool that carries buildings out to sea and smashes ships into the city as the whole thing drowns. When it hits the temple, I want to scream at them to run, to panic like the rest of the city, but the seers watch calmly, secure in their faith that Ujjay will save them. He doesn't. The water flows backwards up the channels and aqueducts, gouts from the fountains, and the temple is caught in the seething tide of wrecked ships and houses and bodies. The seers stand calm till the end, too strong in their beliefs to see what's wrong. Because there is something wrong. I can feel it, as I felt it in each of the other places. Something right about their beliefs, and something wrong too. Something limiting. Something keeping them from being saved. Because I feel the salvation there too. The power to stop all this, like it's just out of reach. Then for a moment I see myself, standing in a circle of dry land, arms raised, weeping blood from one eye and tears from the other, and I'm controlling the tide, pushing it back out to sea saving my people. Then the vision fades, and I am with my father again, only he's also my mother and my ancestors and all the people I've seen here, Bamani and Dara and Salem Dale, floating around me in the waters. Dead. They're all dead. Or they will be. It's unbearable. I forget Gaxna in that moment, forget myself, forget my worry that I might be trapped here at the bottom of the ocean. Grief wells up in me like a cold spring. Grief for the people who will die, for the ones who've already died, for the ancestors I can barely make out before them, and for the endless cycle of humanity building new lives, only to be destroyed. Why? Why is this happening? I speak it to the void, but no answer comes. I weep then. There's nothing else to do. I am not that powerful girl pushing back the ocean with her bare hands. I am a beaten one one who failed her family and friends and city. My tears mix warm into the cold waters. The urge comes again to stay down here, to just breathe deep of this water, to join my mother and father and all my ancestors and kin. Going back will only delay the inevitable. But there is still that sense of wrongness nagging at me, the errors in Ujjayism. My father talked about them too in his letter. I know one, the one Narimes used finally to defeat me in our battle of words during the ceremony, Ujjayism's prejudice against women. What finally won the hearts of the seers was him framing me as a therakant, a witch, and therefore an enemy, even though they all knew I was a seer, had all lived with me for years, as if my gender had anything to do with my abilities. It's stupid. I've always known it was stupid. But now, for the first time, I see how it's holding the temple back. How many great seers have never been allowed to enter the training because they weren't male? Would the temple be saved if it didn't discriminate? Would the Therakins if they had allowed men in their ranks? I want to know. Want to change the system. The idea that I can do something to stop the deluge, anything, is more powerful than my despair. I want to fight it. To show everyone stuck in the old ways and using them to get power that they're wrong. That Ujjayism is wrong and the seers and therakins have been at war for so long because they haven't seen the truth. They should be one temple, one guild, one belief system open to change, to deeper truths, not the details that separate us. I know this deep down, and like an echo of the figures receding from me in the water, I feel a wave of approval. It's the only thing I've ever wanted from my father, and I know if I get out of here, I will be carrying him with me somehow. He was never a good father, really, but at least now I understand why. He did his best. Now it's my turn.
33. Explosions sound in the distance, deep rumbles, and I see points of light on the surface. A surface which is only paces above me instead of the miles I felt. The water has cleared too, my vision's gone, and I see the explosions are people diving into the ocean, the light millions of bubbles exploding around them, caught in the evening sun. They have bald heads and flowing blue robes. Overseers. I slam my blind up, not even realizing it was down, and think fast. Seeing the surface instead of darkness must mean I survived my immersion. I feel a swell of joy, of accomplishment, but it won't mean much if the overseers find me. That must be what they're doing, searching. My lungs burn for air, but surfacing now would be suicide. So I swim deeper. I have no idea which direction land is. I can't see it in any direction. Did I drift so far? Keeping my blind thick, I swim away from the overseers, lungs hitching. How long have I been under? I don't know, but I can't risk surfacing until I'm farther from the overseers. I've survived this long, apparently all afternoon, without breathing. Ujay let whatever magic the immersion was hold a little longer. My lungs convulse and I swim harder, icing panic. What was it, anyway? Hallucination? But it felt real, Erte and Regiana and my father so accurately themselves. I've never doubted Ujayism's teaching about life being a continuation, without beginning, middle, or end. But it's one thing to know it, and another thing to experience it. I can still feel them with me in the water, almost like Yellen's bundle of emotions inside. And the deluge. I understand now what my father saw in the Chronicles, why people called him a heretic. Everyone thinks the next deluge is centuries away, but I saw something different. I surface and suck sweet lungfuls of air, vision swimming slightly. I keep my head low, and as soon as I can think again, I peer around. The boat the overseers must have dived from is seven or eight hundred paces away. Behind it are the sea cliffs, foggy with distance and the sun's red glow. I almost suck seawater in my shock. The setting sun? Two thousand paces away? I leapt in sometime around noon. I've been under for hours and drifted miles in the current. I should be dead. Should be, but I'm not, and I have things to do if I'm still breathing. I start the long swim back to the cliffs, body aching in a dozen places from the beating I took in the temple, circling wide of overseer boats. The first thing is escaping. I have to get away from Saray if I'm going to do anything about what I saw. But I can't leave Gaxna. Responsibility and guilt hit me like hammers. No, not guilt. Love. Guilt wouldn't drive me like this has. Wouldn't make me do all the crazy things I've done since Gaxna was taken. So I admit to myself, alone out here in the water with a good chance of dying, that I love Gaxna. And saving the world won't mean much to me if she isn't in it. I feel a resistance then, a push against my decision, and realize it's coming from the water coming from that deep mind that might have been Erte or my father or ancestors or Jay for all I know. It wants me to escape, to dedicate my life to fixing the world's mistakes. And I will. I want to. Just as soon as I have Gaxna back. The resistance keeps on and I ignore it. Focus on my breathing and on my plans for how to get to her. I don't know how to defeat Narimes. The temple is probably crawling with overseers, and as far as I know, everyone loyal to my cause got killed or bloodborne during the last battle. So it's not going to be easy, but swimming 2,000 pace gives me a long time to think. By the time I get to shore, I have a plan. The first part involves climbing through the caves again. It's not the safest way into the temple, but it's the fastest and I can't stop thinking about Narime saying he might find a use for Gaxna. I pray that he doesn't, for her sake. Death would be better. Even as I pray that he does, so she's still alive when I get there. The caves are much fuller than this morning, and I spend a lot of time ducking into alcoves and hermit caves, unable to disguise myself and not wanting to spend the time fighting my way up. Then I hear a familiar voice among the muttered conversations, and I feel a familiar presence in my chest just a few feet away. Deshaun. I wait till the group has passed, about five people, all our age, then slip behind and try to pull Deshaun aside. He yelps instead, and the whole group turns. I curse. Thea, he says, amazed. I thought you were dead. The others, mostly students from our class, echo him. 
That's how I wanted it, I hiss back, pulling them into a side cavern. What are you doing down here? Hunting me? We're escaping, Arjuna says, former head of Deshaun's house. The temple's gone mad. And we believe you, another puts in. We saw what you showed in the water. And saw how Narime sold us out to the witches, Deshaun says, face dark. They got our blood. You'll be fine, I say, trying to get them to keep their voices down. They can't blood push you through your blind. But what about when we're not holding it up? I smile. Welcome to my world. You have to learn to never let it down. Thea, Deshaun says, gripping my arm. T, come with us. We're going to start our own temple, reform Ujjayism to include women. You, what? It's like you read my mind. Then reality hits. You and these four? There are more, he says, shaking his head. Everyone who survived. A lot of people who used to be on Narimes' side. Ujjay, I know what my father would say. I know what I should do, but I can't. Gaxna is still up there. His grip tightens on my arm. Flood Gaxna! This is the temple we're talking about. Your people. We need a leader. Then, through our skin, I need you too. Love and commitment pour from him, intoxicating. But there's fear too. I probe a little deeper in his thoughts, trying to find why, and gasp. He jerks his hand away, eyes going wide, but it's too late. You bastard! Thea, I, you bastard! I emphasize it with a slap to his face, hard enough that he staggers back. Thea, wait, I can explain. Explain what? How you told Narimes where I was hiding? Where he could find Gaxna? How you led them right to her? Explain what? I drive the words home with punches, my rage rising too hot to control. She'd be alive if it weren't for you. Here with us. With me. The others are simultaneously backing off and trying to shush me, but I've only got eyes for Deshaun. I kneel to where he's fallen, seize him by the neck. You've got two breaths before I kill you. Tell me why I shouldn't. Fear and love and despair war on his face, flood through the blood bond. I did this for you, Thea, to save you. She was dragging you down, but, yeah, maybe you should kill me. I, he's actually weeping. Slops. I'm too angry to deal with a weeping Deshaun right now, and I've got bigger things on my mind. Good luck with your flooding temple, I growl, pushing past the rest of them. Try not betraying your friends next time. Thea, wait, he calls after me, echoed by the others, but I've got no ears for it. No blood except the rage boiling in my heart, the wishes to Jay I had killed him. Instead, I stalk right through the next group of men coming down the caves, just hoping they're loyal to Narimes, praying for a fight. They're more seers, trying to escape. I ignore their cries, ignore their warnings about the halls above, how they're full of overseers. I know that. I want to meet an overseer right now. Others warn that I can't defeat Narimes that I already tried with all the help they could give, and failed. But I can feel the usurper inside me now, like a little spark of arrogance and ambition, and nothing would feel better than crushing it out. I stalk through the kitchens and climb the stairs to the temple, anger in my heart and death in my hands. An overseer turns the corner and I lash out at him, not with the iron fire poker I took from the kitchens, but the truths I carry in my mind. He wasn't there for my argument with Narimes. Miara conveniently kept them back until after the talking was done. So I show my proofs to him now, force them into his mind through the water, and add what I saw in my immersion, the proof that the deluge is coming and Ujjayism is wrong. He gasps, going rigid where he stands. I stalk past, poker still swinging in one hand. One for me. Another appears, probably drawn by the confused thoughts the first man is releasing into the water. I thought push him too, show him all the things Narimes did to set my dad up, force him to know all the proofs that the Salem Dale were behind it. And as an afterthought, I had a selection of my own life, of how hard it was to grow up a female seer. He collapses to the stream-covered floor and I move on. The truth hurts, but I've already been through my pain. More overseers come. I thought push them, strike down the occasional one who offers some resistance, read in their panicked thoughts the last known location of Gaxna. Unsurprisingly, the story I piece together is that Narimes and Yeolat left the ceremony with her in tow. Of course she'd be with Narimes, the one person I don't know if I can defeat. 
It doesn't change my mind. Other people know about the deluge now. Let them save the world if they're going to. I'm going to save the only part of it I really care about. I drop a squad of overseers five wide with my truths, mercilessly push them into the memories of being excluded from student houses, singled out by trainers, teased by students when no seers were around. Find myself dry-eyed about it all just as they're weeping and repenting. Good. Maybe the temple won't need as much work as I thought. And then I'm at Narimes' door, heavy wooden slabs reinforced with iron. He likely knows I'm coming by now. That's fine. I've made no effort to keep my presence hidden. I don't think I could surprise the man anyway. So it's no shock to find him garbed and facing the doors as I push in, bedchamber broad and luxurious behind him. My father lived here once, but silks and perfumes and statuettes spread like rot over the simple furnishings he kept. Alethea Viola, Narime says, shaking his head. I thought I was done with you. I wish to hell I was done with you, but I saw things. You saw them too if you actually went through your immersion. I bar the door behind me, wanting no interruptions. I went through it, Narime waves a hand. Superstitious nonsense, air-deprived hallucinations. No one's ever been able to make any sense of it. My father was making sense of it. You just didn't want to believe what he found out. His heresies, you mean? The man asks. And from his intonation, I know he knows exactly what I know. But how could anyone know that, have seen the destruction of all the people in the world, and not want to do something about it? Do you not care even for your own salvation? I mean, this thing is coming soon. It could be next month. He smiles richly. Ah, the idealism of a new seer. Everyone goes through it, you know. The conviction the world is ending, the passion to do something, the surety that the temple needs to change, Ujjayism needs to change. There are actually quite a few seers we've had to put down because of it, because they couldn't see reason. Reason? What's reasonable about letting the world die, and us too? He cocks his head. I suppose it isn't reasonable, not really. This has ever been the way of society, the sacrifice of the many for the good of the few. You know how Saray was built, don't you? Everyone knows the story of old Saray, of the theocrats forcing the rest of the city into hard labor to build their mansions. That's our past. I'm talking about our future. He nods. An extremely brief future, if the accounts of recent immersions are true. I shake my head, forgetting even Gaxna for a moment. So what? You're just okay with dying? With letting everyone die? Why did you work so hard to get here if you knew it was all going to fall apart? Ah, his eyebrows go up. That's exactly why I had to work so hard. I'm sorry it involved the death of your father. But Ujay, well, let's call it the power, shall we? Was never going to save everyone, just the best of us. Your father probably knew that too. He just wasn't the best. I'm not going to get a clear answer from him. I scan the room, the wide bed and large glass windows and heavy trunks. Looking for your friend? I curse, remembering again that he can read me through my blind. I have to keep my mind off the plan. Or should I say lover? Don't worry, she's perfectly fine. Tanean? A laborer comes from the back room, carrying a heavy bundle. No, not a bundle. Gaxna. She's stiff as a board, frozen in an upright position, only her eyes darting back and forth. What did you do to her? But I know almost before he says it. Blood pushing, of course. Estresia has had her blood for ages, and now Miara has it too. We think she'll be useful in re-educating this city. Not as good as you would have been, but the girl has some seership, and she has a connection to you should we need that. How fitting, then, that she will watch you die. My mind spins in the background of my emotions. He admits girls can have water sight? Use her to re-educate the city? Why bother if everyone's gonna die? But the forefront is all emotion, a thick river of horror and anger and love. I grit my teeth, focusing on the anger. That's what I need right now, if I'm going to have any chance of beating Narimes. His eyebrows rise just a fraction before I strike, swinging the fire poker like a regular staff. A staff made of iron, and pointed with a wicked barb. He blocks, but there's a difference between iron and wood. Yes, iron is slower and heavier, but it's momentum... He curses, stumbling back and clutching his arm. I don't think I broke anything yet, but I'm just getting started. He comes at me again, lightning fast, but I get the poker up, aim the long barb so he can't touch me without impaling himself. 
Cursing, he goes for his staff. I don't want him armed, but I need Gaxna's help more. Gaxna, remember what we did with Astresia? You can beat them. Just focus. She broke through Astresia's blood push. Not much, and not for very long, but if she did it once, she can do it again. And if I can just keep Narimes occupied long enough, maybe she can walk out of here, blood push or no. There's no sign she heard me, but I know she did. Narimes is coming back, robes billowing behind him. Fight it, I cry, and then the battle is joined again. It's like the other times I've fought Narimes, nearly hopeless. He's lightning fast, strong as two overseers, and impossible in how he reads my moves through my blind. I get hits in anyway, drawing yelps from the weight and barbs of the poker, but they are few and far between the blows he rains down on me. Gaxna, I yell, fight it! I can't spare much time to look at her, but I don't think she's moved an inch. Narime strikes in again and I roll left, his staff shattering a tall vase where I'd been. The room is already in shambles. I'm losing, but in my growing despair I feel a seed of arrogant satisfaction alongside the seeds of worry and pain that I know are not mine. And I smile, knowing my plan might still work. I lash out at Narimes through the water, push his own injustices and heresies back at him, like I did with the overseers, add my visions in the immersion and my life as a girl in the training. It barely phases him. I think I see an eyebrow go up as our staffs clash again, my strike at his sternum deflected to just graze his ribcage. I slip back under his counterattack, nearly stumbling into the bed. I didn't think that would work, but if my theory is right, I summon a furious offensive, driving him across the room, willing my iron rod to break his staff or arms or legs, and at the height of it, when he's back-footed, I push my mind out again. Only this time, I don't push it through the water. I push it through blood. He freezes because I force him to freeze, like I force people to hear my thoughts when I push thoughts through the water, like I'm a seer and a theracant, because I am. I strike in, ramming my poker straight at his forehead in a blow that will crush his skull and the life within it. A hair's breadth before it hits, he reacts, dodging back. It still hits. He screams, but instead of dying, he stumbles back with hands to his face, where blood now gouts from a ruined eye socket. I strike again to finish him, but Narimes reacts. Despite my will in the blood, despite the loss of his eye, the man pulls back, swings his staff up in a clumsy counter. It isn't much, but it's enough to close the window I opened. I feel all the horror and pain and fear close up inside him, iced like I ice my emotions, though I don't think I could ever manage to ice something that big, that powerful. Blood pushing, he says, circling me now, voice calm despite the blood running free from his eye. Clever. I should have expected it from a witch. When did you get my blood? In the fight, I suppose. In the water, he calls for overseers, and a moment later there is pounding at the door. I try again, shoving my mind through the blind, willing him to freeze. It hits his blind, solid and cold as the one he keeps in the water. Clever, but it won't work twice. He strikes in, and I counter, and the dance is joined again, twice as hard this time. He's pushing for the end, needs to defeat me before blood loss makes him so weak his advantages don't matter. All I have to do is hold out till then, assuming the overseers don't break in first. This is my last plan, my last move. It's all skill and staff from here, unless Gaxna works her own blind up enough that she can walk out. I would leave this man in an instant if she could, and let the world burn. Gaxna moves. I glance left, and she's still moving, walking actually. Victory wells up in me. She broke through the blood push. Narimes' remaining eye narrows, and I push him harder. Gaxna, I cry, the window, climb out of here. She's going for the wall instead, where a sword and other weapons hang on a long steel rack. No, I call. I've got this. Get out. She takes one, oblivious to me, and turns to the fight. That's Gaxna, I guess, stubborn to the last second. I smile despite myself. I guess we'll kill him together then. I'm so relieved, so excited to be done with this mess, that I almost don't see her sword chop. It's not aimed at Narimes. It's aimed at me. I jump back at the last second, Nurime scoring a blow on my shoulder. Gaxna, what? 
The Chosen smiles then. Miara has control of her now. However you may have trained her, whatever she managed against Astresia, it won't make a difference. Not with the Master Blood Pusher controlling her. Gaxness strikes at me again. It's awful. I try to ice the horror, but my mind is too much of a glut now to focus on any one thing. I sidestep Narimace's blow, parry Gaxna's slash, and see an opening to disarm her, to slash at her forearm in a move that would probably break it. But I can't. I'm trying to save her, not kill her. Narimace grins. Having some trouble doing what you need to? That was the difference between your father and I, too. He's panting now, his clothes on the floor a mess of blood, but his movements are still lightning quick. He could never do what needed to be done. Neither can you, I see. I redouble my attacks against him, trying to keep him between Gaxna and I, but he's too smart for that, and again and again I am driven toward her, where she weeps but keeps swinging the short sword at me. I thank Ujay at least that she's no swordswoman, and that Miara apparently isn't either. Still, I'm driven back. I take blows from Narimace and cuts from Gaxna. Pain and exhaustion slow my counters. And worse yet, the blows on the barred doors have become rhythmic, like the overseers are beating on it with something. I don't trust myself to be able to convince them of the justice of my cause with Narimace right here to counter me, and to fight him off, and to fight off Gaxna without killing her. I'm gonna lose. We're gonna lose. Gaxna, I try once more. Fight it! You can do this! I know you can! Remember Astresia! There's no sign that she's heard me. There probably won't be one. Miara probably has her locked down tighter than the clamps on a wellhouse. I slash back at Narimace, increasingly desperate. If I can just kill him, maybe I can disarm Gaxna and carry her out of here, whether she's bloodborne or not. He evades it. Slowly, clumsily, but he evades it and his staff takes my right knee from the side, just when my foot's come down in his blood. I slip and land hard on my ribs. I try to roll up, but they're both there, Narimes with a foot on my staff arm and blood-borne Gaxna kneeling on my legs. No, I moan. Narimes knocks the poker from my hands. Why are you doing this? I don't know if I'm talking to Narimes or Gaxna or Ujay. For the poetry of it, if nothing else, Narimes says, shooting off an order in the water for the overseers to stand down. Your own puppy lover forced to kill you in front of the man you hate. Oh, she's going to have nightmares about this. Or maybe she's getting used to those. Gaxna? My friend, my lover, the only person I still truly care about in this world, raises the blade, double-fisted, pointing down at my chest. Gaxna, no, I whisper, shaking my head. At least let it be Narimes. Let it be anyone but her. She pauses at the top, her eyes the wide panic of a bloodborne. I wait for it, cringing, trying to find space in my flood of fear and despair. Still she pauses. After a second, Nurime says, Miara, end this. Still Gaxna doesn't move, and I break out into a smile. Fine, Nurime snaps, taking up a dagger nearby, movement sluggish. Just as poetic if I do it, and I've got more important things to do tonight. I try a last, desperate push at him through the blood, hoping to freeze him too. No doing. The knife flashes down. It lands heavy as a sack of grain. There's a pain in my chest, but it's nothing like it should be. I open my eyes, and Gaxna is there, lying on top of me, her head next to mine, body a dead weight. No... I moan, pushing against her, willing her to get up. No, 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 no! Narimace is cursing behind her, struggling with a dagger. Hot blood runs over me. Gaxna's blood. She sacrificed herself to save me. No, 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 no! And then I catch a glimpse, just a fading beat, of a new seed in my heart, alongside my blood bonds with Deshaun and Yellen and Narimace. A seed full of love, and sadness, and despair, but most of all love. Gaxna. The seed tells me she would not want me to lie here mourning her. She would want me to live. So I shove the body off me, onto Narimes, icing what I can of the pain and horror and denial, and try to get up. Overseers, Narimes shouts, leaping to his feet. There's something wrong with me, 
Not all the blood on me is hers, and I stumble on my way up. Narime shoves Gaxna's body off, getting to his feet too, and the rhythmic pounding begins again, door splintering. All my emotions crystallize then into one desire, to kill Narimes. I leap for him, barehanded, in a perfect drop that breaks the dam. He counters with an ice and summer rain, and the dance is joined again, but my movements are too slow, my hands shaking. He's weaker too, his face a ruined mess, but still faster than me. The door splinters further. I try blood pushing again, and his blind is weakened enough that it slows him, allows my poker to punch a hole in his stomach. At the same time, panicked thoughts slip through him in the water. Thoughts of Miara and Yeolat, of some secret cabal behind my father's death. It's too fast to process. Then he knocks my poker aside with thunder shakes the rooftop, blind closing again. I strike in with spring erodes the stone, and he meets it with a vicious sleeting rain. I slip backwards, nearly falling, and he picks up Gaxna's sword. I understand, with the insight that comes from deep breathing, that I can either escape here or kill Narimes, but not both. And of the two, Gaxna would want the first. So I get up. The door fractures halfway open on the far side of the room, and Narime stalks towards me, movements slowed but still deadly. The room grays some. I grab something next to me, another vase, I think, and smash it into the window. It breaks. There's a forty-foot drop to the gardens below, and just rough marble to cling to, but I will only join my lover's corpse if I stay. So I climb out, defeated, and run. Epilogue. The first few hours were awful. No, the first few days, really. I ran the rooftops off of the temple, thought pushing the overseers I met, knowing only that I needed to live though I wanted to die. Got into the city and took the roofs to the only place I knew was safe, the ocean. There was no avoiding Narimes on land. No running when I was as weak as I was, and the entire overseer army plus all of Miara's bloodborne would be after me. So I let the tide take me out to a Bamani barge, stripped off any robes that might identify me, and begged passage. That's when I understood why I was so weak. The dagger that passed through Gaxna went a fair way into me, too. Another inch, the old woman said, and it would have punctured my heart. As it was, I would have bled out without her bandages. That was after we got across the strait. Or on the boat, I don't really remember. What I do remember is eyes watching me even in the Bomani port, strangers peering between the reeds of the old woman's hut. Two interested eyes. I negotiated passage on a pearler trading ship as soon as I could stand, tying bandages tight across my chest to pass as a boy. They had just come from Saray, full of rumors about a blood-borne army and trouble at the Chosen's wedding. But the pearlers hold no love for Saray, so the captain said nothing of my violet eyes. Instead, he gave me work swabbing decks and mending sails, and we set sail for smaller ports along the Bomani coast. I could likely get better pay as a guard somewhere, or even as a full sailor, but this works for now. The work is simple, the weather is good, and the constant joking and storytelling of the sailors keeps my spirits from getting too heavy. Because I'm carrying weight. The weight of my failure against Narimes. The weight of the men that died trying to help me. The weight of a city now trapped under Narimes and Yara. And the weight of Gaxna. She couldn't block the blood push to save her own life, but she blocked it to save mine. I don't know how many sunsets along the port side rail I've spent wishing it had been the other way around, or that I'd killed Narimes at least, not to save the temple or avenge my father or anything really, but just because he deserves to die. Attacking him now would only end in my death. I've accepted that, much as I burn to leap from this ship and hunt him down. I need time and strength and allies. I need a plan, and for more than just him. This problem is bigger than the Chosen of Ujjay. The deluge is coming, and sooner than any have thought, my father wrote, in a letter now stained with salt and blood and weeks of travel. If we do not reform Ujjayism, reform the beliefs of the city, we will be swept away with the rest. You must ready the city, Alethea. Ready the world, if you can. I understand him, 
and what consumed his final years better now that I've been immersed. What I don't understand is how the other seers have done nothing. Narime said they were convinced not to, but how could you ignore that? I don't understand Narimes either. He didn't deny that we'd all be wiped out, but he seemed to think he'd be saved, along with the best of us. It has something to do with the thoughts I witnessed in that last battle, the secret cabal he and Miyara and Yaelat are part of. Maybe that's where their impossible powers are coming from. Knowledge of the cabal alone is damning, but I need to learn more if I'm going to defeat him, because I am going to face him someday. We're not done. My heart felt full when I got on this ship, full of anger, full of sadness, full of all the emotions I iced in the days after I first fled the temple. I never got a chance to let them thaw, and so I'm doing that now, letting my rage play out in angry swabs of the deck, washing my despair with the water out to sea, allowing my sadness to mellow on the evenings when I don't have to work, when I hang legs off the side rail with the crewmates, as they pass clove leaves and they tell endless stories, each one trying to top the last. The more I learn of the pearly language, the more I realize how dirty their jokes are. Sometimes I even smile. But I can never forget what I've seen, and I know what I need to do. I think it's what Gaxna would want. She tried to act like she didn't care, but she threw me a rope when I was being chased by a pack of bloodborne that first day, and was always on the watch for runaways to help. I feel like Gaxna now, watching from the rooftops as the world runs from danger, a danger it doesn't even know is there. I have the choice to throw my rope or not, and not throwing would be so much easier. But I can hear my ancestors' voices, make out my father's words in the spray off the starboard bow, and catch Regiana's snap when I jump from a boarding skiff into the waves. They echo what I already know, that I have to do something. And I will because every day I don't hear my lover's voice alongside them is another reason to hope, and every day the waters don't rise is another chance to act.